There's a full serving of laughs on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight with Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner. Archie's colleagues in comedy are Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the Waiter. This Sunday, the big show comes your way once again on NBC. And just listen to a few of the stars who will be with you. Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Mindy Carson, Ed Archie Gardner, Ed Wynn, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC will be Tallulah Bankhead. Listen Sunday for The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means exciting adventure. Hello? Hello. The handsome young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. The mountain of a man engrossed in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolfe. Hey, boss. Oh, Mr. Wolfe. Mr. Wolfe. There's a guy on the phone wants us to take a case. Seems that someone was mad at a guy who was mad, and now this guy on the phone is mad, wants us to find out who did the killing. What do you say, Mr. Wolf? We need the money. <laughs> Hello? Yes, Mr. Wolf says he'll be happy to take the case. Just present yourself and a check for $2,000 at 601 West 35th Street at 11 o'clock. Mr. Wolf can't wait till you get here. He's dying to go to work. Goodbye. <sighs> <sighs> Greatest detective in the world. The only trouble is... He is. Yes, listeners, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world. And the fattest and the least energetic. He's Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's The Case of the Beautiful Archer. That's a good title. And it was a good case, too. It began in the consulting room of Dr. Raynard Townley of the Townley Sanitarium, uh, skipping a jump north of Nyack, New York, when a very lovely young lovely glared across the desk at the good doctor. Shall we pretend you don't know who I am, Dr. Townley? How could we possibly do that, my dear Diana Lawrence? Twenty-three years old, daughter of one of our better-known sculptors, Michael Lawrence. You were born in Johannesburg, educated in London and Paris... And live at present a hundred yards from here in your father's cottage on Berry Hill Lane. How's that? It's intended to be staggering, isn't it? You take no cream or sugar in your coffee. We're winner of the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947 and have an exceedingly high temper. Let's stop the nonsense. You have an inpatient here named Willard Garth. Well, Willard Garth happens to be my fiancé. Yes, he has mentioned the fact during his analysis. And, um... Well, has he by any chance mentioned his reasons for suddenly refusing to see me during the past five weeks? He didn't have to, Miss Lawrence. Well, what do you mean? I mean that I recommended he give you up as a bad job. What? Well, I suppose you had some purpose in saying what you did. Of course. I'm the boy's doctor. You think you're in love with Willard Garth, I know, but actually you're infatuated with the Garth millions. You take a lot on yourself, don't you, Doctor? I consider it important to relieve Willard of all painful external pressure. You've done well for Willard, Dr. Townley, relieving him of me. I think so. Now, let's see you relieve yourself of me. You uh, purchased the gun for this occasion, Miss Lawrence? Yes. And what exactly do you hope to accomplish with it? A quick and complete reversal of your decision about me. I'm not as easy to handle as Willard is, you see. And if you intend to ruin my life, then I intend to end yours, here and now. The phone is ringing. Let it ring. Hmm? Just as you say. It's the house phone, Miss Lawrence. It may be Willard, you know. Oh, Willard? Yes, he uh, usually phones me from his room at about this time every day. Oh. Well, all, all right. Answer it, but be careful what you say. You're in command, it seems. Hello? Oh, why, hello. I thought it would be you, Willard. Look, my boy, Diana Lawrence is here. I've had a talk with her, and I've reconsidered my opinion. Yes, yes, I'm quite serious. 
If you're at all sensible, you see her regularly and plan on a marriage as soon as you're discharged. Yes. Oh, you do? Very well. I'll see if she'll talk to you. Uh, Miss Lawrence. Yes? Uh, do you want to speak with him? Uh, give me the phone. Of course. Here you are, and... I'll oh, take this gun. You... You... There we are. Now, stand away, Miss Lawrence. But, 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 but Willard, Willard's on the phone. Willard is not on the phone. No one was on the phone. The ring came from the push-button bell under my desk here. Oh. Sometimes I find it convenient to interrupt my consultations with a phone call. Oh, you... You smug, deceitful, self-sufficient... Murder is a vexatious business. You'll be grateful to me one day. All right. Give me my gun and let me go. The gun, I'm afraid, stays with me. Here in this Majolica cabinet. I'd scarcely feel justified in trusting you with it. And now, with your permission, or without it, the interview is ended. Later that day, the phone in the Lawrence house on Berry Hill Lane began to jingle. And this time, it was no phony. Hello? Diana? Yes? Willard, darling. Diana, darling, it's Willard. Imagine. Has the doctor let you use a telephone just as if you were a great big adult? Oh, I've got to see you, sweetheart, and, and I didn't call you to argue. Love, beauty, understanding, that's what matters, isn't it? Isn't it? Do I hear the overtones of a change of heart? Oh, Diana, what's happened wasn't my fault. He poisoned me against you. Then why don't you walk out of that amateur nut house and stand up like a man? I probably shall, Diana. And now, please listen to me. He's letting me have the limousine tonight from 8 until 12. I want us to go for a ride and, and talk and talk and talk until everything is clear. Clear as a bell, my baby. Don't tell me he's trusting you to drive. Oh, no. No, one of the handyman here will show for us. Oh, say you'll come, Diana. Will you? Say it. Say yes. Say you will. Well, yes, Willard. I'll be glad to. Oh, eight o'clock, then? Eight. Oh, bless you. Bless you, my angel. Oh. Oh, so that's it. You want my father's money. That's what you love. Not me. Willis, the chauffeur will hear you. It's the way Townley says it is. He's right. He's right. Oh, why did I let you talk me into this? What a fool I was to have come at all. You're sick inside, Willard. So utterly, hopelessly sick. Oh. Oh, so now I'm... I'm hopelessly sick. Yes. Yes, you are. Oh, you, you're trying to confuse me. Take advantage of me. Wind me around your finger. Just because I love you too much. That's it. That's my illness. Of course, I see it now. You, you're the thing I must get rid of. You with your beautiful, beautiful face and your twisted values. You're at the bottom of all my agony. Willard! Willard! Will will I'm saving myself. I'm saving myself. Once your death, the sickness is ended. I'll be safe. I'll be safe. I'll be safe. Willard! Dr. Townley? Yes. Come in. Mr. Wolf's been expecting you. Come in, Dr. Townley. Come in. Have a chair. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. I'm so happy you've agreed to take this case. Have a glass of beer. Oh, no, no. Uh, never at this time of morning, thank you. Well, Doctor, the newspapers check with what you told me. The girl and young Garth went out for a ride in your limousine last night. The car was driven by one of your handymen. Well, that's right. Haynes, his name is. And they never came back. Young Garth was found dead in the car with two bullets in him. The girl was gone, and also Haynes, the handyman chauffeur. Huh? Correct, sir. Have you any idea where he could be? No, sir. And the young lady, tell me about her. Uh, she's Diana Lawrence, daughter of Michael Lawrence. The sculptor? The sculptor. She lives with him in a small cottage near my sanatorium on Berry Hill Lane. An extremely aggressive and self-centered female with more than a slight flair for violence. Your description might easily lead me to suspect her of this murder, sir. Mm, I'm aware of that. And I don't think you'd be far off the mark. 
As I told you on the phone, she tried to murder me yesterday morning. Hmm. The police have made no headway in locating her? No. The homicide division has contacted her father, but uh, he's remained quite noncommittal. He simply says that uh, he's sure she's incapable of killing a fly and that he hasn't laid eyes on her since 8 o'clock last night. Highly suspicious behavior. She was unquestionably in the car with young Garth when he was murdered. Hmm. She wasn't alone in the car with him. You were uh, you're referring to Haynes? Yes, but he can't be found either, remember? It appears that he failed to list his address on his job application. But somehow, Mr. Wolf, I'm quite sure he'll show up this afternoon. Somehow, Dr. Towney, if I were you, I wouldn't be quite so sure. We must begin by facing the initial problem of locating our suspects. Archie. Yes, sir. Get out the car and drive up to the house on Belly Hill Lane. And then? There you will ask Mr. Michael Lawrence to be sensible enough to cooperate with us in finding his daughter. And if the answer is no? I recommend, Archie, that you flatly refuse to take it. Mr. Lawrence was no simple baby to handle. He was in a studio when I walked in, chiseling on a statue of a boy and a girl, both wearing less clothes than the law allows. And before I got a chance to state my name, he commenced giving me a free lecture on the marble work of art. She's good. Really good. She's practically superb. The Ariadne. The what, Ariadne? The girl in the statue. Oh. That's Ariadne. Tragic nymph of Greek mythology. Don't tell me you're not familiar with Apollo and Ariadne. All right, I won't. The Apollo, on the other hand, is unfinished. The face, you see, it, uh, <clears throat> it lacks something. The passion of yearning, Olympian desire. And yet, you know, the two figures have motion. Like your daughter? Eh? Your daughter, Diana, she's got motion also. As I hear it, she's been in motion ever since she murdered Willard Garth last night in the back end of a limousine. <laughs> so you're another flatfoot. Uh, not exactly. I'm paid in private by Nero Wolf. Nero Wolf? Yeah. You don't mean that a creditable man like Wolf thinks Diana killed young Garth? Well, he'd like to talk over the possibility with her. How laughable. Look at that face. Is there anything of the murderous in a face like that? In a face like what? Oh, I'm sorry. Diana posed for the Ariadne, you see. And the likeness is exact. Do you think a girl of this type, classic, sensitive, civilized, could descend to the clumsy, brute level of murder? Well, it's... It's a little hard to imagine. There. Even you agree with me. On the other hand... Shall we discuss the other hand over a cup of coffee? I'm quite exhausted. If you insist. I do. Sit down and inhale the atmosphere of culture at its source. There's a pot warming on the stove. Pot of what? Coffee or culture? <laughs> well, wait and see what he means. Ah. Could never ignore a phone call. Those might be something important. Yes? This is Diana, Father. Oh, uh... Oh, yes, Diana. It's, it's all over the papers. Yes, I know. Well, I, I don't think they'll find me where I am. And I'm staying here until things quiet down a little. Where are you, honey? Uh, what did you say? I said, where are you? You said honey. Daddy, you never call me honey. Uh, I know, it's because I'm excited. Where are you, sweetheart? Not a soul in the world. Where are you? Well, you know where Tyne Pike turns off to the left beyond Bartsville? Yes. Well, I'm... Call me later, Angel. But, Father, I... Oh. Oh, get that motorman's number. You will live, my friend, but not long if you don't control your curiosity. You With that mallet you hit me, what was the big idea? Do you really have to ask that question? Well, aren't you trying to trick my daughter into disclosing her whereabouts? The police are pretty interested in her whereabouts. Then let them find her. But you can't be surprised, my friend, if I choose to protect Diana's interests. So he's working on an Apollo and Ariadne, is he, Archie? Who cares about Apollo and Ariadne? The point is how he worked on my gourd. That, of course, is unfortunate, my boy, but... Did you get that piece? Mm-hmm. Hello? Inspector Kramer. Hold it. For you. Here. Thanks. Yes? Wolf? Ah, how are you, Inspector? I hear you're in on the Garth killing. 
Not very deeply, I am afraid. We are still trying to locate the Lawrence girl. Well, you can forget about that. Yeah? Yes. We've already located her and released her on a habeas corpus. That sounds interesting. Her father had a lawyer on our heads before she was in here ten minutes. Too bad you couldn't have held on to her. Oh, I don't know. I'm not so sure we want her. Why not? Well, first of all, it's not likely she did it. No? No. Ballistics stated that the bullets that killed Willard Garth were not fired from point-blank range. And she was sitting beside him on the back seat. I see. Also, we found the murder weapon in the grass near where the limousine was parked. And she admitted it was hers. That sounds like a poor reason to release her. Well, the point is she wasn't in possession of the gun when the killing happened. At least so she says. No, who was? The doctor. What doctor? Townley. The guy who runs that sanitarium. According to her, he took the gun away from her for safekeeping at noon yesterday. There was a little more talk between them, something about fresh cigar ashes that were found in the dashboard ashtray of the limousine. After that, the boss hung up and exerted himself enough to put a call through to the Townley Sanatorium. I'm afraid the doctor is very busy just now. So am I, and my business happens to be highly important. Well, I'll say you call, Mr. And I'll ask him to contact you just as soon as he has a free moment. Do you happen to have a free moment, miss? Why, well, yes, sir. Could you spend it by telling me if that handyman, Mr. Haynes, is being located? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, he has. One of the staff just found out where he lives, Mr. Wolf. Well? He has a little cottage at 206 Dockside Road. That's out near Sheep's Head Bay. Thank you. Archie. I'm going someplace, I suppose. You are? You're going to Sheep's Head Bay. Hello there. Hmm? Looking for a guy I can't find. Oh? Yeah, his name is Haynes. Stopped at the cottage up there, but there's no one there. I saw you here on the wharf fishing, so I... What did you say his name is? Haynes. H-A-I-N-E-S. Oh, oh, Haynes. Yeah. Yeah, do you know him? Well, there's a fellow named Hines used to fish no, out no, here. No, 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 not Hines. Haynes. Couldn't be Huntingburg? No, it couldn't be. The name is Haynes. H A I N. Haynes! Give me a hand here, eh? <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> Funny, huh? That guy seems to think my name is Haynes. Yeah, so do I. You do? Yes, I. <laughs> I got back to our house, soaked to the skin and minus Haynes, and just in time to see the boss in the exhausting process of walking across the room to answer the phone. Hello? This is Dr. Townley. You called me. So I did. About the murder? More specifically, about the statement from Diana Lawrence that you removed a firearm from her possession yesterday morning. Uh, That's quite correct. It's here in my Majolica cabinet. Is it? Of course it is. I suggest you check. Just a moment. Uh, Mr. Wolf. Yeah? I'd like to see you at once. The gun, I suppose, has vanished. But how did you know? Because it is at ballistics, Doctor. It turned out to be the gun that killed Willard Garth. I... I see. Do you? Yes. And I understand everything now. It's all so crystal clear. Just how crystal clear? I'm quite certain, Mr. Wolf, that I can put my finger on the killer. Then I think it would be well if you came here immediately. Oh, I'm afraid it's impossible, sir. Uh, There's an important operation scheduled, and I simply cannot leave. What do you suggest? Well, is it outside the realm of possibility that you come here? Is it, Mr. Wolf? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf? When my boss has to leave the house, it's a major tragedy. Sometimes he rages, sometimes he curses the whole detective business, lock, stock, and barrel. And sometimes he keeps very quiet and grips the side of the car desperately and tries not to inhale any fresh air. This was one of the quiet times. Just go slowly, Archie, but get there as quickly as you can. Oh, you don't want a chauffeur, Mr. Wolf. What you need is a magician. Keep your eye on the road and don't strain yourself to make superfluous witticisms. Why don't you try relaxing a little? 
I hear there hasn't been a man-eating tiger sighted on the Sawmill River Parkway in the last 500 years. Your liberty is out of order. Don't try to make light of a deplorable situation. Here's the sanatorium. And there's Dr. Townley coming to meet us. It's terribly nice of you to have come, Mr. Wolf. I've heard about your aversion to traveling, and I appreciate your going to the trouble. Don't mention it. Oh, Archie, help me out with my other eye. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Mm. Now, calm down. You're all in one piece. I think you'll find the trip highly profitable, Mr. Wolf. You'll consider it time very well. Hey. Hey, what's the matter? What is it? What happened? He's been shot. Hardly likely there wasn't a sound. This kind of shot doesn't make a sound, boss. What do you mean? Better take a look for yourself. There's an arrow in his back, and he's dead. We remembered that Dr. Townley had said Diana Lawrence had won the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947. The Lawrence house was visible through the trees a hundred yards away. So we started for it and the sculptor's studio. There's no one around. So this is his latest effort, Apollo and Ariadne. Yeah. Done a little work on it since I was here. The Apollo's face is more finished and... Hey, boss. Yes? You know, somehow or other, Apollo looks a little familiar. I wouldn't be surprised, Archie. I think if you examine it closely... Ah, our host. You remember me, don't you? I met you once at a dinner party at your house, the time they opened the new museum on 67th Street. Of course, of course, Mr. Lawrence. And to what do I owe the honor? It's not much of an honor. Dr. Townley has been murdered. No. I am afraid Mr. Goodwin is being accurate. He's been murdered with a bow and arrow. And what does that mean to you, Mr. Lawrence? I'm sorry. I've been a fool. An awful fool. You can't blame yourself too much. If you'd cooperated with the police instead of looking out for your daughter's interest, the man would still be alive. But I assure you that... Where's the girl? She should be here now. She phoned me a while ago and said she was coming by for passage money to Rio. You were looking for me? Boss, Diana, put the gun down, Angel. And tie a rope around my neck? Might I inquire if your plan is to kill us all, Miss Lawrence? Oh, what would yours be if the world was after you for something you didn't do? Wouldn't you be willing to risk persuading a jury of that? Thanks, no. I'll skip that chance. Father, Father, get me the money. Diana, sweetheart, don't make me a part of your murders. That's asking too much of love. Don't, don't you know I'm not guilty? No, no, Diana, I don't. <laughs> Leave that gun away, Diana. Haynes. Looks like I walked in on the nose. That's him, boss, the guy who soused me. Take a little of your own advice. Relax, Archie. What do you want here, Mr. Haynes? I want to give up and try to straighten out this little deal. Mr. Lawrence. Yes? Here's your money back. You got a right to call me a Welcher. I promised I wouldn't give evidence against the girl, and you paid my price. But enough is enough, and right here and now I'm unloading. Yes, what does this mean? It means I saw her do it. (gasps) Oh, you, you stupid, lying, rotten. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Grab her, Archie. Grab her. Get the pair of them out of here. What can I say to myself now? What can I do? I'm sorry, Mr. Lawrence, but it's not necessary to eat your heart out. Many fathers before you have done their best and failed. But I had a special duty toward Diana. Special duty? Yes. I... Well, you see, you'll find it out sooner or later, so I'd best tell you now. I'm not a real father. I adopted her nine years ago when she was 14. I see. And I should never have done it. I realize now that I wasn't equal to the task. Well, well. Well, all's not lost yet. They may not convict her, you know. Eh? I said they may not convict her. But how could they fail to convict her? She killed Garth, didn't she? Did she? She shot him. But the gun was in townless possession. She could easily have stolen that. She could have broken into his office later. It it wasn't locked. What wasn't locked? The Majorica cabinet... I mean... I believe you mean what you said, Lawrence. The Majolica cabinet... For the life of me, I can't see how you could know whether it was locked or not, unless you had the experience of opening it. Could it be that you went looking for the gun yourself after Townley said he had confiscated it? 
That you kill Tony with a bow and arrow, which you handle as well as your daughter, because he was just on the point of telling me that you knew where the gun was and that you were the likeliest murder suspect? You must be mad. Oh, sir, not I. <laughs> but you are mad and more than a little. You hated Willard Garth. It was you who were making the marriage impossible. You loathed him, and in the end, you kill him. How could I have killed him? I'll tell you a little secret, Mr. Lawrence. The police found cigar ash in the dashboard tray of the dead car. Chemical analysis showed that the ash was from an El Adoro cigar. What have you got in your left hand, sir? In my... Uh, an El Adoro cigar. And in my right hand, a derringer. Powerful and admirable little weapon, Lawrence. I suggest you show proper respect for it by dropping all this here and now. You don't wish to hear me say the rest, that you were horribly in love with Diana, your own adopted daughter, in love and hopelessly, eternally frustrated? You begrudge me the triumph of accusing you of having bribed Haynes to let you take his place at the driver's seat of the limousine? And further bribed and threatened him into putting on his show of many pranks and false confessions to confuse us all beyond measure? You said I loved Diana. Would I do all this to her if I did? Oh, but of course, such love as yours is really hate. You were content to see her dead rather than relinquish her. Like all miserly, small-hearted men, you would rather kill the thing you love than muster the generosity necessary to seeing it attain happiness. That's enough out of you. I should think it was much too much. It is. Archie, my boy, I'm grateful to you, both for coming back into the house when you did and for being such a good shot. Hope you remember that next time you feel like insulting me. Hmm. <laughs> Tell me, what's with that cigar ash routine? Who told you the ashes in the limousine were from an Eladoro, boss? I never heard anything about that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, neither did I. No one could possibly have determined the brand by any chemical means in existence. I knew that, you see, and I took the long chance that Lawrence didn't. Oh, uh -huh. but I still don't get the mainspring of the deal. How did you know he was in love with Diana? That, uh, that was genius, I have to admit it. You see, it all hinged on the statue of Apollo and Ariadne. According to the Greek myth, Apollo fell deeply in love with the nymph, but because they were of different worlds, he was condemned to pursue her always and never to catch her. Well, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Isn't it perfectly obvious? Didn't he tell you that Diana had posed for the Ariadne? Yeah, but I still don't... And you yourself remarked on the fact that the finished Apollo looked somehow familiar, didn't you, Archie? Yeah. Yeah, I did, boss. Don't you know why that was? You mean that... I mean that Michael Lawrence unconsciously revealed the true state of his heart. He didn't intend to, I suppose. But precisely and accurately, he chiseled the features of the tortured god in his very own image. Oh. And speaking of torture, Archie... Yeah? Will we be home in time for dinner? Oh, boss, you can't be that hungry. Oh, yeah, I am. Good heavens, Archie. Do you realize that I haven't eaten since lunch? You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Gigi Pearson, Ted Von Els, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Brave Rabbit. Don Stanley speaking. There's fun and laughs later tonight when Ed Archie Gardner stars as Archie the Manager in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie will be there, armed with his own whimsical version of the English language. Another Friday favorite you'll hear later is The Delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as Chester A. Riley.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once again, be my guest on a strange journey. A weird, wild trip through a mysterious, uncharted terrain. Bounded only by your imagination. There's an expression, the night of the long knives. And it has come to mean an orgy of murder. And it usually follows a rebellion or a civil war. It's a time when many of those on the winning side take the opportunity to settle some personal scores. Why are you leaving, Roberto? It isn't obvious. Who can live here any longer? There is another woman. Oh, Pilar, there never was. There never will be another woman. You are going to her. There is nothing here for me any longer. That's a lie. Pilar, won't you understand? Yes, I understand one thing. You are tired of me. Pilar, one day, as soon yes, as... I cannot have you. No one will. But I tell you, there is no one else. Oh, Roberto, don't leave me. Goodbye, Pilar. Oh. Patriot! Patriot, after him! That man running down the street, after him! He is a traitor! Our mystery drama, The Longest Night, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Bryna Rayburn. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal and new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. to discover one of those little-known, out-of-the-way restaurants where the food can only be described as heavenly. It's a safe bet. You've never heard of a place called Mama Pilar's. It is located in a tiny seaport village called Puerto San Jorge in an obscure Latin American country. It's a long way to travel for dinner, but be assured, it's worth it. Mama Pilar's doesn't look like very much. It's small, dark, narrow, but don't let that put you off. Seated at his usual table near the door is a chubby, pleasant-looking middle-aged man named Siriaco. Siriaco is unable to talk, but his guitar speaks for him. Tonight, the only customers in the place are Pete and Marge Miller, and they are obviously young, North American, and newly married. This? <laughs> this is the finest restaurant in the entire world? <laughs> Darling, taste is the test. Now, come on, bear with me. Pete? Hmm? Whose picture is that on the wall? He's just like one of those funny admirals in a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Marge, come on, don't talk like that. As if... As if what? Well, as if you're back home in a free country. Well, you see that picture everywhere. Is he some local wheel? Angel, he is the wheel. No kidding. He is the generalissimo. Numero uno. Our maximum leader. <laughs> Even so, he looks like a pig. Marge. Now, you can't talk like that in public. Besides, he's the client. He's the man I was sent here to sell, and, and you'd better pray for him. How can I pray for him? Instinctively, I hate him. You can see evil all over his face. Well, he's a very sick man. Oh, really? I understand he has severe ulcers. He had eats like a pig. Ah, uh -huh. now you said the word. Uh, uh, here she comes. Who? The great lady, Mama Kala herself. Welcome to this house. Uh, you don't remember me, Mama Kala? Oh, of course I remember you, Senor Miller, but, well, I, I thought it best not to say so. Oh, why? Well, I, I see this, this charming young lady as your wife. 
Perhaps she is not supposed to know you were here before. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, what would you like for your dinner? Mama Pilar, we are in your hands. Good. I hope you are hungry. <laughs> He's quite a character. It's amazing. Hmm? This dictator, what's his name? Oh, General Zaria. Zaria? He actually does look like a pig. Now, Marge, you simply cannot... Oh, I not come from Iowa. I know a hog when I see one. You are a guest in a foreign country, oh, and you should have enough good sense You're to... always so afraid I'll say something to embarrass you. We will have to socialize with this oh, man. Are you proud of me? I'll chatter so charmingly, no one ever will suspect that I've got a brain in my head. <laughs> oh. What? What is that? Divine aroma. Aha, uh -huh. well, you taste it. <laughs> now, good friends, your dinner. <laughs> oh, what is that? Food, that is all. That's all. What's a song? Mm. Notes. <laughs> but it's how these things are put together. <laughs> oh, thank you, Senora. Uh, you have been married long? Uh, well, this is our honeymoon. And also a business trip. Oh. <laughs> Can the two be combined? Mm -hmm. You you will be here a while? Oh, my company is working on a development plan with General Zaria. Ah, oh, yes. The leader will make us into a great nation. One day we will all be rich. Ah, oh, sure. He promised. Well, don't bet on it. You, you think he lies? At least I think. Marge. No, no. Tell me, senora. Who has poisoned you against our leader? The traitors, the cowards and doubters who fear to believe. Oh, oh, you, you are a foreigner, so how can you understand that I love my leader because I love my country? When he fought the old government, that unholy alliance of thieves and oppressors, when he called for volunteers, I gave this man my only son. Go, I said to Ramon, follow him. And today... My Ramon, he's a captain. And one day he will invite me to the capital city and present me to the leader. Oh, oh, forgive me, I, I talk too much. Well, see what the wind blew in, a beggar. Mama Bilal. Yes, old woman, you found me. If you are Mama Bilal, I have a letter for you. A letter? For me? From your son. From Ramon? How is he? When did you last see Ramon? Have no time here. Take your letter. But, but I want to talk to you. Oh, well. A letter. Oh, that devil, Ramon. You think he'd come by to visit his old mother? No, no. Well, he is busy. Oh, senora, you... You read, I am sure. Me... I never did learn. Would you be... So I'm sure that it must be something private between you and your son. Oh, no, Ramon, no. Someone will have to read it to me. It would be a favor, senora. All right. Oh. Well, what does he say? His letters are always so amusing. My dearest little mother, when you receive this letter, I will be dead. Read. Read. Our leader has betrayed us. We thought we fought for freedom, but he has made slaves of us all. Mama, he is a madman, and now that he realizes I know him, he will kill me with his own hands. Avenge me, Mama. Avenge me. My last thoughts are of you, the loving son, Ramon. You lie. You lie. You make up this ugly falsehood because you hate the leader. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mommy Pilar, can we help you? Leave me. Well, if you need anything, we'll be in the capital city. Goodbye, Mommy Pilar. Uh, Siriaku. You see that face? The face that looks down upon us from the wall? I will kill him, Siriaco. I will kill him with my own hands. And after I have killed him, I will weep for Ramon. Marge, 
Marge. Marge, darling, I'm sorry a thing like this had to happen. Pete. Hmm? I know you have a job to do in this country, but I can't take any part in it. I will not socialize with that man. I will not visit his palace. He will not be invited to my home. But, darling... I refuse to discuss it. All right, dear. All right. My leader. My leader, you are breaking your diet. Oh, shut up. You... Yes, my leader. What appointments have I this afternoon, Escobar? Dr. Suarez is to hear at any moment. Then the young North American engineer, Senor Peter Miller. Is there more meat? My leader, what will Dr. Suarez say when he sees you have broken your diet? I am starved. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Suarez. I'll get rid of that slop. Hmm? I gave you a diet. Now, what are you doing? Uh, hey. <laughs> I must eat. I'm not a bird. I'm a man. You're a self-indulgent fat slob. See, si, Escobar. See how he talks to me. Here you address our leader. Be the... quiet, you obscene little rodent. You, open your shirt. I don't care if the man is a doctor. He must have respect Dr. for our... Suarez, why don't you like me? Roll up your sleeve. I will take your blood pressure. I tolerate you because you are the best doctor in the country. But take care now how you provoke me. The moderate. Yes, exactly my prescription for you. But I cannot live without good food, wine. Then die. Yes. You're not the only doctor in the nation. Yes, indeed not. Fetch some quack, some boot-licking flatterer. Tell him what to prescribe. I'm sure the charlatan will oblige you. And in three months, you will be a dead man. Uh, good day. I will be here tomorrow. Hmm. He's right. The dog moderation. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll see the North American. Uh, same in, Senor Peter Miller. Moderation. Moderation and abstinence. That's the way to live forever. You must keep me to that diet, Escobar. Keep me to that diet. Yeah. Your Excellency? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I have here the report on all the preliminary studies. Have you, uh... uh... Yes, sir. An overall program to build hospitals, schools, bridges, aqueducts, drain swamps. We can transform the entire country. Can you? Ed, now, if you'll examine these papers... Enough, sir. Sir? Be silent. Mr. Miller, do you know what you are? You, sir, are a barbarian. You enter a man's office, and with absolutely no regard for... for the amenities... You start slapping your business documents all over his desk. A, a, a thousand pardons, your Excellency. Is it your impression that you will have me sign these documents and be on an aircraft bound for the United States within the hour? No, sir. I'm, I'm completely at your disposal, sir. Uh, uh, I uh, <clears throat> understand your lovely wife is with you. How is she? Uh, yeah, that's, that's fine. We shall hold a reception in her honor tonight at the palace. Uh, I'm... I'm afraid she's not feeling well. It's uh, been a long trip. She's not a good traveler. Oh, I am sorry. Hey, perhaps tomorrow. Uh, y yes, sir. Or the day after. Now, be sure to convey my warmest personal regards to your lovely bride and, uh, and let us know when she will find it convenient to honor us with her presence. Yes, yes, sir. Good day. Uh, good, good day, sir. <sighs> Now, what remains to be done today, Escobar? Ramon. Ah, oh, yes. Ramon. He waits in his cell. We shall miss Ramon. He was a fine boy. He was a traitor. A criminal. Is there a family? He never spoke of anyone. Ah, these ambitious country boys. They get big ideas. And soon they grow ashamed of the old peasant mama back on the farm. Well, whoever she is, wherever she may be, let her believe her boy died a hero. To say something nice on the radio, Escobar. Yes, my friends, this brilliant young soldier, a hero of the Holy Revolution, was one of our leader's closest companions. Patriots, mourn for the man our leader called my friend Ramon. Swine. 
Oh, I will avenge you, my little Ramon. I will avenge you. Oh, Siriaco, did you get the flowers? Oh, oh, what a beautiful bouquet. Oh, thank you, Siriaco. Oh, thank you. And now, dear friend, we must practice. I, I, I will stand outside the palace gate and wait for him to come. Now, you pretend to be the pig. Now, now, you are leaving the palace. Start walking toward me. I call out, my leader! You, you hear a woman's voice. You look. You see a peasant. Her face, it, it shines with adoration. I hold out this bouquet, and because you are a depraved and evil man, the sight of sincerity must always amuse you. You step forward to receive my homage, my gift. I, I extend it eagerly, lovingly. And as you reach out to take it, my right hand withdraws the knife from inside the flowers, and I step and thrust. <laughs> Pilar has prepared many a peppery plate in her lifetime, but now she is assembling the ingredients for the most pungent dish of all, revenge. The recipe will come to a boil when I return shortly with Act Two. Intense love, violent hate. These can be two sides of the very same coin. And just as a coin can be flipped, so can the human emotions. Mama Pilar worshipped General Zaria, the dictator of her country, until he murdered her only son. Now she regards him as a pig to be slaughtered. And with this object in mind, she approaches the presidential palace. In her hand is a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Hidden among the stems is a knife. Clutching the bouquet, Mama Pilar addresses the soldier who stands guard at the gate. Senor, I, I beg your pardon. Can you tell me if our leader will be leaving the palace today? Why do you want to know? Well, I, I want to give him this lovely bouquet of flowers. How do I know there is not a bomb hidden inside those rose buds? I know. Oh, you better beat it. But why? It's going to get very rough around here. Sweetheart, go home. Take your hands off me. You can't get near him. He's surrounded by his personal bodyguard. I want to give him Nobody a ever gets within 50 yards of him. Move back. Move back, sweetheart. I have a gift for my leader. Run, sweetheart. They love to hear. Let me help you. Don't touch me. You'll be okay. You just fainted. No. <laughs> oh, now, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't let me alone. You're pretty lucky, you know. We used to have a captain of the guard. He gave orders to kill people. Don't cry. Don't cry. Why don't you just go home? You must sign these death sentences, my leader. How much longer must I wait for food? Till 2.30. Uh, it's three quarters of an hour. What can I have, eh? A carrot. A carrot. Don't let me cheat. I warn you. Don't let me cheat. I... Yes? Hmm. It's Senor Peter Miller. Uh, admit him. Uh, let him in. Uh, Dr. Suarez. A uh, swine. You will not what he's right. You must not let me cheat. Your Excellency? Uh, seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I have here the reports of a field check. Tell me, Mr. Miller. Hmm? Why doesn't your wife like me? Oh, sir. Now, you may you... ask, why should it matter to me if this spouse of some, some machinery peddler, which is all you really are, dislikes me? Oh, but, but sir... I have is... feelings. I dislike being snubbed. I am entitled to courtesy. I deserve consideration. 
I have the right to be taken seriously as a human being. Who is your wife, anyhow? Now, sir, the... Now, man... sir, boss, sir. It won't do. For two weeks now, you have refused all my invitations. My wife is still somewhat indisposed. May I send her our own physician, a man of international repute? Well, I... I... I think it's, it's, it's just a matter of getting, you know, used to the climate. And yeah, the of course, of course, of course. You must remember to give her my regards. Uh, y- y- yes, sir. I, I, I have some reports here. Reports? Should... Business? On such a glorious day? What, well, Your Excellency, the time grows short. Time, my dear boy, grows neither short nor long. She maintains her own steady rhythm despite all our futile efforts to hurry or delay her. Until tomorrow. Uh, Yes, sir. And if your lovely bride is sufficiently recovered, bring her with you for cocktails. (laughs) I mean tea. Good day. Uh, Good day, sir. How much longer, Escobar? Exactly 37 minutes. See to it. It must be a very large carrot. Hello, Robert. Hello, Pilar. Human beings. (laughs) What an astonishing lot we are. After all that has happened, we meet by chance, and it's... Hello, Roberto. Hello, Pilar. We have not met by chance, Roberto. I have come here to talk to you. Oh? The last time you talked to me, you denounced me as an enemy of the revolution. It was here. Right here. On this very street. Please, Roberto. Well, you did. I lost my job, my property, most of my teeth. Ah. But that's no matter. There's not much to eat nowadays, anyhow. Roberto. Are you going to denounce me again, Pilar? You... You have every right to make this difficult for me. Roberto, read this letter. Read it. I don't read anymore. It's from Ramon. Yes? For the love of God, Roberto, read it. Very well, Pilar. Read and realize... It is Ramon who writes. Yes, I see. It is Ramon who has written. And now that I have read it... Is that all you can say? What is there to say? I say I am going to kill the pig. Don't let me delay you. Roberto, listen. I cannot do it alone. He's surrounded by his guards, but I don't have to do it alone. I, I can join the resistance. Roberto... Please, let me join the resistance. What have I to do with resistance? But you need me. The resistance needs me. I am tired. I am strong. I fear nobody. And I have grown old. And I can help the resistance. Pity me, Roberto, pity me. Fighting resistance will meet tonight. Thank you, Roberto. In your cafe. In my... Why not? It's the safest place in the city. Is that you, Pete? Yeah, Marge, it's me. Oh, what about dinner? Ah, we'll have to send out. Oh, I see. I'm still being punished. Well, how can we be seen anywhere? I said you were indisposed. Why'd you say that? What else could I tell him? The truth. I don't care for his company. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. (laughs) <laughs> Another cozy evening at home with the Millers, Pete. Not. Oh, hmm? you got a call from New York, Mr. Lowry. Oh, they're getting nervous. I don't have result number one as yet. You just won't understand why I refuse to see that man. Marge, Marge, it, it, it's okay to have principles. As long as you don't practice them. Listen, we can really help these people. We, we, we'll drain swamps, cut down disease, raise food, create industry... Give them the strength to rise up and fight him. That's how to destroy Zaria. Well, I... Honey, I'm right. You know I'm right. Okay. Uh, Now you're finally doing the right thing. You really do believe that my only mission is to keep you happy. I'm not a human being in my own right. Oh, for crying out loud, there you go again. What do you mean? There I go again. Marge. I have no thoughts, no feelings of my own. 
I'm even required to give up my own honeymoon because you don't have the backbone to stand up to a two-bit would-be Hitler who needs your machinery more than you need his business. I didn't say you I would. That's enough. Where are you going? I'm indisposed. Hey, Roberto, will it be all right if I if I say a few words? Yes. I, I will tell everyone who comes here tonight. Never despair. Never give up. Can I can I say this at the meeting? Of course. You you told everyone about the meeting to, to come here. Yes. Good. But when will the meeting begin? Now. I call the meeting to order. Who wishes the floor? But but where is everyone? Here. You lied to me. You didn't tell the others. I couldn't tell the others. They are dead. But you said the resistance would meet tonight. The only organized resistance to Eduardo Guillermo Carlos Vicente Zorilla, known as the Pig, is assembled in this room. My precious Pilar, the strong and the quick are now the weak and the dead. You stood by while that obscene swine destroyed the resistance. Now you call on it to avenge your son. Our son. Our son. I would have acknowledged him. I would have married you. What kind of man marries a woman out of pity? What kind of woman denounces a man out of hate? Is there any new business? Any proposals? I propose we kill the pig. There has already been violence enough. Other resolutions? None? Unless the chair hears to the contrary, this meeting stands adjourned. Good night, Pilar. Good night, Roberto. Good night, Siriaco. Oh. Remember, Siriaco, the little American girl who read me the letter? He looks like a pig, she said. Just like that. <laughs> a skinny little girl looks at his picture and says, Pig. You know what makes her so wise, Siriaco? She thinks. Oh, there you have it. She and Roberto, thinkers, they would say, we have a problem. What is the most effective way to kill a pig? But what do they know about killing pigs? They are thinkers, philosophers, aristocrats. Oh, no, I know how to kill a pig. <laughs> tell me, Siriaco, tell me. Do I know how to kill a pig? There are probably many ways to kill a pig. But all of them have one basic requirement for success. It is necessary, first, to have your pig firmly in hand. Till now... This has been Mama Pilar's fundamental problem. However, we can depend on her to solve it. And we return shortly with Act Three. Yes, when you say five, five, six. One thing you can't fool American beer drinkers about, and that's taste. When it comes to beer, they know what they like. Yes, when you say five, five, six. And so many millions of American beer drinkers prefer and choose the Budweiser taste that it's the largest selling beer in the history of the world. And that's a fact. Pick up a six pack of Bud and taste why. You'll see that brewing beer right does make a difference. And that when you say Budweiser, you said it all. Yes, when you say Budweiser, you said it all. Yes. And Isaac Bush, St. Louis. Sometimes a gentle rain in one place adds up to a raging torrent in another. A torrent that can uproot lives as well as trees. To remedy the things that can be remedied in a disaster, 
America has a unique emergency force, the American Red Cross, America's good neighbor. Red Cross is on call 24 hours a day, every day, to cope with emergencies, whether they're on the next block or a continent away. Most of the help that's given is from volunteers. The money's from volunteers, too. Volunteers like you. If you need help, join us. If you can give help, join us. The American Red Cross. Help us help people just like you. Marge Miller is a young newlywed who is having the first fight of her marriage. And permit us to say, it's a beaut. The reason may sound familiar. She refuses to socialize with her husband's client. It acquires deeper dimension when we consider that the client also happens to be the absolute dictator of a small nation. However, here comes Mama Pilar with her own score to settle. And does she bring salvation or disaster? No, no, I'm sorry, Pilar. It's out of the question. Why does the senora insist I wish to kill somebody? It's not just somebody. Zorilla. Me? Kill my leader? Oh. Why else would you want to prepare a dinner for him? Oh, senora, I am growing old. Running a restaurant is too much for me. I, I'm looking for a job. And, and your husband's work, senora, requires you to entertain. You need a good cook. No, no, we don't entertain at all. Oh, but you should, senora. Don't you you should. start that. Besides, if I let you cook a meal for old Zoria, <laughs> you'll bury a knife in him the minute he walks in. I will not. On, on my word of honor. Well, you spike his soup with arsenic. I will not. On my word of honor, I will do I nothing to... I believe you. But Pete would never buy it. Why not? Why not? Well, let's just say he's very nervous and upset right now. Ah, then you have a problem. Such a man is no good to a woman. Oh, no, no, no. We must relax. Him, restore his desire for romance. Amen. <laughs> now, suppose, just suppose, you said to your husband, eh, invite the leader here for dinner. <laughs> You're trying to sneak up on me. I said, just suppose. Well, what would he do? I guess he'd flip. Oh, oh well, that must mean something good, eh? But, no, th there is no need to tell him I will cook the dinner until, well, until everyone arrives. And then it will be too late for him to object. How <laughs> simple it is. Simple and deceitful. Why do you want to prepare a meal for Zoria? I have my reason. Sure. I want to help my husband do his job. But I can't very well have his client killed at my dining room table. Senora, this dinner will resurrect your marriage. It makes you think that my marriage needs to be... When a bride sits alone all afternoon, emptying glasses, filling ashtrays. Pillar, pillar. Oh, no, 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 little one, don't cry. Oh, no, I promise you, this dinner will bring you both joy and happiness. It will restore your love, revive your honeymoon. But you promise, word of honor, you will kill him here, my word of honor. I won't kill him anywhere. Ah, Mr. Miller. Now I understand. If my wife were as charming as yours, I would also keep her hidden. Oh, thank you, Your Excellency. Well, we want you to share an important event with us, Your Excellency. Uh, this is to be Marge's first home-cooked meal. Oh, now, dear, I didn't say I would cook the dinner myself. I, I hired some help. We even have music. Siriaco, play for us, please. Excellency, yes. your eating schedule. Oh, yes. Yes, Escobar. Uh, thank you. My dearest Mrs. Miller, some of the cook. Oh, certainly. Pilar! Watch, what are you doing? Relax. No matter what happens, remember, I love you. Your Excellency. Your name is Pilar. Yes, my leader. Uh, you are not from this city. I would know that hill country accent anywhere. Now, don't tell me. 
Puerto San Jorge. <laughs> I, I was born there, my leader. That's the real country. Those are the real people. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, my good Pilar, prepare for me... Uh, two boiled eggs, three minutes. Uh, you tell the time? Oh, yes, my leader. Three minutes, no more, no less. Tea with one teaspoon of skim milk. Toast. One dry slice thin. But, Your Excellency, we... I am on the about... strictest diet, my dear. I, oh, I... oh, forgive me. Please, forgive me. I, I didn't know. Pilar, you'll serve all of us eggs, tea, and toast. I forbid it! <laughs> no, no, you are, you are so sweet, sympathetic, sensitive, my dear, but, but I must forbid it. Pilar, you will serve your master, mistress, and Captain Escobar the prepared meal. Yes, my leader. But Your Excellency, we have no right this to enjoy is something something like... I must learn to live with is for the best. What is food? Merely a fuel. And with me, it was once a passion... Uh, no, that passion is spent. It is burned out completely. May I serve now, senora? Well, yeah. yes, I, I suppose so. <laughs> the true passion stuck, that one. Where on earth did you find her? Oh, sir, you must never ask a lady where she finds her help. These must remain our little secrets. Oh, <laughs> oh smell that. Oh, smell that. I have not seen beef marinated San Jorge style in years. Oh, Pilar, you are a genius. Oh, thank you, my leader. Yo, I uh, don't know if I'm hungry. I command you to eat. But we have no right to enjoy gourmet cooking while you My are dear, the... my dear, this is not gourmet cooking. This is hill country cooking. Oh, I was weaned on it. That, that, that meat before you. Let me tell you how that divine fragrance and flavor is achieved. The meat is first soaked in specially spiced wine, and then marinated in a special spice and garlic sauce. The exact recipe is a secret handed down from mother to daughter. But, Your Excellency, we have no right to do this to you. We should send it back to the kitchen. No, no, I curb my passions. And so enjoy yourselves. I command you to enjoy yourselves. My leader, your eggs, tea, and toast. Thank you, my dear Pilar. Thank you. There. There you are. See? We'll see how quickly I have fueled my engine. Half a dozen bites, a couple of swallows, and I am done. You have scarcely begun. You will fritter away your lives at the table. Whereas I, I, I shall have endless hours free for work, for study, and for... Uh, and for... Uh, and, uh, oh, well. Oh, well. I, I don't see how just perhaps the, the tiniest piece of that meat could... Uh, would do me any real harm, Pilar. Yes, my leader. Let go of her arm, Escobar. My leader, I am only doing my duty. You deserve a decoration. Make note of it. Now, Pilar, uh, that piece, that... <laughs> and then did that one. Oh, fine, fine. Splendid. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, this is this is every bit the way I, I remember. <laughs> oh, this this is the foods of the gods, the gods, Pilar. My leader. A special spiced wine is always served with this. Oh, I have it here, my leader. <laughs> yes, yes, I. This is oh, good. I am renewing myself. More meat, Pilar. Where did he put it, Pete? Where? I don't know. Your Excellency, your diet. You shouldn't eat this much in a week, a, a month. Pilar. Pilar. Yes, my leader. My glass is empty. My plate's empty. Oh. Oh. oh, this is heavenly. Where has the shining light been hidden? Pilar, more meat. More of everything. Oh, you... You work for these good people, Pilar. Yes, my leader. And... When they go home. Oh, well, I mm. must find another place to cook. No, no, no. I, 
I must win the war. I have been too much. I should have eaten nothing. Take it away, Pilar. Remove everything. I must not eat no more. I must not. My, 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 my doctor is right. Your doctor lies. Uh, what have you said? Oh, oh, please, my leader. I meant no harm. All my life I, I have prepared food. It never hurt anyone. How can a doctor blame food? Yes, my kind Pilar. Oh, all the men in my family, my father, my brothers, my son, they always ate what I cooked. Not one was ever sick. My leader, this is food. This is life. I, it was so good. So good. I... My leader, who ever heard of doctors at the hill country? My father died at 95. My father was drowned at 86. He was trying to swim the San Jorge River to visit the most beautiful widow in the province. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Miller, Mrs. Miller. Y y yes, sir. Uh, you have made me aware of something I seem to have forgotten. My roots. I lost them. But I find them here. Just in time. Yes. Yes, I shall be nourished by the food of my peasant ancestors. Escobar, dismiss that quack, Dr. Suarez. But you wrestled... Mr. Miller, you... why have you come to this country? To make your fortune, eh? Well... Your fortune is made. Create, build, construct, send me engineers, teachers, technicians, designers. Have the necessary papers ready for signature in the morning. Sure. Your Excellency. Uh, see? You are successful beyond your wildest dreams. Thank, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, thank me by giving me this woman, Pilar. Would you like to live in the palace? Oh, <laughs> my leader, what... What does a peasant woman know of the palace? The kitchen. You shall rule over the kitchen. I? Yes. <laughs> Me? To, to cook for my leader? Oh, but I, I am only a plain peasant woman. Escobar, it was a plot. A plot, Excellency? A clever plan to kill me. How? They would starve me to death. Oh. Pilar. Is there more meat? Oh, yes, my leader. <laughs> of course, I have, I have learned a lesson, even from my enemies. Moderation. I shall enjoy good food, but in, in moderation. And what does my leader desire Woman. for his breakfast? <laughs> do, do I solicit your advice on the training of troops, the administration of justice? Do not consult me. Prepare what you choose. <laughs> Is there dessert? Oh, of course, my leader. I I'll go and help Pilar serve. Pilar, see? I gave you my word of honor. But you are. I got to kill him. You see that man? He can't help himself. Oh, neither can a pig. It's the nature of the animal. But Pilar, huh? look at him. A knife. A bullet. A few grains of poison. Much too swift, much too merciful. No, oh, this is better. I have seen swine stuffed like him. They die slowly, badly, in agony. Much better. Oh, be happy, senora. I have kept my word, and you have won your husband again. Pilar, the dessert. Oh, time once again to stop the pig. Coming, my leader. We have a... Simple sweet. A, a, a simple sweet? Yes, senor. We call it the Mountain of San Jorge. With cream, ice cream, chocolate, preserves, not fruit. <laughs> oh, oh, Pilar, Pilar. Mm. Mm. Dear good friends, you, you have renewed my life. Oh, your slave, my leader. Escobar. Have Dr. Suarez shot at once. There is plenty more in the kitchen, my leader. Oh, I, I can hardly wait for breakfast. <laughs> what shall we have, Villar? Oh, you <laughs> said for me to surprise you. Oh, you, will, you will serve me always, Pilar. Say, say you do. You will serve me always. You are my leader. I will serve you to the death. <laughs> Some people might say, what a way to go. But this is something the Mama Pillars of the world understand. If you can't get to a man's heart with a knife, another way, and a better way, is to get there through his stomach. I shall return shortly. The pen 
is mightier than the sword. This sentiment was written by a man and can be dismissed as male chauvinist propaganda. What every woman knows is that mightier than the pen or the sword is the knife and the fork. If you don't believe it, just ask Mama Pilar. Our cast included Bryna Rayburn, Marion Seldes, Jack Grimes, Leon Janney, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, Buick Motor Division, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This is the NBC University Theater, bringing you the seventh in our series of dramatizations of outstanding works by modern British and American authors. Today, Van Heflin stars in the title role of the Sinclair Lewis novel, Aerosmith. of the wagon swaying through the Ohio wilderness was a ragged girl of 14. Come on now! She had buried her mother near a river some miles back, and on the floor of the wagon lay her father, shrinking with fever. As she halted at a fork in the road, the sick man quavered. Uh, Emmy! Huh? You better turn down towards Cincinnati. If we could find your Uncle Ed, I, I guess he'd take us in. Nobody ain't going to take us in. We're going on. Going west. Giddy up! That was the great-grandmother of Martin Arrowsmith. By 1906, Winnemac was a thriving Midwestern state much like its neighbors, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana. It boasted the bustling city of Zenith, and 15 miles away in the town of Mohalis, a brisk state university with 5,000 students. But even as late as 1906, Martin Arrowsmith, beginning his first year at the medical school of the university, still had a strain of the pioneer explorer, and along with desire and impatience to be at it. It was a portentous hour as he hurried into the slate-colored hall of the main medical. He was going to specialize in bacteriology. The great Professor Gottlieb was going to recognize him as a genius. But then he stood before the door of the professor's cubbyhole of an office. Well? Yes? Oh, uh, Professor Gottlieb, my name is Aerosmith. I'm a medic freshman, Winnemac B.A. And, uh... Look, I, I'd sure like to take bacteriology this fall instead of next year. You see, I, I've had a lot of chemistry. No, 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 I... it is not time for you. Well, honestly, I, I know I could do it now if you just... There are two kinds of students that the gods give me. One kind they dump on me like a bushel of potatoes. I take them and teach them to kill patients. The other kind, there are very few. They seem to wish a little bit to become scientists. I teach them right away the ultimate lesson of science, which is to... Fate and doubt. But honestly, you see, with, with my chemistry... Have you taken physical chemistry? No, no, sir, not physical, but, but I did very well in, in organic. Organic and I've... chemistry, puzzle chemistry, stink chemistry, drugstore chemistry. That is a trade for pot washers. No, no, you are too young. 
Come back in a year. At the college inn, while devouring an enormous banana split and a bar of almond chocolate, Martin meditated... I want to take bacteriology. I want to take bacteriology now. Well, I'll show Gottlieb. Someday I'll discover the germ of cancer or something, and then I'll make him look foolish. Oh, Lord, I I hope I won't get f- sick the first time I go into the dissecting room. By his sophomore year, Martin had grudgingly to admit that Gottlieb had been right about physical chemistry. And the confusion of the bacteriological laboratory was ecstasy to him. The most radiant things in the world were rows of test tubes filled with watery serum and plugged with cotton, singed to a coffee brown. He had begun, perhaps in youthful imitation of Gottlieb, to work by himself in the laboratory at night. You're so late, Martin. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm studying trypanosomes from a rat. Oh, let me have a look at your slide. Yes, sir. Hmm. You have stained the germs very well. Yes, splendid. You have craftsmanship. Do you really think so, Uh, Professor? Not five times in five years do I have students who understand craftsmanship and precision. And maybe some big imagination and hypothesis. I think perhaps... You may have them. Oh, well, I, 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 I certainly hope so, Professor. No, I... don't misunderstand. I do not think you will be a good doctor. Good doctors are fine. Often they are artists. But their trade is not for us lonely ones that work in labs. I will have a little sandwich in my room at midnight. If you should happen to work so late, I should be very pleased if you would come have a bite. After the midnight supper and a rambling talk... Martin ran home altogether drunk with happiness. The rest of that year, three things occupied Martin Arrowsmith's mind. Bacteriology, Professor Gottlieb, and to a somewhat lesser degree, Madeline Fox. Madeline was a handsome, high-spirited, opinionated girl whom Martin had known in college. She was staying on ostensibly to take a graduate course in English, actually to avoid going home. Martin thought her particularly desirable and attractive. But it's doubtful he would ever have proposed to her except for that spring evening on the roof of her apartment house. Hi, Madeline. Hello. Your mother said you were up here. I say, those Japanese lanterns you hung up, they look keen. Hmm. That's a, that's a dandy new strip of matting you put down here. Oh, it is not. It's mangy, and you know it. Hey, what's the matter, Madeline? <laughs> oh, Mart, I'm so sick of myself tonight. I'm always trying to make people think I'm somebody. I'm not a... I'm just a bluff. Oh, no, wait a minute. Come on, now, what is it, dear? Oh, lots. Come on, tell me. Well, Dr. Brumford hang him. I'm not doing a thing, he said. And if I don't have my Ph.D., I won't be able to land a nice job teaching English in some swell school. I'd better land one, too. Because it doesn't look to poor Madeline as if anybody was going to marry her. Well, now, wait a minute. I, I know exactly who... I tell be. people how clever I am. I don't suppose they believe it. Probably they go off and laugh at no, me. No, they do not. If they did, well, I, I'd just like to see anybody try laughing at you it's once. It's awfully sweet and dear of you. But I'm not worth it. I'll have to go home with Mother. I can't stand it, Mart. I just can't stand it. I won't go back. I won't. No, no, no. Look, <laughs> darling, look, p- come on, put your head on my shoulder. Oh, Mart. Look, you know, I, I almost <laughs> feel as if I dared to love you. You know what? I tell you, you're going to marry me. Well, it'll take a couple of more years, of course, but then we're going to get married. By thunder, with you helping me, I'm going to climb right to the top and be a big surgeon. We're going to have we're going to have everything. Oh, well, dearest, do be wise. I don't want to keep you from your scientific work. Oh, well, I, well, I, I would like to keep up some research, but I'm not just a lab cat. There's no reason I can't do both. Oh, 
Martin. Oh, Madeline. Mart. Mart, dear, now that we're engaged, Mother will want us to go to church with her. We could just once, don't you think? And, darling, the very first free time you have, let's go into Zenith and buy you a new pair of trousers. Those corduroy ones are really quite shabby. For a year, Madeline waged various crusades to improve Martin at the same time, managing to make him feel grateful and lucky. And then Gottlieb sent him into the huge Zenith General Hospital to secure a strain of meningococcus from an interesting patient. Martin wandered through the long corridors trying to look important, hoping to be taken for a doctor, and succeeded only, only in feeling extraordinarily embarrassed. Nurse, I want to find Ward D. Do you? Yes, I do. If I can interrupt your work oh, long enough matter. to... The darn superintendent of nurses put me at scrubbing, and we aren't even supposed to scrub floors. She caught me smoking a cigarette. She's no terror. If she found a child like you wandering around here, she'd drag you out by the ear. My dear young woman, it may interest you to know that My I am... My dear young woman. Sounds exactly like our old prof. I you? am Dr. Aerosmith. Oh. And I've been informed that even probationers learn that the first duty of a nurse is to stand when addressing doctors. I wish to find Ward D to take a strain. It may interest you to know of a very dangerous microbe. So if you'll kindly direct me to oh, Ward... Oh, gee, I've been getting fresh again. I, I don't seem to get along with this military discipline. All right, I'll stand up. You, <clears throat> you go back, turn right, and then left. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry I was fresh. But if you saw some of the old muffs of doctors that a nurse has to be meek to, I... Honestly, doctor... <laughs> that is, if you really are a doctor. Oh, you're back. Yes, uh, I came to, um... <laughs> well, <laughs> I was... I was going to bawl you out for your impudence, but now I, <laughs> I've forgotten what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to be rude. I was just... Oh, well, scrubbing makes me bad-tempered. I thought you were awfully nice, and... Oh, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, but you did seem so young for a doctor. Well, I, I'm not. not. I'm, I'm a medic. <laughs> I was just showing off. <laughs> <laughs> so was I. Uh, it's pretty hard, this, this training for a nurse, I guess, isn't it? Oh, it's not so awful. But it's just as romantic as being a hired girl. Uh, that's what we call them in Dakota. Oh, you come from Dakota? Mm-hmm. From the most enterprising town in the entire state of North Dakota, Wheat Sylvania. <laughs> <laughs> 362 inhabitants, unless the Nordbloms have had their seventh child already, and that would make it 63. <laughs> hey, what, what do they call you? Me? Oh, well, it's an idiotic name. It, Leora Tozer. What's the matter with Leora? I think that's well, fine. Look, uh, uh, when can, can you get away from the hospital for dinner? Tonight, maybe? Oh, why? Come on, please, please, huh? All right. When can I call for you? Well, I really shouldn't. You know, I... Well, seven o'clock. If we don't stop having dinner together so often, I'm going to get fired and you'll flunk out of medical school. Yeah, I don't care. I, I guess I bore you, though. I, I talk too much. Oh, mm. no. I like having you trust me. I... I'm not, well, earnest, and I, I haven't any brains whatever, but I do love it when my men folks think I'm intelligent enough to hear what they really Oh, think. no, you, you have brains. You have lots of oh, brains. Oh, no, I don't, but I don't care. <laughs> I want to call you Sandy. What? Mm -hmm. Why do I? Well, you're as unsandy as can be, but somehow you're sandy to me. Well, no, I, 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 <laughs> I like that. I suppose I bore you, though. Telling you all about my folks and Wheatsylvania and all... Look, you'll never bore me. But you don't have to tell me about you. I've always known you, darling. And I'm not going to let you go no matter what. You're going to marry me. (laughs) 
Martin went home, engaged to two girls at once. Oh, my darling. I'm so glad you called. I've missed you so. Of course, I know how busy you are and that I have to play second fiddle to all those Listen, little bugs. Listen, but... Madeline, there's, uh, there's a great friend of mine in Zenith that I, I want you to meet. Oh? Uh, oh, well, you, you'll see tomorrow. I want you to come in and have lunch with... Uh, uh, well, I, I tell you what, we'll all have lunch. I, I want you to meet me at the 1140 in Urban at College Square. Now, can you do that? Oh, Mart, I'd love to, but I have an 11 o'clock and I don't like to cut it. And I promised May Harmon to go shopping with her. We sort of thought maybe we might lunch at Ye College, Karen. Now, listen, this is important. Will you come or not? Mr. Aerosmith tells me you're a nurse, Miss, uh, Tozier. Uh, yes, sort of. Madeline, the reason I Do you find I it interesting? Wanted, oh, well, uh, yes. To... Yes, I think it's interesting. I suppose it must be wonderful to relieve suffering. <laughs> uh, of course, my work, don't... I'm taking my doctor of philosophy degree in English, if... it's rather dry and detached. Well, yes, it must be. Uh, no, it must be very interesting. Look, Madeline, Do the... you come from Zenith, Miss Tozer? No. <clears throat> no, I come from, well, just a little town. Well, hardly a town. North Dakota. Oh. <laughs> North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Way west. Oh, yes. Uh, Are you uh, the... staying east for some time? Oh, uh, well, I do. Yes. Yes, I guess I may be here quite some time. Do you, um... Do you find you like it here? Oh, yes. It's, it's pretty nice. Uh, These big cities, there's so much to see. Big? <laughs> well, I suppose it all depends on the point of see, view. Uh, look, I don't... Doesn't it? Uh, like oh, to... Oh, uh, tell me, Martin, dear. What? Are you planning some more work on the, uh, uh, what is it, with rabbits? Look, Madeline, I, I brought you two together because... Now, I don't know whether you'll cotton to each other or not, but I, I wish you could because I've, uh... Well, now, now look, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making any excuses for myself. I just couldn't help it. I'm engaged to both of you, and... Oh. I... You're engaged... Well... Uh, Madeline, uh, oh. I don't... Don't get upset, Martin. I won't make a scene. Miss Tozer, dear, I'm sorry for you. You've got a job on your hands. You poor baby. Goodbye. Sandy? Yeah? Sandy, I might as well tell you now. I, I'm never going to give you up. You're mine. <laughs> Leora, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. Don't think so well of yourself. I guess you are pretty selfish. Perhaps you'll like me because I, I tag after you, and she never would. Oh, I simply adore you frightfully. Well, heaven knows why. Well, she has sense enough to make you admire her and tag after her, but... Your mind. Look, darling, don't don't think that she's any brighter than you are. She's just glib, but uh, she's not. Uh... Oh, come on, let's stop talking. I've found you, and then my life's begun. They were married the next year. With the responsibility of a wife, Martin decided he should become a general practitioner and thereby assure himself of an immediate livelihood. But always stirring within him was the desire for scientific research, a gnawing desire that made him restless and finally unpopular. And so through years marked by dull routine or battling enmities, he and Le Leora moved from Wheatsylvania to Nautilus, from Nautilus to Chicago. And then came the letter from Max Gottlieb, now at the McGurk Institute of Biology in New York. Dear Martin, I have read with great pleasure your paper recently printed in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. I have spoken about you to Dr. Tobes, head of the Institute. When are you coming to us? To me. Your laboratory is waiting for you. Oh, Sandy. I know I'm simply going to adore New York. Well, 
Born to the prairies, never far from the site of the cornfields, Martin was conveyed to blazing lands and great enterprises. To the McGurk building, a sheer wall, 30 blank stories of glass and limestone, down in the pinched triangle where New York rules a quarter of the world. So, this is your laboratory, Martin. Uh, this is just about... <laughs> well, it, it's all I ever dreamed of. Uh, look, Dr. Gottlieb, do you really think that I, I know enough to work here? If you will look mysterious all the time, Dr. Tobes, our director, will think you are up to something <laughs> big. <laughs> uh, perhaps I am a cramp, Martin. But remember that all men who work at science are not scientists. You will see that even here, I regret to say. To be a scientist, well... It is born in you. When Martin had closed the door of his laboratory and let his spirit flow out and fill that minute apartment with his own essence, he felt secure, and he prayed the prayer of the scientist... God give me unclouded eyes and freedom from haste. God give me a quiet and relentless anger against all pretense and all pretentious work and all work left slack and unfinished. God give me a restlessness whereby I may not sleep nor accept praise until my observed results equal my calculated results or in pious glee I discover and assault my error. God give me strength not to trust to God. Martin soon understood Max Gottlieb's statement that all men of science are not scientists. During the next three years, he was often annoyed by the money mad, the social climbers, and those who gave in to petty jealousies. Then his research wiped out everything else. As he realized that he had something at the mysterious source of life. You sent for me, Dr. Gottlieb? Ah, uh, yes, Martin, sit down. Thank you. Uh, Martin, perhaps you have thought I have neglected you lately. Oh, no, no, sir, uh, not It is all. true that since I have been made director of the Institute, I do not have time for all the things I should like. Ah, oh, even my own research must suffer. But I have closely studied your work with your phage principle... Well, one can't really know its value, though, until it's had a thorough test. Exactly. Uh, how would you like the opportunity to conduct such a test? Uh, well, sir, th that would be the dream uh, of yes, any... Yes, yes, it comes to me that there is bubonic plague in the West Indies. They have heard of your work in phage and appeal to us for help. Well, it, if you mean I that... could trust you, Martin, to use the phage with only half your patients and keep the others as controls without the phage then you could make an absolute determination of its value. If I could trust you to do that, I would send you down to San Hubert. What do you think? Give me the chance, Dr. Gottlieb. I, I swear to you that I'll observe test conditions. If you go, you must promise me, Martin. Promise not to let anything, not even your own good, kind heart, spoil your experiment at San Hubert. You must refuse to let yourself indulge in pity for the men you will see dying. You will go... On these conditions, Martin? On those conditions, sir. Yes, I will go. I'm going with you. You are not. Well, I am. It's not safe, Silly. Leora. Of course it is. You can shoot me full of your nice old phage, and then I'll be absolutely all listen, right. Listen, Lee. Darling, listen. Listen. I do think that the phage will immunize against the plague, but I don't know. Now, you, you simply can't go, Leora. You, you, you've got Sandy, to... Sandy, don't you know that I haven't any life outside of you? I might have had, but honestly, I've been glad to let you absorb me. If you were off there and I, I didn't know that you were all right, or, or if you died and somebody else cared for you, I, I'd go mad. Darling, don't make it any harder for me. It's going to be hard enough. In any case, Sandy Aerosmith, don't you dare use those old stuck-up expressions that husbands have, have been drooling out to wives forever and ever. Oh, you're a rotten husband. You neglect me absolutely. But I don't care. 
I'd rather have you than any decent husband. Besides, I'm going. And she did. It was late at night when they arrived at Blackwater. A small covered launch came out from the shore to get them. It was plain to see that the captain was anxious to unload his passengers for St. Hubert and be gone from the place. All right, all right, all right. You may climb down to the launch now. Hurry, please. I, I've got to get along. You're the McGurk Commission? Yes. Good. My name's Aerosmith. Well, I'm Dr. Stokes of St. Swithin's uh, Parish. This is my wife, Dr. Stokes. Honored. How do you do? Tell me, how many cases of plague have you got now? Uh, Lord knows. Maybe a thousand and ten million rats. Um, I'll check on your luggage. Oh, thank you very much. Leora. Huh? Quick now, you, you can still go back. You must, and please. And leave this pretty launch. Oh, Sandy. Well, just look at the elegant engine it's got. Oh, gosh, Sandy, I, I'm scared blue. <laughs> The following afternoon, Inchcape Jones, Surgeon General of St. Hubert's, took Martin and Leora to Penrith Lodge on the cool hills behind Blackwater. I think you'll find Penrith Lodge quite adequate, Doctor. Plenty of room here for your laboratory. Oh, yes, yes, it seems big enough. And the place is absolutely rat-proof. Safest place on the island, I assure you. Well, I'm sure it'll be quite comfortable. I'll leave you now to get settled. But, uh... First, Dr. Arrowsmith. Yes, sir? There's one matter I must take up with you. What is that? I, uh, I hear some talk that you want to give your phage to only half the people. Yes, that's my plan. Then I must tell you as Surgeon General, I can't approve such action. What? Look here, man. You've got a life-saving serum. You can't withhold it from half the people and let the rest... Dr. Jones, the work scientists do in the laboratories is useless unless it can be followed through with the same thoroughness. And I'm a scientist, not a sentimentalist. And I, sir, am a human. Unless you agree to administer phage to everyone, I shall not permit you to administer it to anyone. Days passed. The panic increased. But neither Dr. Jones nor Dr. Arrowsmith gave in. The citizens heard that Martin was withholding their salvation. It became a torment for him to go out in the street now. That's the one. Arrowsmith. He calls himself a doctor. He's a killer. Doctor, I lose four children. Now my last one, my baby, dies. Save him. You can save Step him. Neither of you to put pity nor fear of your own death keep you from making the plague experiment. Oh, save us. Save us. Can I trust you, Martin? Just a little for Neither my baby. Neither pity nor fear. Killer, a killer. Can I trust you, Martin? Can I trust you? Leora! Leora! Sandy! Oh, Sandy! Leora. Poor darling. Three days later, Inchcape Jones was dead. Thus came Martin to his experiment. Dr. Stokes was appointed Surgeon General. Now I can go to work, Lee. Stokes is in complete agreement with my plan. Oh, I'm so glad. So thankful, I'm Sandy. going to start my work in St. Swithin's Parish. The plague's worse there. Oh. But now, look, don't, don't worry about me. I'll stay at the Twyfords. I'll be very safe. Oh, but you... you... Darling, now look. This time I can't take you. Well, you can't... No, 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 now please. Stokes made the arrangements for me. The Twyfords are crowded now. I can't ask to bring you. Besides, I'll feel lots freer and safer to, to know that, uh, that you're here where it's absolutely oh, safe. Oh, but darling, Now, I... please, Lee, please, darling. As soon as I can find room for you, I'll come for you. In the meantime, now promise me you're going to take your shots every day. Oh, all right. I know when I'm licked. Oh, but take care of yourself, darling. Hurry back to me. I don't even half exist when you're not around. <laughs> The first week in St. Swithin's stretched on like one long hour for Martin, 
but for Leora back at Penrith Lodge, the time was unending. One evening, she wandered into his laboratory because she felt closer to him there. She found one of his half-smoked cigarettes, picked it up, lighted it. But that morning, a maid had knocked over a test tube. The cigarette seemed dry enough, but in it, there were enough plague germs to kill a regiment. The maids found she was ill, and they fled from the house. Her throat cracked with thirst. She crawled to the kitchen for water. If I could just get water. Oh, Sandy. Sandy? That you, Sandy? No. Not here. He told me to do something. I can't remember. What? I can't stand up. Oh, Sandy. The floor is moving and the the walls are coming down. If I could just get up, I'd walk to you. Water. I'm so, so hot. Sandy, (laughs) you will come. Come and help me. I... I know, Sandy, you'll come. Please. Sandy. (laughs) Sandy! From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you Van Heflin in our adaptation of the Sinclair Lewis novel, Aerosmith, the seventh in the series of dramatizations of outstanding works by modern British and American authors. Information on how to obtain free materials on the authors and books presented in this series will be given at the close of the program. Now, here to comment on the Sinclair Lewis work is Mr. Granville Hicks, Distinguished author of The Great Tradition, John Reed, The Making of a Revolutionary, and Small Town. Our intermission commentator, Mr. Hicks, speaking from New York. Sinclair Lewis has been writing novels ever since 1914, and he has written a great many, some good, some pretty bad. Of the good ones, there are four that might be called the pillars on which his reputation rests. Main Street, Babbitt, Arrowsmith, and Dodsworth, all of them published in the 1920s. Arrowsmith has always been the popular favorite. Literary critics may argue that Babbitt is the book that really shows how our business civilization works, or they may say that Dodsworth is the best piece of writing, the most imaginative and the most mature of the novels. But the public which frequently refuses to behave as the experts think it ought to, has always voted for Arrowsmith. And it is not hard to see why. Among its assets, Arrowsmith has not only the most attractive hero and by all odds the most appealing heroine Lewis ever invented, but also a subject of perennial interest and many of the elements of a success story. At the same time, Arrowsmith is pure Sinclair Lewis. As he describes the pilgrimage of Martin Arrowsmith, Lewis pours forth his scorn on greedy and incompetent doctors wherever he finds them. And he finds them all the way from the small towns to the highest professional and social levels of New York City. Nor is he shooting only at the doctors. As his hero moves up the ladder, Lewis finds plenty to satirize on every rung. Lewis's satire doesn't always wear well. Some of it, in fact, seems embarrassingly obvious. There are whole pages that make you feel that Lewis isn't any great shakes of a writer. But just as you are reaching that conclusion, you come across a passage that takes your breath away because it is so exactly right, because it renders so wonderfully not merely the outward appearance, but also the inner meaning of some piece of American life. 
There are such insights even in the poorest of Lewis's novels, and the good ones are full of them. You cannot read these novels without coming to a better understanding of America and perhaps of yourself as well. It should also be said that Sinclair Lewis is not what he pretends to be. Although he is often posed as a cynic and an iconoclast, he has a great affection for people, all kinds of people, and a deep passion for truth and justice. Witness, for example, his most recent novel, King's Blood Royal, which is a strong plea for justice, and witness Arrowsmith, which is a plea for honesty. This is no cynic, but a man who has sought the truth and has found some part of it. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Now our adaptation of the Sinclair Lewis novel Arrowsmith with Van Heflin in the leading role continues from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. Also staying at the Twyford home in St. Swithin's was the wealthy young widow, Joyce Lanyon. She had come to St. Hubert to see her plantations and had been trapped by the quarantine. Martin admired her willingness to help with the cleaning and cooking, and he found her company pleasant after the long days of work. I still say it's inhuman, keeping the phage from half these poor people. Well, you aren't the first to say that, you know. I've heard that on all sides. But I'm getting results. Nothing can make me do it now, not even if they tried to lynch me. Well, I won't try to argue with you. It's too pleasant a night. Yes, isn't it? Tell me about your wife. About, uh, well, she's, uh... <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain or describe your wife, I guess. I, I hope you'll like each other, but I don't know if you will or not. You're so darn different. Oh? Well, yeah, you're, you're, uh... I know, you're awfully articulate. You've been all over the world. Lee's never been any place but where I've dragged her. And oh. You have beautiful clothes, and you wear them very well. And oh. I know Leora doesn't know what she has on half the time. She just sits back and... Well, I don't mean, you know, she never misses anything, but she never says much. Mm -hmm. Still, she, you know, she's got the best instinct for honesty I think I've ever known. You make me feel like a terrible phone. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute. I, I didn't mean that. Not at all. You're... Well, I think you're tops, but, uh... Honestly, I, I hope you'll get on together. Oh, is she coming here? Yes, I was afraid to let her come at first. I didn't know what I'd find, but now I know it's safe. I'm going to go back for her later tonight. As soon as Mr. Twyford comes back with his car, I'm going to bustle right over to Penrith. <laughs> Leora! Lee, I'm here! Hey, Leora, I'm back! Where is that woman? Hey, Lee! She's probably sound asleep. Leora, come on, wake up! Funny, I wonder where those servants are. Leora! This place is filthy. The servants must have. Leora! Ah, oh, there you are. Leora? Are, are you asleep? You're, you're asleep, aren't you, Lee? Leora, come on, answer me. Leora? Leora? Ah... Uh. Come in, come in. Hello, Martin. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. I'm drunk. I'm drunk all the time. I know. That's why I came. All my fault. Well, I was safe in St. Swift and Shoes. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't anyone's. But to give up now, that would be unforgivable. 
Won't you let me offer you friendship? Oh, I don't want anybody's friendship. I haven't got any friends. But when Joyce left, Martin felt a shiver of new courage. Most evenings from then on he was sober. But because the need for it had for the first time been brought to him, he gave the phage to everyone who asked. When Martin returned to the Institute, he found that Dr. Gottlieb had uh, resigned because of ill health. And the new director, Dr. Rippleton Holabird, was using Martin as his prize exhibit. Dr. Holabird, I feel that it's a very grave mistake to give out all this talk to the newspapers until my results have been given statistical analysis. Oh, come now. You know you've done what very few other living men could do, and you must take the credit, do you, and the institute you represent. But until we have the proof, now, sir, I, I have it... proof enough for me. Now, you must leave such matters for me to decide. Oh, uh, incidentally, my boy... I'm making you head of your department. Martin took his anger to his one remaining friend at the Institute, the uncouth, blustering bachelor chemist, Terry Wickett. I'll resign, Terry. I swear I will. Publishing all this stuff without any real proof. I'll expose that guy. Hey, Slim, hold on. Wait a minute. Why should I? Listen to me. Just get along with Holy Bird for a while. We'll work out something we can do together. Be independent. What do you mean, we can work out something? I'll tell you, Slim. See, I got a shack up in the Vermont Hills, two miles from a railroad station. Someday I'll figure out a way of making the lab pay up there. The manufacturing sear or something. We can work, say, two hours a day on the commercial end. The rest of the time we'll be absolutely free for scientific research. Free? No director, no society patrons, no trustees. How's that sound? Well, that sounds just too good to be true. Yeah, we'll have it, son. Just wait. Now, stick it out here a while longer. One more year. Two at most. But within a year, Martin was married to Joyce Lanyon. In the first year of his marriage, Martin was happy. He was exploring a new life with Joyce, and he and Terry were working together a new macacus. They began to have a few good results, but unfortunately, Dr. Holabird heard about them. I uh, understand you men have a cure for pneumonia. Well, that's... Oh, exactly... now, wait, wait just a minute, sir. We have a few findings, but nothing to support a claim. Well, then let me have those, and we'll publish them. We will not. And by the time you change the wordings of our report, you'd have the whole world coming to the doors of McGurk looking for a cure for pneumonia. It's time to let the world know what you're doing, wicked. Well, if I did, the world would know a doggone sight more than I do. Nothing doing, Chief. Maybe we can publish in a year from now. You will publish now or else... All right, Holy Bird. The blessed moment has arrived. I quit. And I'm so gentlemanly that I'll do it without telling you what I think of you. Thus was Terry Wickett discharged from a gurk. Martin assumed that he too would resign. He explained it to Joyce on their way home from a dinner party. Now, can you beat that? The holy ran fires, Terry, but he doesn't dare touch me. Oh, what will Dr. Wickett do now? Oh, well, he's all set. He's patented his process of synthesizing quinine. He'll retire to his place up in Vermont and start real scientific research. I waited simply because I wanted to watch Holabird figure out what I'd do. Now... And now? Well, now I'm free. By thunder, I'm free at last. Because I've worked up to something that's worth being free for. Well, I still don't quite know what you plan to do, dear. Well, work with Terry, naturally. We've only oh, begun wait, our... wait, wait just a moment, please. Well, look, I I'll accomplish uh, Mart, so much. If, if you went on working with Dr. Wickett, you'd have to be leaving me constantly. Well, not... Uh, well, I, I mean, uh, on and off, I yes, really that... don't think that would be quite nice. I mean, especially now, because I fancy I'm going to have a baby. Joyce. Oh, I'm not going to do the weeping, Mother, but it does complicate things, you know. Uh, yes. And personally, I should be sorry if you left the Institute, which gives you a solid position for some hole-and-corner existence. I don't want you to desert me. And you would if you went off to this horrid Vermont place. 
Well, uh, couldn't we uh, get a little house near there and, and spend part of the year or Possibly, something? Possibly, but... Oh, let's wait till this beastly job of bearing a dear little one is over. Then we can think about it. Martin did not resign from the Institute, and Joyce didn't think about taking a house in Vermont to the extent of doing it. After their son was born, Joyce begrudged even more the evenings Martin spent in his laboratory. But, Joyce, you must understand I've got to work nights. Holabird keeps me so busy with unimportant things during the day, and, and... Well, I won't let Terry Wicked get ahead of me up there in Vermont. I know, but, darling, you get so nervous when you're working like this, and, and when you make yourself so drawn and trembly, uh, are you gaining time in the long run? It, it's just for your own I'm sake. I'm sorry, Joyce, but I'll never be able to keep regular oh, hours and... wait. I have it. What? Uh, you'll see. Never mind. You'll see what a scientist I what, am. What, what are no, you... I won't explain I... now. Not yet. But just you wait. Two weeks later, after dinner one evening, a gallant, joyous Joyce led Martin to the two unoccupied rooms over the garage behind their house. Now, what is all this mystery, Joyce? Just a moment now. Oh, there you are, what? Dr. Arrowsmith. Well, uh... Isn't it wonderful, darling? <laughs> Don't you know what it is? Well, I... I would say it remarkably resembles a laboratory. <laughs> but of course. But not just anybody's, dear. It's your lab. Your very own. And I'll wager it's the best bacteriology lab in the country. Look at your icebox, your incubator. Uh, yeah. Here's your microscope. And uh, this is a perfect, uh, what they called it, uh, constant temperature yeah, bath. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it certainly has everything. Oh, darling, you do like it, don't you? Oh, well, yes. Yes, dear, of course. Now, when you simply must work evenings, you can slip out here and work as late as you want. You are pleased, aren't you? Sure. Sure, you better... Why, you'll finish your experiment months before Terry Wicket up in that barbaric hideaway. Through the circle of Joyce's friends, the rumor panted that there was a new diversion in an exhausted world. Excuse me, just a minute. <laughs> Isn't he adorable, the way he teaches his darling bacteria to say pretty Polly? <laughs> Mart is so cute with all those little vases. <clears throat> just precisely what is he doing? Oh, he's, uh... Oh, all sorts of interesting things. <laughs> oh, please, Ma, do something exciting for us. Pretty, please. Can't you create life out of turtle eggs or whatever it is? <laughs> oh, oh, why, Martin, did you drop something? I'm sorry, am I... My hand slipped. Not losing the old grip, are you, son? <laughs> oh, I, I do hope there wasn't anything well, serious in those little vases. No, no, just uh, flu germs, I think. Though, of course, that may have been one of the leprosy vases. Oh, my oh. dear! The following winter, Dr. and Mrs. Rippleton Holabird invited Joyce and Martin to dinner. They were the only guests. Holabird was his most charming self. He admired uh, Joyce's pearls, and when the squabs had been served, he turned on Martin with friendly intensity. Big things are happening, Martin, and I want you... No, no, science wants you to take your proper place in them. What, some new experiment? Or... Oh, no, no, much bigger. Martin, as you know, Dr. Tubbs left the Institute to head the new League of Cultural Agencies. And Colonel Minigan, who is backing the League, has been extraordinarily generous. Well, the old bird... Uh, well, I mean, he's, he's quite wealthy. Yes, I have certain reasons for supposing I can bring Ross McGurk and Minigan together. So, I shall probably quit the Institute and help Tubbs guide the League of Cultural Agencies. 
And then we'll need a new director of McGurk who will work with us. Won't that be simply exciting? Yes. Now, Martin, I have faith in you. I believe now that you've seen more of Joyce's set in mine. Well, I believe I can coax you to take a broader view. A broader view? Yes. I'm authorized to appoint an assistant director. And I think I'm safe in saying that he would succeed me as full director. I dare say in a year or two, you will be director of McGurk. Martin. Really? I feel honored to be present at such an occasion. Why, I, uh, uh, well, I'll have to think this over. It's sort of unexpected, if you know. <laughs> well, certainly, certainly. Take time, day or even two. Talk it over with Joyce. Oh, I do have faith in you, Martin. Dear old boy. Oh, isn't it too wonderful, Mart? And I do feel Rippleton Holabird can bring it off. Oh, think of your being director, head of that whole institute. Would you really like to see me director? Well, of course. All that... Uh... Oh, you know, I don't just mean the prominence and respect, but the power to accomplish good. Would you like to see me dictating letters and giving out interviews, buying linoleum and having lunch with distinguished fools, trying to advise men about whose work I, I, I don't know a blame thing? Oh, don't be superior. Someone has to do these things. And you really would have me give up my own work. You know, Mart, I'm the last person to speak of money, but... Really, it's you who so often brought up the matter of hating to be dependent on me. And, you know, as director, you'd make so much more that... Oh, Martin, forgive me. Martin didn't go through the turmoil of deciding. He leaped to a decision without it. Later that night, he marched into Joyce's room. Well? Well, I'm not going to do it, even if I have to leave the Institute. And Holabird will just about make me quit. I will not get buried in this pompous fakery of giving orders. What I ought to do is to go up to Vermont right now and work with Terry. The old argument, the wiles, the simple life. It's just the absurd, cowardly sort of thing these tired highbrows do that sneak off to some esoteric colony and think they're getting strength to conquer life when they're merely running away from oh, it. Oh, no, no, you're wrong, Joyce. Terry has his place in the country only because he can live cheaper up there. Look here, Mart. You feel so virtuous about wanting to go off and wear a flannel shirt and be peculiar and very, very pure. Suppose everybody argued that way. Just what would become of the world? Suppose I were poor and you left me and I had to support John by taking in washing. Well, it'll probably be fine for you, but first on the washing. Oh, no, I'm, I beg your pardon. That was an obvious answer. Martin, listen to no, me. No, no. Now, this debate could go on forever. The fact is that I've suddenly seen that I must go. I want my freedom to work and I herewith quit. You've been very generous to me and I'm grateful. You've been kind. But you've never been mine. Goodbye, Joyce. Martin drove up to Terry's shanty in a bobsled. Terry was chopping wood in a mess of chip littered snow. Hi, Terry. Hello, Slim. Well, I've come for keeps, Terry. Fine, Slim. Say, there's a lot of dishes up in the shack need washing. Martin had become soft. To dress in the cold shanty and to wash in icy water was agony. But the rapture of being allowed to work 24 hours a day carried him on. And after a few months, he felt himself growing sinewy. He was quite at home that day, the following spring when he peeped out to, to see a gigantic motor car crawl up their woods road and come to a stop. It's a sweet place, really, Mart. No. Yeah. You look beautiful, Joyce. Oh, darling, I have missed you. I've come to stay. 
What? I'll build a house near here. A wide, low house with enormous verandas and red awnings. And visitors coming. Oh, I suppose so, sometimes. Why? Joyce, I do love you. I want awfully just now to kiss you properly. But I will not have you bringing a lot of people up here. There'd probably be a rotten, noisy motor launch. Make a, a joke out of our lab, a roadhouse, a new sensation. Why, why Terry, he'd go crazy. You are lovely, but you want a playmate, and I want to work. No, I'm, I'm afraid you can't stay. Martin, aren't you perhaps a little insane? Oh, absolutely, and how I enjoy it. No, no, wait a minute. Let me think. I, I, I don't believe we're insane. We're farmers. Martin, you've left common sense completely. Well, I am common sense. I believe in bathing. Goodbye. <laughs> On a certain May evening, Dr. Rippleton Holabird was addressing a meeting of celebrated thinkers assembled by the League of Cultural Activities. That evening, Max Gottlieb sat unmoving and alone in a dark, small room above the banging city street. Only his eyes were alive now. And that evening... Hot breezes languished along a palm-waving ridge, and a depression in a garden marked the grave of Leora. That evening, after an unusually gay dinner, Joyce admitted to a gentleman friend, Yes, if I do divorce him, I may marry you. <laughs> I know. He's never going to see how egotistical it is to think he's the only man living who's always right. And that evening, Martin Arrowsmith and Terry Wickett lolled in a clumsy boat, an extraordinarily uncomfortable boat, far out on the water. And Martin said, Well, oh, Terry, this new quinine stuff may prove pretty good. We'll plug along on it for two or three years, and maybe we'll get something permanent. <laughs> Probably we'll fail. The curtain falls on the seventh in our series of dramatizations of outstanding works by modern British and American authors. Today, the NBC University Theater has brought you the Sinclair Lewis novel, Aerosmith, as adapted for radio by Agnes Eckhart. Our intermission commentator was the distinguished author, Mr. Granville Hicks. Van Heflin was starred in the role of Martin Aerosmith. Van Heflin is currently starred with Lana Turner, Gene Kelly, and June Allison in the Metro-Golden-Mayer Technicolor production, The Three Musketeers. Today's cast included Ted Von Eltz, Jerome Sheldon, Jan Arvin, Lois Corbett, Lynn Allen, Stephen Chase, Joe Forte, Sarah Jane Wells, John Daner, Clark Cuny, Edith Tackner. Next week at this time, the NBC University Theater turns to the work of a British author. The author, Somerset Maugham. The novel, Of Human Bondage. And the stars, Brian Ahern, internationally celebrated star of stage and screen, and Angela Lansbury, currently starred in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Technicolor production, The Three Musketeers. Productions of the NBC University Theater are currently being used in conjunction with college home study courses in Anglo-American fiction under NBC's National College by Radio plan. This plan permits NBC listeners to obtain college-supervised, organized education at home by means of radio listening and supplementary study. 
For full information about the authors and how to take advantage of this home study plan, which is currently being developed at the University of Louisville and elsewhere, send a penny postcard to College by Radio Courses, National Broadcasting Company, New York 20, New York. That's College by Radio Courses, National Broadcasting Company, New York 20, New York. Your director was Andrew C. Love. Original music for Aerosmith was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. This program came to you from Hollywood. Two and a half hours of great comedy is yours tonight. Just listen. Ozzie and Harriet, Jack Benny, Phil Harris and Alice Fay, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, and Fred Allen with his guest, Arthur Treacher. Five of radio's finest shows in rapid and very funny succession. Remember, for the best time of your life, the best time is tonight on most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Saturday Night Theatre, we present Sebastian Shaw in The Golden Arrow, Mary Webb's novel adapted for radio by Penelope Shaw and Norman Painting, with Marjorie Westbury, Jill Mears, and Anthony Pepe. Deborah, they're coming. I see him down with the back stone now. Eli's walking as determined, angry as ever. Making up sins for other folks to repent of till he can't see anything in the world. <laughs> you must put a bit of honey out for tea, Mother. John, you spendthrift. And not but a pound or two left for the last taking. After all, it's only Eli and Lelo. Well, Eli's got no honey in his heart, so he must have some in his belly, whether or no. <laughs> what do you say, Deborah? Well, I think Lily will like the honey anyways, Father. Good afternoon, Mr. Hunt-Batch. Well, Deborah. I see you go in the broad road, ribbons and fanglements sigh. The woman of Babylon decked herself for the young captains. I think she looks very nice, Father. Thank you, Lily. Get up! Mama, what that flagon will bring a good price come Christmas. Dinner clout, Amelie. But as soon they come round me, then find the pot of gold under the rainbow. They're my friends, as you know well. And they're not speechless from emptiness of heart. No sorrowful and loving they be. Mate, that's what they be. Isn't he an old oh, beast, no, Dad? No, I hate him more every day. When I wish I could get married, that I do. He's always growling and grudging and taking on religious all at once. I haven't so much as got a bit of ribbon nor nothing. Come here, Lil. Take this rose. It's nicer than ribbon. And Joe likes red. Where is Joe, anyway? Oh, he's A-making at the Shakeshaft's farm. But it's so near that he comes back to his tea now and again. Oh, can I go to your room, Deb, and do my hair? My curls do blow about so. I should think you're glad yours is straight and never blows out in curls. Aye. Do you like these sausage curls at the back? Aye. Well, you never look, Deborah Harden. I suppose you're jealous. I was looking at that shadow over there. It's like a finger pointing straight at you and me, Lil. A long finger as you kind of get away from. What is it token? Weddings. Maybe. Or maybe somewhat darker. Oh, don't be so creepy, Deb. Deb, go and bang the tray for Joe. There's a good girl. Here it is. All right, Mother. I'll go with her, Mrs. Arden. And don't take all day about it. We're going in now. Come and have your tea, you men. She was terror with a many civilian. The mother was the same. She was a good wife and mother, as we all well know. You've been spreading yourself a bit, missus, by the looks of your table. Have you, Have you come by your fortune this summer, John? No, just hard work, Eli. Sit you down now and help yourself to honey. There's enough acid in it to suit your taste. <laughs> now, uh, we eat. Thank you. 
Well, poor Thomas of Wood's End's gone at last, I'm told. Uh, you'll be making the oration at the funeral, I suppose, Eli? No, I've been good enough for him, seemingly. Some young chaps to do it as is new in these parts. Name of Stephen Southernwood. Uh-huh. The foreman of the Lost Willing Spa mine all talking of work. And women after him like sheep at a gap. I shanna go. I'm going. He was a good neighbor, was Thomas. Is this young Stephen Southernwood married or single, Eli? Why, I'm single, I'm told. Oh, oh. I'm back, Mother. Uh, uh, come and sit down by me, Deb, and have your tea. Where's Lily? Oh, she said for me to come on ahead. She's waiting for Joe. Mm, always hanging around the men, she be. Oh. Me. No danger. What are you gallivanting here for, Joe, when they're haymaking? Uh, my tea. Lel, will you come along and be to the fair on Lammas holiday? I'm afraid I cannot. Oh, Lel, I say five shilling on purpose. Well, if I come, uh, will you bring Deb too? Deb? Lord, I don't want Deb. Oh, it's not proper with us. Oh, all right then. And, Joe... As Deb would be dull when we went off together, and as she didn't like the chaps about here much, why not ask that new chap, that one that's come to work at the Lost Within Mines? He's a town chap and, and very smart, they say. He's going to speak at Thomas of Wood's End's funeral come Sunday. You could ask him then. If I do, will you come along to the chapel along of me and walk back arm in arm and promise to come to Lammas Fair? If the new chap will come too. All right. Oh, what little small arms you got, Lil. And shining white. I wish... What, Joe? Oh, never mind. Come Sunday night, when we're by the little wood, and it's all quiet. Maybe I'll stay. Now, now, Rover, lad. You cannot come along me today. Be you going to the funeral of this eat, Father? Ain't it blowing up for a tempest? Aye, poor Thomas cannot wait, whatever the weather. I'll fail him if I don't go. Well, isn't Mother going with you? No, she's had a call. Mrs. Cadwallader's does baby be on the way. Well, I'll come with you then. Wait for me. I can't let you go alone, Father. But, hey, Deb, how bright and spry you be today. <laughs> the young chaps will be all of a bother. Oh, it's only my <laughs> old gown, Father. Did it tease me? I'm not teasing, lass. You like chapel on Christmas night. Mm. Lit for marvels like your little lamp at home. How long have you been lighting it for me? Uh, ever since you fell down the stairs when you was a little un. You the best father in the world. Oh. <laughs> what a queer day it is. As if... As if summit was foreboded. Aye. There's a tempest brewing. It's too bright. It's all as bright a forest storm, isn't it? Aye. Deb, look there. The flock master goes westering. And the brown water and the blue wind above the cloud and the kestrels. And you and me, we all follow after him. Listen, Deb, what a noise of little leaves clapping in the copy. Tis him, the flock master, shakes the leaves and sends love like forked lightning. Him as the stars fall before like white wool at sheep shearing. There's a name beyond all names, and I'd ask you to keep it in mind in the dark days that'll come on you, Deb, for I see him coming like like hawks from the rocks. And though you'd be rent like struck pine, mind you of that name, and you shall be safe. Mind you of Cariad, for that's how they name him in the singing Welsh. Cariad, the flock master. Oh, Deb, I... I must bide a bit. I'm confused and all of a tremble. Sit down a while, Father, and rest. It's not far to the chapel and we've plenty of time. That was a right good oration, Mr. Southernwood, and spoken with real feeling. Oh, thank you, Mr. Arden. Speaking comes easily to me, you know. I'm glad you liked it. Ah, but would Thomas of Woods end have liked it? That's what I'd like to know. Well, I'm afraid it's too late to ask him now, Mr. Huntback. Be you presuming to speak disrespectful of the dead, young man? Oh, I know, Mr. Huntback. I was The just... angel of the Lord was smitey with a sword. Now, shadow. now, Eli, I'm sure Mr. Southernwood meant no disrespect to Thomas, nor to you neither. Eh? Indeed not, Mr. Huntback. Now, oh, Joe, go on, ask him. Uh, uh, Mr. Southernwood, uh, Lily wants to know it. Oh, Lil, what'd you pinch me for? That hurts. 
What Joe is trying to say, Mr. Southernwood, is uh, can you come along with us to Lammas Fair a fortnight on Tuesday? I'd like you to come along special. Oh, yeah, that's right. To keep our dev company. Joe! Oh, I never said. We thought as you might like to make a foursome with, with Joe and his sister Deborah and with me, of course. I should very much <laughs> like to, uh, if you'll introduce me to the lady. Oh, I, uh, Deborah, this gent's Mr. Southernwood. He's coming along of us to the Lammas Fair, so you needn't be lonesome. Deborah, what a lovely name. Perfect for you. I saw you in chapel, you know. Are you pleased to meet you, Mr. Southernwood? Most undecent the way he's looking at your Deb, John. Come on now, Lil. You know what you promised. Oh, you pinched me again. What have I said now? Ready for home, Deb? Hi, Father. Here you go, Father. Here we are, Mother. Come on in. I thought you got struck by lightning. And how was the funeral, John? We laid him to rest, just as he'd have wanted. How did your day go, Mother? They're both doing well. Only the poor child is a very spitting image of his father, more so pretty. Deb, they say saying down at sleep is a very igless coming Friday, and I thought to go picking tomorrow, if so be you'll come. We'd best be early if we want any. Hmm. All right, Mother. Gracious me, what ails our Deb? Not as I know of. Could be the heat, maybe. Aye. What was the new chap like? New chap? This Mr. Southernwood has made the oration. Oh. Uh, no great shakes. Oh, what's he like to look at, then? Long in the straw and a yellow head like a bit of good wheat. And he can talk, as Eli said. Mm -hmm. And where's our Joe? Bringing this girl along. Well, Lily's a tidy girl enough. I'm not again her, barring Eli. Where's my devoted daughter? Oh, talk of the devil. She's coming along, Eli. Oh, good hiding. That's what she wants, to take the old one out of her. But I'm too kind to her. Left the milk in the pail she did out in the sun. Never so much as put it in the dairy. Left it to Now, her. now, we're only young once, Eli. Oh, I learn her to be young. Trapes in along a young Joe and be dizing in herself like the whore of Babylon. My father, whatever be you doing here? I've come to fetch you home, girl. What about them six quarts of milk you left to sour? Now, Eli, don't let me scold a girl for a chap. It's not my chap. He's a great gobby. Oh, Lord, what have I done now? Gillian, what says the book of the tying of hair and the putting on of apparel? Joe? Would you like to come along a bit of the way home with me? No, I wouldn't. Not after what you just called me. You come along over with me now, girl, and see if you can set off the rights. Good night, then, Eli. Good night, Lily. And God be with you. And with this house. Leastways, this small cottage. Oh, my goodness. What's come over, everyone? A great gorby. That's what she called me. Mother, I'm just going to put the cattle in the shipping before the storm comes. Ah. And if I was you, Joe Ludd, I'd go a bit of a walk around to Eli's place tonight. I don't like his look. And Lily's a small thing, tongue or no tongue. Again, it's been home again. You can take them poppies in that good corn out of your hat. Oh, well, they was dead anyway. Stamp on them. Oh, sorry. Come here. Oh, come here. you were hurting you're as good enough for such as you without trimming. I marvel as Joe'd think on you. With straws and old dead flowers hanging round you and your hair all wispy. And a smudge on your nose. <laughs> and that darn decent bodice you know better than you should be showing yourself half naked. And now we're home. There's them six quarts of sour milk. Waste not one not. Before you go to bed tonight, you've to set it for milk cheese. There's no muslin to strain it with. There's muslin on your back. You'll rip your blouse and make the cheese in a mat. I won't, so there. You'll take it off now, do you hear? Oh, must I do it for you? Oh, stop it. Folks will see me. I'll be disgraced. You don't mind having only a bit of mud and I took you in disgrace. So you might as well be without. Now, say you repent. Go on, say you repent. Oh, I, I repent. Oh, that won't do. Kneel down, say a prayer. I cannot, I cannot. Kneel down, I said. I am sorry, Lord. I repent. I, I won't do it again. Forgive me, Lord. I... Now, now get up and sit on this chair. <laughs> now then, now then, take them pins out of your hair. No, no. Come on. Not the shears. Just don't come on. Why, I quiet, quiet, I say. These yellow tresses be the source of your wickedness, my girl. You'll be better off without them. I'll never forgive you. Never. Oh, my hair. Everyone says it's so pretty. There, that's 
That's a temptation gone. And now, sweep them tresses up and go and do the cheeses. I won't. I won't. I'll kill you first. Now you go near me. Uh. See? I've got your rope gun. So, you'd shoot your own father, would you, Lillian? Very well. To vanity, I'd murder. Go on. Shoot me. I will. <laughs> Mr. Hunt-Birch! No! Joe! Joe! You'll see your chemise. Get upstairs. He, he might have seen me like this. He, he might have seen me like this. Where's Lily? Titivated, most likely. Why oh, you want to see her? What for? Mr. Humpbatch, you're her dad, so I tried to be dutiful. But when I come to tell her something, I tells her. I don't mouth it to other folks first. Where's Lily? Tate in, most likely. Why oh, you want to see her? What for? Mr. Humpbatch, you're her dad, so I try to be dutiful. But when I come to tell her something, I tells her. I don't mouth it to other folks first. Uh, Lillian! Lil! Yes? Is that you, Joe? Why, Lil! What have they been doing to your... Mr. Humpbatch? Uh, they want to know back home if you can spare Lil to go burying tomorrow. I was to take her back tonight. If she'll come. Oh, you was, would you? Well, of course, if your mother wants well, to. Well, you come along with me. Well, I can't enjoy my hair. What do your folks say? There, there. Here, tie my kerchief round it. And Eli. Yes? There's a bit of plaster gone from the wall above your chair. I'd see to it if I was you. Mmm, you sharp eyed all of a sudden. Come on, Bill. Yes, sir. Come on, Bill. Fill a leg behind. And you too, Deb. Oh, it's too hot to pick berries. Ah, it's real picker's weather. And now we've got to start on the rest. Let's see if we can get two or three quarts before we have our dinner. Three quarts? Oh, we never will. Well, here are some good ones, oh, Mother. Oh, good girl. Well, Deb, I wonder when Mr. Wright's coming along for you. And I wonder what he'll be like. Light-haired for sure. Folks always like their opposites. Oh, I'll fight along of you and Father. I don't like the man. Well, I never. But Joe will not bide with us long, no danger. He'll be wanting them fowl's feathers I've saved. Plenty of them are are, too, enough to make a nice, fat, double feather bed. Perhaps he'll marry Lucy Throckton. She'd suit him right well, both being rather full in habit. Lily Hunt Batch, you've been keeping a very still tongue in your head about your doings last night. A very still tongue you be. And it looks queer for a girl to come riding along of our Joe in the black of night with a good home and a middling good father yonder. Well, Joe just said as you wanted me to come and help with the berries. That's why I come. It's no good mum chancing like that, Lily. You may as well out with it sooner or late. Oh, Lil, you'd better tell. Go on, take off your bonnet and show Mother your hair. All right, then. Bell! Oh! <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. However, you can't be shown like that, child. Oh. <laughs> there, there, no, it'll soon grow again. It won't grow for years and oh. years. I've got to choose between being married looking like a ninepin in a veil or waiting till I'm even older and deaf. Lil. You ungrateful child. Five and twenty is young enough for anybody. Woman's bones aren't set proper for that. It's mean little brats of children yours will be if you wed this side of twenty-five. But of course you can, because your hair won't be grown. Oh, mother, <laughs> poor Lil's very miserable. I think you might give her a bit of comfort. Well, I'm sorry if I was nasty, but to say such things to you and you, Joe's sister, and to be so high and mighty with Joe's good a lad as ever stepped. Now, if we am going to get those old berries, we'd best hurry for that fat Lucy thrust and get some more, because here she comes, like a sleepy bumblebee from Woods End Way. Hello, Lucy. Hello. Any good berries over there? Oh, uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Can you tell me the way to Lost Within? Oh, mercy, you start for me. <laughs> oh, uh, are you Emma's preached at the funeral yesterday? Oh, uh, that's right. This signpost doesn't say much. Oh, that. Nobody takes any notice of that. You can't go with signposts here. You must go the way they always let you. But they post do for the counting councils to be busy about. And the way to Lost Within? Well... What do you say to a cup of tea, it being so hot and all? Well, I'm sure I'm much obliged. Well, come and sit you down, then. I'll call the girls. Deb? Yes, Mother? Lily? Hello? Here's someone you both knows. We meet again, then, Miss Arden. 
Good afternoon, Miss Hunt-Batch. Why, Mr. Southernwood. Oh, fancy seeing you here. Lily be walking out with our Joe, Mr. Southernwood. Oh, why not? Do you like walking out, Miss Hunt-Batch? It depends who with. Deb, your safety pin's undone and your belt's crooked. And this is Lucy Thrupton, Mr. Southernwood. That does credit to her victuals, I can tell you. <laughs> so I see. Mr. Southernwood, would you like one of my berries? I'll pick you out a real good one, shall I? You come with me, Lily. You can gather some sticks to kindle a fire for tea. Why can't Deb go? I was just going to give Mr. Southernwood one of my berries. You heard what I said, Lily on Batch. Come along. And, Lucy, you can fill the kettle at the stream. Oh, I will that. I'm ready for bucketfuls of tea. The sweat's pouring off me till I feel right thin. Oh, you don't look it. <laughs> Come along, Lily. I don't see why I should have to get the nasty old sticks while Deb stays behind. So I've got my second chance. My name's Stephen, and yours is Deborah, isn't it? You know, I never saw a soul in chapel yesterday except you, Deborah, and I haven't stopped thinking about you since I met you. Why, why do you look away all the time? You're not afraid of me, are you? That's better. Now, where do you live? Upper Liso's. Can I come to Upper Liso's? I? Uh, I mean, no. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll come whether you say I can or not, just to see you. Let's go for a stroll, and if they call us, we'll pretend not to hear. Mother will just holler until we are. Come on up, Lil. Well, did you like it? Like what? Well, that cottage, of course. Oh, it's real nice, Joe. Lil, what will your name be this time tomorrow? Lily Arden. Aye. What else? Mrs. Oh, Joe, I can. I don't. Oh, what's come over you, Lil? What are you afraid of? I can't tell you, Joe. I, I can't. And, oh, what a dear little bedroom and all. And, Roses on the jug. I kind of go through with it, Joe. It, it, it's what your mother said about this time next year. There, there, don't you fret. Things just comes, you know. We just got to keep loving and read the book a bit, and it's all easy. Not for me. Oh, no, I know, and I mean sorry, and I'll do all I can to be a good chap, Lil. I'll cook for you and wash for you. I wish I could do all for you, but I can huh? Joe, couldn't we be just... Brother and sister? No. It's all or nothing, Lil. Oh, dear. I don't want to be married and have children. And I don't want to give up this dear little cottage and the veil and all. You must say, Lil, all or not. Well, it cannot be not, Joe. All, then? I suppose so. For certain sure? Yes. Then I'll do my best to suit you. And I promise you shall set the pace. Oh, dear, I, I do love a wedding. <laughs> Let me your kerchief, John. Yeah. Ah, Joe, look grand. Such a man and all, the very model of his father. Is the making of a better man than me and him, Mother? <laughs> oh, now, that's not true, is it, Dad? Of course not. There's no one better than you, Father. Oh, Deborah, oh, may I walk back with you? Oh, why, yes, Stephen, if you've a mind to. We'll, we'll uh, see you back at home, then, Mother. Well, you are, then. What do you think, young Stephen, John? Well, he's got a goodish way to go, and it's a dark road to the heart of God when you grope by other men's lights. But at long last, he'll be a fine chap if he comes through. A fine chap. I've taken a dislike to the marriage service, Deborah. I can't stand being tied to anything, can you? Well, so long as you're tied where you want to be, I don't see as it matters. I mean, you'd stay there anyway. But who knows where he wants to be? I'll tell you where I want to be now, though. Just where I am. Alone with you. And I'd rather be here with you, Stephen, than on that mountain over there. Do you see it? It's called the Devil's Chair. And some say the ghosts go wandering there to seek a king. But they kind of see the one they chose for the mist. And the tale goes that when the ghosts can see the one they've chosen for king... It'll be the end of the world. <laughs> what a tale. <laughs> I'll go to the old devil's chair and look for him, if you'll come with me. Oh, Deborah, do you know you're most awfully pretty? No, oh, I'm not. You've only got straight hair, not wavy like Lily's. Oh, it's beautiful. 
It's very long. Oh, pretty fair. Uh, what are you doing? Only feeling it. Oh, you mustn't. I've never done such a thing as let my hair down before. You didn't let it down. I did. And you're the prettiest girl in the world. <laughs> May I kiss you, Deborah? Oh, you mustn't. It's not right. Oh, everything's right if we love each other. And you do love me, don't you, Deborah? Say so you do. I love you so much. I don't know. Well, think. Quick, I must know. I've never seen anyone a bit like you, and I want you, Deb. I shan't give you these hairpins back till you say, one, if you'll come to Lammas Fair with me, two, if you'll come to what do you call him's chair, and three, if you'll sit on my knee now. Oh, no, Stephen. Are you going to promise, or shall I chuck these pins in the street? Oh, don't. Oh, father and mother will think I'm flighty if I go back with my hair down, and I'll never hear the last of it from me, like. Then promise. There's one. Oh. There goes another. Oh, look, I've come to Lama's Fair. Go on. Oh, not the rest. Well, there go two more, oh. then. Only five left. But it won't stay up with less. It's too heavy. Well, then. Well, all right, I've come to the devil's chair. And I'll save you the trouble of the rest. There. Oh, Deb, darling. Will you come and live with me right away? So that I can always pull your hair down and kiss you. Stephen, you must let me think. And I can know when I'm with you. But now we must get back to the wedding party or they'll miss us. Now, please, Stephen, because Father trusts me and I, I can't let you. It's a lovely party, Joe. Here are Deb and Stephen at last. Oh, I think she's carrying on awful. Look at her hair. Anyone can see as he undid it. <laughs> or he'll undo yours tonight. Gosh, Joe, whatever will people think? Well, let's have a song now. What do you say, Deb? <laughs> yes, let's. What shall we sing, Father? Well, shall we have the golden arrow? Oh, yes. Oh. The golden arrow? What's that? I don't expect you know it, Stephen. It's an old song about an old ancient custom. In time gone by, the lads and lasses in these parts was used to go at Easter time and look for the golden arrow. And it was said as, as if two that were walking now found it, they'd cling to it fast, though it might wound them sore. There'd be a charm on them, and sorrow, and a great joy. And naught could part them, neither in the flower of life, nor in death. And the tale goes that once, long ago, two found it in the thickets down yonder. Aye, and they come through sleep singing, and with such a scent of apple blossom about them as never was, though apple blossom time was a full month off. And such a power of honeybees about them as you only see in summertime. And it went like folks as want naught of any man, walking fast and looking far. I never a soul saw them after. Ah, uh, good riddance to bad rubbish. Hold oh, your noisy life. But every year, when the ghosts go a wandering round the devil's chair, them as found the arrow come two by two. There's good few old women as comes first in the tale, like old ancient brown trees, roping and muttering. Then they all set up a cry like a yew tree on a windy night. Out of mind. Out of mind. And then the ghosts stir like poplars, all oh, grey and misty like, in a ring round the devil's chair. And there's no sound but sobbing. Oh, an old you with a hiccup for lights. Oh, and in a bit, there's a noise of singing. And in come the lovers, very gladsome, standing among the grahams with a rosy light on them. And they one and all speak for the flock master to be king, him as lights shepherds home and carries the dropped foals. What a strange story. Strange. What I allus say and allus will is that them grey ghosts has died respected them more to my liking than a gang of unruly folk with apple blossoms <laughs> shedding petals all over the place for the Lord knows who to clean up. <laughs> oh, apple blossom has might have set into good cookers at seven shilling the pot. Oh, Come along then, everyone. Take parts and tune up. All right, well, I'll begin it then. We, we have, have sought it, we have sought the golden arrow Right the sandy willow sway Two by two by five ways narrow A 
Are you ill? I've never seen you look so pretty. Shall we slip away to our cottage? It's getting late. If you like, Joe. Ah, well, come on. They ain't so busy singing. They won't notice us go. Taking the bitter along of the sweet. It's folks as want all ale and no workers do wrong. Oh, Joe, what do you want to damp it all for? Oh, now don't take on, Lil. Oh, Lord, that old fire's out. I'll start it up quick and make your cup of tea. You go on up to bed. I'll bring it up to you. Oh, it's nice down here, Joe. Uh, can I, I stay here? No, Lil. Let's get these fanglements off you. You can have a good long sleep in this chair. You'll be as right as a trivet in the morning. We'll have a rare day at the fair tomorrow. You'll... Stay by me, Joe. Uh, and then I'll let the bit bats come flying. Lil, wake up. It's gone seven. We'll be late for the fair. Lil. Do you feel bad, Lil? Spending all night in that old chair? No, Joe. Sleepy, then? No, Joe. Are you wishing you was back along of old Eli? No. Well, what then, Lil? I wish we needn't go, Joe. Not go? Why ever not? Oh, Joe. Can you see? You, you mean? Yes, Joe. Oh. We'll wait a while, then. Shall we, Lil? Yes, Joe. Dad and Stephen don't mind if we're... Mm -hmm. Oh, no, Stephen, please. Mama. Well, if you won't, you won't. But why you consider it wrong for me to kiss your arm when I've kissed your mouth? Lord, only knows. Oh, don't I hurt that caterpillar, Stephen? I'll stamp on it if you don't let me kiss your arm. Oh, all right, then. Hello. Oh, stop. Ben, Joe and Lil's coming. Oh, uh, hello, Joe. We thought you were never coming. Well, we were getting the late side, I'm afraid. Ah, but what's it matter? What indeed? You, you two old married folk go on in front, Joe. Deb and I will follow at our leisure. I bet you will. Come on, then, Lil. We'll see you both at the fair. Don't be long, will you? We won't. Let's sit down, Deb. I, I want to talk to you. <clears throat> I, I want to ask you a very big thing. I I want to ask you if you'd live with me without marriage. Stephen. You see, it's become such a mockery to me, all that. I, I don't believe in it, and I always did hate fuss and promises and to be tied down. I'd shoot myself first. But if you'll take me, Devin, I swear to you here and now that you'll never repent it. I'll love you far more than wives are loved and be faithful to you forever. What the hell's that noise? It's only the grouse. Oh, what a din. It startled me. Deb, what do you say? What well, I've done it all. Set a lot of store by marriage about here, you see. Wed and grey's white. Done a wed and white's black. Well, if you think more of Joe than me. You know I don't, Stephen. Well, then. And... There's me, Stephen. You? I, me. Well, I'm like other women, and I want what they want. A ring and to be missus. Oh, well, if I'm not good enough to make up for that, I'm sorry. You don't want me, that's obvious. I'll go. Oh, no, Stephen, don't leave me, please. Just let me think a bit. I don't like half-hearted givers. I'm not half-hearted. I'm not. 
If I give, I give without stinting of the best I've got. But the heartbreak and the sorrow which you're bringing on them I love is almost more than I can bear. Do you love me true, Stephen Southernwood? Yes, Deborah. Will you love me unto the last turning and to the end of the road? Yes. Do you want me so bad that you're lost without me? Of course. Oh, Deb, say yes. Stephen, are you certain sure? Are you? Before God, I am. All right, then. You can ask me. Deborah Arden, will you be my sweetheart and my mate? And the love of my life. Oh, Stephen. Answer me, Deb. I. I'll be your sweetheart. And your mate till I lie in the daisies. And the love of your life while life lasts. Deb, I love you so much. You'll never regret it. I swear. Well, let's go on to the others now, Stephen. For I've no more to give. And no more to say for a while. But I I was just going to kiss you. Not now. Not after that. I'd as leave kiss in church. It's a new road we've started on, Stephen. And a winding one. Never let go my hand. I never will, then. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, isn't this fun, Deb? It's ages since I've been on a merry-go-round. Don't hold me so tight, Stephen. You're hurting me. Please let me go. Oh, no fear. I want to hold you forever. Oh, Deb, when will you come and live with me? Oh, please, Stephen, let go. You're hurting me. I'll let go when you answer me. You said you was fond of me, Stephen. I tell you, it's because I'm fond of you. And if you were as fond of me, you'd give me my answer. Not now. Please. Later, when we're alone. Now, if you won't say no, I'll get off and leave you. Perhaps Joe and Lily will be glad of my company. It's obvious you're not. Oh, no, come back. Stephen! Stephen! Hello, Deb. Wherever Mr. Sutton was going in such a hurry. He looked awful cool. Which way did he go, Lucy? In the back way, I think. Now, where are you off to, for goodness sake? Stephen! Stephen! Deb! Oh, thank God I found you. Oh, Deb, I'm a beast to go off like that. I'll never leave you again, I swear it. Look, I'll kneel down and promise. It's all right, Stephen. Only do get up. Folks are staring. Oh, let's get away from here. I hate all these people. I want to be alone with you. And I want that kiss, Deb, to show you've forgiven me. Oh, Stephen, you know I'd forgive you anything. Uh, But I'd sooner not kiss you just now. Look here, Deb, do you love me? I, Stephen, I love you true. Well, then, I kissed you in the little wood that first time. Didn't you like it? Not all that. It made me feel queer-like. We'd better have this out here and now. Do you know what marriage means? I'd sooner not talk of such things yet. Well, I choose to, so I shall. Do you know what it means? I. Well, living with me will be the same. So if you can't even do with kissing... How did you feel when I kissed you? Well, faint-like, and and as if I was no better than I should be. You... you didn't like it? No. Well, it's time you learned to, so I'll take whatever right to. <laughs> when can I come and fetch you, Deb? Oh, Steve, I didn't ask me yet. I must get them used to it at home and, and get used to it myself. Well, if you won't do as I ask you, you don't love me. And if you don't love me beyond kissing and that, there's no right road but the parted road. Oh, there's only one kind of true love, Stephen, the kind that gives and asks naught. But I can't go against nature. I know you can. And I'm not the woman to wed a man that could. All right. I'll be good. Oh, but when can I come and fetch you? Will you come to the devil's chair with me on Sunday and tell me that? Oh, no, not there, Stephen, I dare. Oh, nonsense. You'll be safe with me. Sunday, then. All right, if I'm with you. But come Sunday at the devil's chair. Those damn birds again. What a row. Here we are, then. 
God, it's bleak up here. I'm going to stand on the silly old chair. Oh, no! No, Stephen, don't. It'll be black harm for both of us. Oh, what harm can come to us when we love each other, Dad? Just hold on to me and oh. you'll be all right. I can always hold on to you, Stephen. Oh, what a superstitious lot you all are around here. The devil's chair, indeed. It's just an old rock and I, I can't see any ghosts around either. Ah, here we are, Dad, at last. I feel like the king of the castle. Please, Stephen, let's go down. Now we might be struck down. Can I kiss you? Mm. Oh, Deb. I, I can't wait forever. When will you come? I must tell father and mother. I don't know how to. Since you must, it may as well be soon. I'll tell you what, I'll come tomorrow and help you tell me. And Deb... I've got something for you. Look. Oh, Stephen! Oh, did you get that specially for me? Well, I didn't see why you shouldn't have your ring. I shall make you a vow when I put it on. Uh, hold out your hand. Deborah Arden. With this ring, I plight thee my troth forever. I worship you, body and soul. Amen. Deb, love me forever. Stay by me. I will that, Stephen. Oh, but father and mother... I'll come tomorrow evening and help you tell me. Deb, I'm back. Where are you? Here, mother. Tea's ready. Good girl. Well, mother and child both doing well and all over nicely before the doctor came. Bless me, no more notice took than if I said it's raining. Deborah Arden, it's time you gave over thinking there's naught in the world but flowers and birds and such. It's time you were serious and saw there's only three things as matters to a good woman. The bride bed, the child bed, and the death bed. Hey, ready, Deb. I can do with it. I'm that hungry. It's all ready, Father. Will you open the door, John? Yes, Mother. Oh, it's you, Stephen. Come in, lad. Would you, would you like a cup of tea? Uh, no, thanks. Is there anything you want, lad? Uh, yes, sir. I... Well, what is it? M Mr. and Mrs. Arden, I've... I've come to ask for Deborah. Oh! Only we don't want to be married. You don't want to. Because I, I don't approve of it. You bad, wicked, ne'er-do-well of a fellow to try and take my good girl's Mother, name, be mother. silent! Leave the lad to say, say. Now, Stephen. Mr. Arden... Though we shan't be married, I swear to you that it'll be just the same. I love her with my whole soul and body, and I'll love her till death. I love her better than myself. Deborah, what do you say? I say as I love him, and I'll follow him through the world. Not without the ring and the bell and the register, Deborah. Not while I live. Be quiet, Mother. Well, dear. I'll do whatever Stephen says. And you'll give all for naught. He's chosen me out of the whole world. What else matters? So long as we're all in all to each other, it's just the same as marriage. Aye, so long as... Marriage makes things no better if you're sick of each other. Never a bit, but are you sure you're man enough to keep a woman safe, Stephen? It's a long, winding road, and she'll be footsore time and again. Think, lad. I am. I love her so much. And would you give up your principles for her sake, Stephen? Your principles about not marrying me. No. Yes, I... I would if she asked it. She knows I would. She never will. Well, may God be with you and light your candle, Deborah, my child. And I shall keep your lamp alight for you here if you should ever want to come home again. Ah, you and your lamp. And when did you think of going? I've got a cottage by the devil's chair. There's no other that's empty. The landlord's begun the repairs today. He seemed pleased and surprised to let it. It'll be ready next week. When will you come, Deborah? Deborah, when you come for me, Stephen. Oh. Here we are, Deb. In you go. Now, this is the kitchen, and uh, this is the parlor. Oh, Stephen, it's all so pretty. 
Gee, and you've done it all in these few days. I cannot think how. No sleep. Oh, you must sleep well tonight. We, oui, Deb. We. Oui. Oh, Stephen, did I pull my hair down? I did it so carefully, so unsure to come. Never a soul, Deb. Never a soul. <laughs> Kiss me. Don't hold me so tight. Please. I, I kind of get my breath. Stephen, you're hurting me. Steve? Deborah? Deborah, you all right? Oh, my God. Deborah! Hi? God, I'm a brute. Your father was quite right. I'm not the oh, Stephen, I love you. I wouldn't have you different. Oh, don't I? I shall be the same again, I know. Oh. Listen. What's that noise? Oh, it's, uh, it's a lot of sheep coming from the devil's chair. They're running away from something. Oh, they've gone down the hill now, into the mist. They're running from the devil's chair. Folks say it's the robin like that. I'll go. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. See, lie, Stephen. Walk in, old party. Thou art the man. The woman tempted thee. Flee from this place. Oh, not likely. Would you like some wedding cake? I will neither eat bread nor drink wine until I have turned the hearts of the people. Oh, your loss. When them their bones of yours be laid in the sodden wet ground and them two eyes with pennies on them. Oh, dry and not up. But a poor white skeleton left. Drop it, I said. How is the faithful city become a harlot? Oh. Deborah Arden, I proclaim you before this man, and I will proclaim you in the parishes of Lost Willing, Sleep and Finnery, unless you get in my trap and come home with me. Weeping and gnashing your teeth. <laughs> I will proclaim you with your brazen ways and your body as is given to lust. I will proclaim you a whore. Why, you... Oh, no, Stephen, don't hurt him. He's an old man. Thank you, Homer. You know his justice and no mercy. I curse you all fruit and grass. And you're lying down and you're rising up and may you burn everlastingly. <laughs> Who's no sinners against the Lord? Oh, don't laugh at him, Stephen. He's only making it worse. Get out, you thousand fool. He's thrown his Bible at you, Stephen. Oh, he's a curse. A curse. Dead, darling. Don't be frightened. <laughs> That old fool can't possibly harm us. Oh. Hush now. Don't cry. Wake up. It's going to be a glorious day. The first since we came here. Oh, oh it's awful early. <laughs> you are lazy. If I were a plowman like Joe, you'd have to get up at this time every day. Oh, couldn't I have just one more nap and you go on without me? No, nope, it's getting light and we shall miss the best of it if we're not quick. Mm. In fact, we're too late now. I'm beginning to think I'd rather stay here too. Kiss me, dear. Well, I'll dress quick, Stephen. Oh, so you're ready to get up to avoid me, is that it? Oh, how can you say such things? You love a woman like a lad loves Kate till they're in a knot left. And you think of Stephen Southernwood a deal more than it's good for you. Well, you don't care about me a bit. You don't know what love is. Stephen, there's a lamp hangs outside my bedroom door at home that's lit for me nights by father. Never a one missed for three and twenty years. And you say I don't know what love is. Can you say you've done as much for me? I will do. And more. Only it's time you learned that you're my woman and not my great-grandmother. You're mine, do you hear? No more yours than your mine. Not if we're lovers as well as man and woman. Oh, can you be like it says in that nice hymn? Lover of my soul. Well, just this morning, you've been the other kind of lover all the while. Would you like it if I wasn't? You know I love only you in the world. Well, if you love me, you must want what I choose, when I choose. Oh, you're so eager, you cannot stop to think of me no more than the rock on the mountain. It's not your fault if you're made that way, I know. So long as you're for me and I'm for you, naught else matters, only... Only never leave me, Stephen, never leave me. Oh, Deb, darling, I, I'm a beast to make you cry. I, I'll, I'll do your dress up for you to show you I'm sorry. Oh, Stephen, I wish I didn't make you angry. Oh, Deb, darling, it's me that's at fault, not you. Look, look, I'll, I'll put a pillow and blanket on the floor and sleep there for a week as a punishment. Oh, 
Miss Stephen, you mustn't. No, don't stop me. I've made up my mind. And I deserve it. Oh, oh, that'll be Father. He said he'd come today. Oh, quick, Stephen, hey, let's go down and let Stephen! him in. Stephen! Be you up? Yes, Father, we're coming. Just a moment. Father, I'm so pleased to see you. Oh, Deb, my dear, how are you? Hungry. <laughs> you too, I expect. I'll go and start the breakfast. Well, now, Stephen, that's all coming on nicely outside. You've done wonders. And Deb's looking fine, lad. I'm doing my best, Father. No, I... I didn't at first, I'm afraid. I know, lad. How did you know? The lump's not been a light in your face all that long. You're a bit of a self-chastiser, aren't you, lad? And I don't think the worse of you for it. I was um, wondering, lad, if you could come along some evening and then join me a hand with Eli's sheep. You can ride, I dare say. A bit, yes. I was thinking it was in your line how you ever come to be doing the preaching in black coat and waistcoat beats me. Oh, I've had enough of that. You can't stick at one thing forever. Come on, you two men. I make some tea. Breakfast won't be long. What were you saying about Eli's sheep, Father? Well, since his old mare died, he's good for naught, poor chap. You've not heard then. No, tell us. It was the night you come here it happened. It seems he was seen driving like a fiend from these parts, up hill and down the hill, shouting text and cussing and flogging poor old Speedwell till she had no more breath in her. Joe and Lily saw him pass through sleep and they thought he must have gone crazed. I can imagine it. The woman who cooks for Eli says that when they come tearing into the yard, the poor old mare just shuddered and fell down in the shafts and there was naught Eli could do to coax her up again. Eli wept over that old mare. He was as near loving her as he could get to loving anyone. Love? He doesn't know the meaning of the word. He knew he'd killed her all right. And he cried out, leave me and my sin to the hand of the Lord and let him deal with me as he thinks fit. And, of course, the animals and that must be seen after. So I thought if Joe would borrow a horse and you'd ride white for Stephen, we'd soon round up the sheep for him. Ah, he's a stupid old fool, but all right. Which day? Tomorrow. Right. You and Lily must come along, Deb, and Mother will bring tea, and we'll have a bit of a run, Billy. Uh, Deb, I fixed you up a washing line between these two dead trees. Why, the sooner they came down, Stephen. They give me the creeps. They look like bleached bones thrown down from the devil's chair. There's some say as in heat like this, the chair shakes and a tongue of flame leaps from it like a torch. Oh, that's just superstition, Deb. But if you don't like the trees, I'll have them down in a week or two. They'll make good fuel. Now, now come on, I'll help you hang the clothes up. Have you enjoyed your washing day? Aye, <laughs> the first since we were... I was going to say since we were wed. Oh, Stephen, couldn't you bring yourself to it? What? Wedding me. Who's been talking to you, Deb? Lily. Damn, Lily. But everyone's the same. No one's been to see us. And a good thing, too. But Mother's the same, and, and Joe. Joe, what on earth does he matter? Stephen, would you dislike it all that much? Yes, I would. Besides, I hate to give in. They think it was their doing. But it won't be. It'll be me. Stephen, I put that old blanket and pillow back on the bed this morning. The week's up. Oh, Deb. I love you so much. I don't deserve anyone like you. Do you really want us to be married, Deb? Why, Stephen, I do, but only if you want it too. Then... Will you marry me, Deborah Arden? Are you certain sure, Stephen? I was never more sure of anything in my life. Then I, Stephen, I will. I... You too. But what are you doing away from work, Stephen? Getting married. Married? Yes, Mother, we wanted you and Father to be the first to know. Well, dear sakes, <laughs> but I'm glad. Not what you ought to have done it to bright pitigo, Stephen. Oh, it's nothing to do with me. Deborah wanted it. Quite right, too. And I'm glad you've done it in such good time. Oh, Mother. Good time for what, Mrs. Arden? Never you mind, lad. But you can call me Mother now, Stephen, if you've a mind, seeing as you've done as you should. John! John! Oh, well, it was the man. He's never about when he's wanted. John! What's all the noise about? John! 
Now, didn't I tell you when you made such a bobs of dying about these two that it'd be all right in the end? Well, it'd be. They're ah. better for worst, as nice as nice, and they're man and wife and none to put asunder. Well, I didn't think it was me that made the fuss, oh. Mother. But I'm pleased that you're pleased, and I wish you both all good. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Here's a letter for you, Mrs. Oh, they're from Eli. Me. And you needn't think it's a merry-making nor a tea oh, as you I invite you to. What is it, then? It's me. The miserable sinner as you see afore you. But not such a sinner as some I could name. I see you, Stephen Southernwood. Where's my Bible? Maybe you'd like to know, as Deborah and Stephen are married right and proper. Ah, so the words of the wise, as to say me, have shown them the error of their ways. Nothing of the sort, you old jack-in-the-box. Well, you might as well come along to chapel on Irish Thanksgiving at three sharp and get saved, Southernwood. I be going to preach, very special. That's what it says in the letter. Preach? Good Lord. What about? Never you mind. You just come. You and the woman God's given you. Well, I'm sure we don't want to listen to your driveling all night, you old fool. Oh, let's go home, Deb. Goodbye, Father. And Mother, we just wanted to tell you our news on our way home from church. And good news it is, my dear. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mother. Good night, sinner. And if you're going through sleep, you can take this here invitation to Joe and that daughter of mine. It'll save me. And get some of the lust to youth that he used. All right. We meant to call on Joe and Lil anyway. That's right. We want him to know what we're happening now, too. I shall keep it. I told a man if I'd pay two shillings a week. Oh, he says to go straight back, Lily. No. It's a lovely lock. It's a dirt sheet. Who's going to put some of your nasty black hair you on it? You send it back, do you hear? Lock it. <laughs> on 16 shilling a week. Can we come in, Joe? Aye, come in, both of you. And being as how you've come, you might take a small parcel for me to the post. Lily, bring me that locket. Yes, Joe. Joe, we thought we'd come and tell you, as we're married. Oh, 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 you don't say. Stephen, I think the better of you. Marriage is a grand thing. <laughs> is it, Joe? We've brought you both a letter from Lily's father. Oh? Well... He is a funny old bird. Listen. Eli Huntbatch has pleasure in announcing as he intends to speak at three prompt Sunday on sin. His own especial. The Lord wishes you to attend. The old fool's mad. What was you reading, Joe? Oh, a letter from your father. Hey, Deb and Stephen have come to see us they're married. Oh, I'm sure glad to hear it, Deb. There couldn't be any blessing without the holy estate, could there? Joe, the sweat's made streaks down your black face. If you don't wash for your wife, you might for company. <laughs> right you are. Don't right, you come with me, Stephen. i got a pig I'd like you to see. Yes, I heard you've got one. Oh, do you like my new lace collar, Dad? Oh, it's lovely, Lil. But I'd sell that the locket if I was you. Oh, you was listening then? I couldn't help hearing. Well, I want the locket. I'm fond of it. But you're fonder of Joe, aren't you? Oh, Joe. Shh, listen. I thought if you'd care for a bit of a loan, Joe, and surprise you. No, no, thank you kindly, Steve. She must learn to make do on what I get. If she can now, well, what about when the little ones come? Oh, good Lord, man, you're not thinking of kids already, have you? Of course. I calculated it all up before I asked, Lil. Calculated what? Wages and insurance and how many kids I thought to have. And what's the reckoning? Six. It's a good middling number. Six? How many do you want yourself, Stephen? Oh, Lord, none. None? What do you want six for, for goodness sake? I have to do my duty. Your duty? Too. King and country. And what about Lily? Lily must do hers. You are lucky, Deb. Stephen's worth a hundred of Joe. Fancy him wanting to give me the locket. He must think I'd look nice in it, mustn't he? <laughs> Hope Joe will let him. Oh, Joe's so busy doing his duties. No king has never so much as saw his face that he's got no time to think of me. Uh, now we must be off, Joe. It's getting late and Deb doesn't like walking near the devil's chair in the dark. Deb, it's time to go. You ready? Coming, Stephen. Damned out. I hate it. Oh, it's saying what ails you. Autumn's a beastly season. Well, spring will come again before we know it. Well, not for nearly half a year. We might be dead before that. Stephen! Well, we might. Don't let's take that path by the devil's chair tonight, Deb. It gives me the creeps. It looks evil up there in the moonlight. Well, we'll take the lower path then. Stephen... What did you and Joe talk about in the garden this evening? His beastly old pig. Oh, what a fib, Stephen. I heard you. Did you? 
And did Lily hear old Joe's program? Aye. What a lark. Well, not for Lily. And it wasn't only Joe that said things, Stephen. I heard what you said, too, about not wanting any little ones. Oh, that, well, I had to say something. He was so solemn. Did you say it just to aggravate Joe, then? Oh, partly. Oh, but I don't want to talk to you about it. I want to get home. Well, who else should you talk of your children to but the woman as will bear them? Who else should you tell your wishes to and your sorrows and, and the way you mislike the wind nights? And I know you do, along of you covering your ears. Oh, damn. Oh, come on, let's hurry home. It gives me the creeps out here. God, please. And the Lord drove me to it. Now, listen what I tell you. I be a great sinner. Cursed are they that smile, for they shall weep. And all they that rejoice shall be utterly cast down. <coughs> when the silver cord is loosed and the golden bowl is broken, there shall be a weeping and a wailing. And so is your sermon and your God. There is no devil, no God, no immortality, no anything. And I'm not staying here to listen to your rubbish any longer. And Judas went out into the night. <laughs> Only it ain't. We've not had our tea yet. Leave me and my sin to the hand of the Lord. And let him deal with me as he thinks best. Stephen! Whatever, Lord. What is I it? Aren't you well? Well, tell me. Nothing, old. Only a bit of a headache. You'll come back to the tea, won't you? A cup of tea will make you feel better. I can't. That old devil in there. Oh, Eli's done his prating now, and if he starts on it you again, I'll give him a piece of my mind. Oh, please come, Stephen. Unless you'd rather go home. No, I'll come. I'm sorry, Deb. I'm glad to be home again, Stephen. And I'm that tired. I'm not surprised after walking all that way. This is the most godforsaken spot I've ever known. Ooh. I wish we lived in Lost Within, where there are lights and people and a bit of life. I'll make up the fire to make the place more cheerful. Where in hell we went to that awful affair for, I don't know. That's better. It's burning up nicely. Let's sit down and have something hot to drink. Oh, can't we go to bed, Stephen? I'm that tired. Well, you can if you like. I shan't. I'd rather sit here. You're not angered with me, are you, Stephen? Angered? Of course not. Well, then I'll stay along of you. Draw up to the fire and I'll get you a cup of tea. <laughs> Things seem so much better when I'm alone with you, Deb. You make everything seem different. <laughs> Way together. And that cures all. Nought can part us. Not even dying. Oh, don't. Well, I touch wood, then. That's a sure charm. I didn't mean that. Oh, I wish we could be together more. Instead of you down at the mine and me up here. When you leave me mornings, I stop living till you're back. And I kind of stop thinking of all things that might come to you down there. Well, that's morbid. No, it's love of you. Oh, Stephen, it frightens me when I think as you're more to me than Father and God put together. And when you're away out of my sight and hearing, I feel frostbitten. There's always the fear that summit might happen to you and me not there. If the rock crusher... Oh, Stephen, if ever he'd caught you, how could I get caught too? Deb, you don't mean... I mean I'd take the one thing left as I wanted. What? To be as you was. And then if we was to wake again, we'd wake together. And if not, what did it matter? I wish you didn't feel like that. So do I. When a man or woman feels like that, they're not to be cured. Not this side of silence. A soon cure folk of breathing. We're well, together now, warm and cozy, so naught matters. Stephen, I, um, I, I thought to go and see Nancy Cora next Saturday. What on earth for? Oh, I, uh, I just told Lily, yes, I told her. Now we can unbolt the door. That'll be five shillings each. Counting the stuff you can take home. Uh, it's as plain as sin as you're both in the family way. But if you're sensible and take that stuff, 
You'll not be so wizen faced when you come next week. Johnny, you take it. They'll leave it here. You're a softy, Deb Rodden. You'll be worse and worse and for your better, and you wish you'd taken old Nancy's advice. Now, Lily's a sensible girl, aren't you, dearie? And it's five shillings just the same, with or without the stuff. Well, I don't want the stuff, Nancy Curry. You can keep it. And here's your old five shillings. You only told me what I wanted to hear. Come on, Lil, let's get out of here quick. <laughs> Same kind of gladsome day for both of us, then, Lil. Gladsome? Miserable, I calls it. Walk a bit of the way home with me, will you? Oh, I want to get back, or Stephen will be waiting. You're soft about that chap. Can a man be left a minute to get his own tea? Stephen's not a man. He's mine. Are you back, Lil? Why, Lil? Oh. What's up? You're like a duck in thunder. I'm all right, Joe. Come here. I want to whisper you something. Hmm? <laughs> well, I could have told you that. That's not what the husbands say in books. Unless you care, you selfish beast. Oh, I Lil. can't go through and never Lil. want to thank no, you. No, Lil, nothing. that's not fair. You know I'd go through it for you if I could. There's naught I wouldn't go through for you. Prove it, then. All right. I will. What are you doing with that poker, Joe? Making it red hot. But why? Uh, you'll see. Now, I'll prove it. Oh, no, not your hand, Joe. Joe! Keep away. I said I'd prove it, and that's what I'm doing. Oh. Damnation. Oh, Joe! I couldn't hold it there no longer. My word, you've proved it all right, Joe. Well, look at your hand. Where's the oil? It's, it's in the cupboard. I'll get it. Here it is. Oh, no, Joe, that's mine. Ooh, what an awful smell of scorch me. Dear sakes, Joe, what's gone on your hand? Here, give me that bottle I put the oil on. Phew, this ain't oil. I know what this is. Oh, the oil's upstairs. I'll fetch it. Joe, I've come down that hill as I never did afore. I must have a word with you before I go back. And as for that bottle, fling it on the rubbish heap quick. But it seems queer to break one of Lily's bottles without her leave. When you've heard what I've come to tell you, you won't think so. Now, go on, lad. All right, if you say so. Here's the oil, Mr. Darden. Oh, thank you, Lil. Well, my dear, I hear there's some grand news for me. And I bought you some of the lock. It's early days yet, but time soon passes. There. One of Joe's old baby gowns. Now, you put it away safe. Thank you, Mrs. Darden. My hand ain't half sore. Come here, then, lad, and I'll bind it up for you. Oh, my. What a nasty place. You are a great baby burning yourself. Uh, yeah. That's better. Now, little, take the oil upstairs and put it away. There's a good girl. I will, that. Joe, I'll have to tell you what was in that bottle. It was something old Nancy gave Lil to get rid of that baby. What? If you don't look out, there's no knowing what'll come to pass. Deb told me as they'd both been to Nancy's all innocent like to... Find out if what they suspected was true. But Lily had never had the heart. Why, she said what to me... What does it matter what she said? Well, I'm done. Now, if you're angered when you're talking to a lad, just mind you of your wedding night. Uh, I must be off home. Goodbye, lad. Don't be too hard on her. Lily! Lily! Come here. What is it, Joe? What were you doing with Nancy's bottle? How do you know it was Nancy's? Oh, it's not but rhubarb. Oh, I learned you to lie to me. And I want to know why you let me grill my hand like a rasher when you went all the time to... Oh, Lil. You've got to promise me never to take no more of Nancy's stuff and never to tell me no more lies. Don't you want to have little ones sitting round the table with their little mugs? No. No? Why not? Because little ones means pain and work and worry and mugs means washing up. Well... Oh, listen, Lil. If you go on nice and proper this time, I'll let you off the other five. I, I thought to have six and... Oh, look, I'll do the work for you evenings when I get back and borrow Whitefoot to go drives. And buy me the locket. I and buy the locket, I promise. Only no more games, Lil. And I'll stick to what I said. Lil, what'll I be this time next year, eh? A donkey. <laughs> Come on, give us that. John! 
Oh, whatever it is, the man never in the quarter he wanted, like a weathercock in winter. John! Here I be, Mother. I've been lighting Deb's little lamp. Mm. Well, now, you must fetch the apples and the nuts and the water. Oh, now, and... now, one at a time. Don't overdrive the willing horse. It's made its overdrive with Stephen and Deb coming for the night and all. Why did you ask him, then? John Arden. Did you let your own girl as you're busy lighting the useless lamp for trudge the roads past midnight? And she three months in her time? You don't say. I say, and I know. But Deb hasn't said all to Stephen yet, so don't go blurting out nothing on scene. Well... Well, to think of my little lass. Your little lass will want some water to make her a cup of tea more than she'll want you to stand there talking forever. Well, make the fire up then. The kettle will soon boil. Ah, Joe. Hello, Hello Dad. And you, Lil. Hello, Joe. Hello. <laughs> You're the first to arrive. <laughs> Any news? Oh, there might be. How'd you like being old grandfather? And you so spry oh, and all. Joe, the whole world will know soon the way you go on. Well, well my goodness, that's, that's grand news. <laughs> well, well, the party's begun, I see. Leastways, two, three, four foolish Thank folk you, has done it no better than to be walked in through the muck. Like goslings for a scrap of meat. If you be a gosling, Eli, come and cackle by the fire. Oh, right. Uh, come in, Lucy. Hello. Make yourself comfortable Hello. by the fire. Hey, hey, give me your coat. Oh, thank you, Mr. Arden. What a night. Oh, move over, Mr. Hunt. Batch, you make room for me. If I was you, Lucy Thrupton, I wouldn't get no fatter. It don't look respectable. Here we be, Father. Ah, Deb and Stephen at last. Come in. Good evening, Stephen. And take off them wet coats. Come and sit by me, Stephen. I'm all right over here, thank you, Lily. I saw my lamp shining a long way off, Bob. I'm glad you still keep it lit. It's the kindly light, my dear. I like to keep it there for you, especially. Well, Southernwood, you gallus young whippersnapper. Well, you sour old great-grandfather. Deb, my dear, is your tea putting some heart into you? The roads be long in the dark. Yes, the thank you, Mother. Long in you like dark. one of my soul cakes, Lucy? Comfort, oh, Stephen. I think that. Well. Our traveling's only a circle. And whether we're outward or homeward bound, we're just as nigh the sun. Mother says when they give a soul cake to folks in time past, they used to say, God have your soul, bones and all. How horrible. If you're too high and mighty to want the Lord to get your soul, Southern Wood, what'll you do when the devil gets it, eh? There is no devil. Why, there's his chair, close by where you be living. It's empty, there's no devil there. There is a devil, I know there is. I wish there was. Oh, well, come on now, if we're going to play the fool with them apples, Mother, let's begin. And them round, then. Now, everyone's got to peel one without breaking it. Throw the peel over your shoulder, and it'll make the initial of your future husband or wife. But if you're married, it'll be of your first... Mother, child. can I have a better apple than uh, this? Of course, my dear. Um, here you are. I shouldn't put yourself about, Lucy. It'll only make a big round knot. Oh, I know you are. Listen. Can you hear them sheep? Year in, year out. I hear the sheep cry nights, but never as they cry on Halloween and Midsummer Night. For they see the flock master with his worn feet and his eye for sorrow and the wideness of his pity. There'd be no one there. No one. A penny for your thoughts, Mr. Suddenwood. Better pay a thousand pounds not to know them, Lucy. Lord, Stephen, what ails you? You're never going to get like Eli. Never happy unless you are miserable. No, no, the lad's only thinking out something in the machinery line. Them things take a power of thinking on. Well, look, Mother, Stephen sliced his apple the best. Throw it down, Stephen. Oh, look. It's the letter N. N for nothing. Oh, I wish I lived here, Mr. Arden. There's no devil's chair to get on your nerves here. Ah, if you only look, lad, you can see all colors in that black rock. And sparkling white, too. Oh, what makes you think the things you do? About the flock master and all that? How do you make up such things? I don't make them up. I say them like that for lack of better ways. I've seen him lead his flock in the sky. I've heard his voice in the heather. What's so wonderful in that? Father, did you hear us Mr. Pryor send in 50 short horn to America? No, I haven't heard. They'd be glad enough for some good Shropshire milk in America, poor things. You cannot get a man to go along with him for love or money, seemingly. He's offering good money, I hear. What? What sort of a man does he want? Oh, handy chap, honest and that. You say he's paid good wages? You know anyone lightly then, Stephen? I know one chap, but he may be tied. No, I think we should all sing a hymn. 
Oh, before that, can we have the golden arrow? Oh, oh there's oh, neither oh, sense oh, nor oh, godliness oh, in them words. It's a grand song. Oh, now, yeah. come on then, everyone. Oh. We, we have sought it, we have sought the golden arrow. Bright the sandy willows sway. Two and two by pathways narrow. Arm in crook along the mountain way. Break the frost and break the day. Summer sobbing through the gloom. When we found it, when we found the golden arrow. not eating much breakfast, Stephen. But ain't you hungry? Not very. You were that restless in the night. I had a rotten night, frightful nightmares. Can you stay at home today, Stephen? I must do my work, Deb. Oh, please, Stephen, don't go for my sake. If you get notice given, you will not complain, whatever we come to. Oh, Deb, be sensible. Let me get off to work. Oh, the Oh, dear heart, I cannot let you go. I must go. I'm not a stupid sheep. I know the way. There's been some has lost their way in the dark of a white fog. Oh, Stephen, stay with me just today. Oh, don't start pleading again, Deb. It tears my heart. Don't go to work, Stephen. Please, just today. Why today? But today we're sure on. Today's ours. We're not sure on any other day. I must do my work, Deb. You know that. Don't get silly ideas in your head. I shall be as right as a trivet. Oh, Stephen, don't you think you might sometime get a bit of a sheep walk or something and be at home like father is? Get a sheep farm, but what for? So's to take away the day-long sorrow. What sorrow? Being away from you. All the world's against you when your man's away, if you love him. Deb, don't. I, I must go. There's thunder and machinery and runaway horses and a slip on the hillside. It turns me sick. Oh, there's so many things said against lovers. But those things don't really happen, Deb. They do. Every day. And they might happen to you and me not there. Nonsense. I shall be all right. You have a nice time and read by the fire. Look, the, the fog's clearing. I must go now. I shall be late. But whatever you do, don't leave the path, Stephen. I won't. Goodbye. 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 Stephen! He's gone. Till six o'clock. Here's a note for you, missus. He's not hurt, is he? Quick, tell me. What are you after shaking me for? Is who hurt The foreman, my man. Southern Wood. Hurt it? No, he gave me this note to bring you. You're sure he's all right? Didn't I say so? I, I'm sorry I was rough, lad. Would you like an apple? Thanks. Obliged, Obliged to go, to go away. away. I've asked Last your father to come, come and take you home. Forgive me. Oh. You don't love me no more. It's true. You don't love me no more. It's all dark. I'm dreaming. I'll wake up for long. This was our home. Never no more. None must touch it. None must lay hands on it. If it's not for Stephen and me, it's for no one else. I'll burn it. to be out. I was along of a young woman that was took bad in lost prison, and now I guess and go home in all this snow. Whatever be you doing with all this furniture outside? Help me. You must help me. The table, then the dresser. Did you hear the devil cry? It's only the wind, dearie. There he is again. And there go the dark riders. Come along with me and see what a nice cup of tea will do for you. You'm crazed for sure. There's a child crying. Up by the devil's chair. Listen. Poor 
look at him shrieking. He's dragging him. Let's be going to my place, oh. quick. A terrible night. Dear saints, do not set fire to it. Death for us, tell them what you hiding your senses. I am not staying here to get behind the lump of all that stuff. It's a wicked waste. Wicked waste? No. It's the kindly light. God help all poor benighted folk. God keep Stephen for I gather. Oh, Father, is my light still a light? For I sore need you. Don't come praying here. It's all your fault. What is? You know right well. If I had him here, I'd tear him inch me, I would. Happy Christmas, Eli. Happy Christmas. Will you come and have a look at my sheep a bit? But they got foot rot. And it takes two to dress them. I'll come when Deborah's better and not a four. Oh, I'm surprised at you, John. Selfish to the bone. Their market value's going down every day. Dear sakes. You talk as if the world was not but pounds, shillings and pence. So it is. And the sharpest gets them. I'd sooner lose them. And that you surely will, John. Like it or no. Is Deb awake? Aye. Jean coming downstairs. I thought it might cheer her up to be with us on Christmas Day and all. Ah, here she is. Be careful, my dear. Lean on me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Now sit you down by the fire. That's the way. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see you downstairs again, Deb. Thank you, Father. Uh, here we are, Mother. Oh, ah, yeah. Happy Christmas to you all. Happy, happy Christmas. Christmas. Happy Christmas. Hello, Deb. Yeah. How are you feeling? Well, I'm all right, Joe. I hope you'll soon be well, Deb. I, I'll soon be well. Damn his eyes. And I say the same. You must swear, Joe. I wish you'd swear genteel. Damn who, Joe? Damn who, Joe? Oh, here comes Sleep Handbell. Aye. Old Campbell and all. Damn who? Joe. Let's say so much, Joe. Why, uh, Cadwallader, Deb. The damn Cadwallader. And his missus. And his kid. You're kindly welcome, neighbors. Come inside. Come in. Thank, Thank you. you. Merry Christmas. Happy Christmas. Yeah, what are you going to give us, gentlemen? Oh, good Christian men rejoice is the one we know best. Well, that'll do very nice. Right. Now, here, Lily. Pass round the meat pies, my dears. Well, Joe. What's one and one, Mick? Uh, two. <laughs> what a soft riddle. Wrong. One and one makes three, eh? Very <laughs> oh, <laughs> mild for the season, isn't it? A mild drop in time. I thought it was a black frost. A long black frost. In the black frosts, there's greens and reds down under. And summer in the making, Deb, my dear. Aye, that's true. Oh, you tell us they're all sixes and sevens at the mine since all the wood's gone. <laughs> the manager can't get the men in hand no more than a babby. He got away with him at Southernwood, they say, though he was young. Oh! Ooh, what do you want to tread on my foot so heavy for, Mr. Shakespeare? All well, sixes and sevens, are they? Uh, uh, oi, missus. And they can't get on without him? Oh, no danger, missus. Aye, they'll miss him. They'll not find his like. There's no one in the whole world like my Stephen. There's no one in the whole world. Oh, Dad. Dad. Don't stand there talking, John. Go and find our Deb and bring her back inside. She can't stand the bitter cold. Deb. Deb, give me them reins. Loose your hands, will you, lass? What ails you, my dear? Can't you tell me? Hmm? Why don't you come home now? You're starved with cold. I'm cold, too. I it's cold. Cold as death. There's no need to talk of death. We're all well and hearty, thank God. It came on me sudden like a Stephen. Yes, Deb. A Stephen might be dead. Dead and lonesome. And though he don't love me, nor yet didn't want me, he might be lonesome and wanting me if he was in the cold grave and me not there. I see. Well. And so it seemed to me as I might go to him if he was dead, though I couldn't live with him in life. And so I fetched the reins and came up here... Don't go on, lass. I'd sooner you didn't. 
Deb, he's not dead. He's maybe in sore trouble, but he's not dead. How do you know? I just know. He'll come back at long last. Won't be any use. He doesn't mm. love me. But he might be ill and want nursing, and he'd want you then. Only for a while. Maybe, but you'd not like him to be asking for you to nurse him, and you're not there. I want him, and I can't find him. We must live in hopes, my dear. He'll come back, you'll see. He must come back. How can you be sure, Father? How can anyone be sure? Right, I'm free now. I'll come. Oh, good morning, Mr. Uh... Uh, Arden, sir. John Arden. Would you kindly read this? I'd be obliged if you put it in your newspaper. If Mr. Stephen Southernwood will write to this office, he will hear something to his advantage and oblige. Oh, yes, that's quite clear. You think it'll fetch him? Or had I best explain a bit? It sounds inviting. Money, I suppose? Uh, no, not money. A little and soon. Good Lord. No, I shouldn't explain, if you want him. And it'll find him for sure in America. Well, of course, America's a very big place. Though with a large circulation, you might not see it. Still, we'll try it, shall we? Now, can I have your name? Stop your crying, and I send you to sleep. We have sought it. We have sought the golden arrow. Bright the sally billows sway. Two and two by pathways narrow. Deborah. Stephen. You look tired. I was, but not now. I'm home again. There's a look on you as if you've been ill. I... I had typhoid. I was in hospital for months. That was why I didn't come. And the minute I knew I couldn't, I wanted to more than anything in this life or any other. I was off my head for a long time. I couldn't remember anything except your name. I couldn't get to you. And I couldn't live without you. Deborah, I know I've no right to ask you now, but please, may I kiss you? I know you'd sooner not, but thank you kindly for asking, Stephen. But I've come half across the world for it. Aye, but first you went away. There's no will, Will, Stephen, and I understand. You thought you loved me best in the world, and, and you came to see it different. I didn't know. I... Uh... I didn't understand, but I do now. Oh, I love you. Can't you see? See what, Stephen? That I love you better than myself. Can't you believe it now, Deborah? No. Never, no more. Oh, done a take on you, so there's not a miss. Stephen, would you like to see our child? Child? I. The only thing I've ever done for you. See, his name's John, after father. Because Lily has named her son Stephen. It's very small, isn't it? No, he's big for his age. No, oh, there, I must take him indoors and give him his son. Can't you stay and feed him here? No. You hate the sight of me. I'd better go. Stephen, I love only you in the whole world. Then can't you believe that I love you? How can I make you believe? You cannot. You told me you did it for her and it wasn't true. I cannot believe anything again. I gave you all I had and you flung it back in my face. I've no ill feeling, Stephen. But I've no more to give. The dew's falling. You two should be home. Good night, Deborah. Good night, Stephen. And may the kindly light be along with you. Hush now, my dear. He can't be far away. And if he's to be found by mortal man, father will find him for sorrow, too. Oh, he came back, and I sent him away. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter if he loves me or no, I want him. He thinks I said I love him no more. He'll never come back. Oh, Stephen, Stephen. There, there, he'll come back. 
you see. <laughs> this time of night, borrowing's all of its season, it seems. But since you're here, you may as well see what a fine boy Deb's got. Well? Just like this scoundrelly father. Where's my Bible? There! There she is! Go to her, Stephen! Oh, Go to her! Talk of the devil! Deb, my darling... You young fool! Do you want to go down on the floor like a struck bullock? Why can't you go down on your knees to the Lord Almighty? Eli, get out. What? Get out. Oh, and many were turned empty away. This way, Eli. Why, if he was my son. And mother, you come too. I'm thinking it's the shipping for you and me tonight. Aye, John, may need no onlooker. It's like kindle a bit of fire for him and light the lamp. No, mother. Thank you, but there's no need. The lad speaks true, mother. For do you not mind the tale of them that found the golden arrow? The golden arrow that brings love and sorrow both. And went with apple blossom sent round them and a mort of bees and warm ship and wanted naught of any man. There's no need of fire or candle for them, my dear, for they've got their light. The kindly light says will show them the way while cut love's mending. And the... In The Golden Arrow by Mary Webb, adapted from her novel by Penelope Shaw and Norman Painting, the cast was as follows. John Arden, Sebastian Shaw, Patty Arden... Marjorie Westbury, Deborah Arden, Jill Mears, Stephen Southernwood, Anthony Pedley, Joe Arden, Christopher Robbie, Eli Huntbatch, Basil Jones, Lily Huntbatch, Bridget Wood, Lucy Thruckton, Gay Rourke, Nancy Cora, Jean Boat. Other parts were played by Gerald Turner, John Bott, George Woolley, and Peter Biddle. The music was taken from Delius Over the Hills and Far Away, and the tune Golden Arrow was composed by Stephen Hancock. Production from the Midlands was by Anthony Cornish. Sebastian Shaw is a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Carter Brown, Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Carter Brown to bring you another of my stories. The title of this one is Nightmare for Night, and in case that doesn't make sense to you, I'd better explain that my hero's name is Nicholas Knight. He's a private investigator, and this is the account of one of his cases. A blend of East and West, a mixture of mayhem and mystery. So let me introduce Nicholas Knight, usually known as Nicky. I don't get many surprises in the private eye business, but this was one of them. This slim, sleek, suave character who'd walked into my office and introduced himself as an Arabian sheik. <laughs> I thought it was a gag until he produced proof. And then when he came out with his proposition, I thought that was a gag too. I looked at his black eyes and his black pointed beard, at his perfectly cut suit and his perfectly dazzling smile, and thought I'd heard everything. Well, Mr. Knight, you seem a little taken aback. Well, that is putting it mildly. Me, bodyguard for a hair. I appreciate it may be something of an unusual assignment for you, but I am perfectly serious about it. The Prince Al-Zaman will be here in the city for two weeks. He has delicate negotiations to conduct. They concern the oil, of course. <laughs> of course. And he has brought four of his harem with him, the four most beautiful. Also three guards, but the guards know nothing of the ways of the Western world. That is why we think it necessary to engage a private detective as well. Uh-huh, I see. And when do they arrive? This afternoon. I have rented a house for them, a large house some 20 miles out of the city. 
It has a high wall surrounding it which will ensure privacy. <laughs> With a harem in town, privacy is a good idea. I would like you to arrive at the house not later than seven this evening. The prince will be there and I shall present you. A room will be at your disposal and you will be required to stay in the house for the next 14 days, the duration of the prince's visit. Uh -huh. I trust that will suit you, Mr. Knight. <laughs> Sheik Haroon, for the dough you're paying me, I'll even wear a sarong. You have, of course, a gun. Yeah? You expect that sort of trouble? I do not expect any trouble, Mr. Knight. I am just taking precautions, that is all. I'll bring my gun with me. I think in that case there is nothing further to discuss. I shall see you at the house. I have written the address and directions how to reach it. Please be prompt, Mr. Knight. The prince does not like to be kept waiting. I'll be on time. Excellent. Your English is very good, if I may say so, Sheik Haroon. So they told me at Harvard. Uh -oh. Good morning, Mr. Knight. <laughs> the heck does a guy packed to go looking after four harem beauties? Well, let's see now. Shirts? So, uh, visitors yet. Okay, okay, don't bust your G-string. Yep. Uh, Mr. Knight. In person. May I see you for a moment? It is urgent. Yeah, sure, come in. Park your hat and follow me. Now, uh, park yourself. There's a good chair. Uh, thank you. Well, what's so urgent? It is a rather delicate mission, Mr. Knight. I, I'm not sure where to start. Well, make it fast, pal. I haven't got much time. And, of course, how rude of me. I shall have to be blunt. You are hurrying now to undertake an assignment for Prince Al-Zaman. Am I? You are discreet, Mr. Knight. But you don't know much about Prince Al-Zaman. He's not a very pleasant person, I assure you. In his own country, he is absolute dictator and acts as such. Life and death are his to command, and no woman is safe from his harem. The prince's word is absolute. Well, what do you want me to do, start a crusade? There was one woman. She was beautiful and not one of his subjects. She was a French girl named Marie Desprez. He met her on the Riviera. He, he made her many offers, even marriage. Mm -hmm. Then she disappeared. And by the time her disappearance was discovered, the prince's yacht had sailed. Marie Desprez has not been seen since. How do you know all this? I am her brother, Louis Desprez. Oh. Now, I knew it would have been suicide for me to try and enter Elzaman's own country, so I have waited for him to leave it. This is the first time he has done so since last summer. He has brought some of his hair on with him. I know that. What I do not know is whether Marie is one of them. Now, you are the one man who can help me who will be in a position to find out if he has my sister. Uh, yeah, but it, it's not as simple as that. You, you mean money? Mr. Knight, I will pay you $5,000 no, no, to no, find no, out it's if... it's not I... a question of dough. I've got a reputation in this town as an honest investigator. I've been employed by Prince Al-Zaman. Now you want me to spy on him. I see. There's no more to be said, then. I only ask that you forget we have ever met, have ever had this conversation. I shall spend my life looking for Marie... But if Alzheimer learns of it, my chances will not be worth a snap of your fingers. Oh, look, now, if I want to contact you, where do I find you? The Hotel Arcadia. Mr. Knight, does that mean you will do it? I don't know. I'll, I'll, ha I'll have to think about it. Monsieur, if you do, you'll have the undying gratitude of a desperate man. I shall wait anxiously at the hotel for a word from you. Well, don't, don't bank on it. I know a man when I see one. Au revoir, Monsieur Knight. <laughs> It was sharp on seven when I turned up at the house, a large, forbidding sort of building surrounded by a large, forbidding sort of wall. There was a guard at the gates and another at the doorway of Prince Alzaman's private apartments to which the Sheikh Haroon led me. The guard at the door wore a long, curved knife, <laughs> and he didn't look as though it was just for decoration. He opened the door and ushered us in. You will address the prince as your highness. When I saw the prince, I felt more like addressing him as fatso. He was reclining on two overstuffed cushions, and it was hard to tell where he finished and the cushion started. There was a four-pound box of chocolates beside him, and he kept dipping into it with his fat, short fingers. I have brought the private detective, Your Highness. You are knight. I am, uh, you, Your Highness. Mm. These are excellent chocolates, Harun. You honor me, my prince. Knight. Yeah? Your Highness. Uh, your Highness? You yeah. understand I shall be away for some days from tomorrow morning. It is essential for my women to be well guarded. My guards have orders to kill any intruder. What? Your orders are exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> a hard center. Hey, now, wait a minute. This is the United States. This business about killing, you can't do... Are you questioning me? I guess not, Your Highness. 
That is better. You need not fear any consequences, Nide. My influence with your country is considerable. The women's apartments are directly above here. I have given orders that no one enters on pain of death. No one. Yeah, I get it. I, I mean, I understand, Your Highness. Should you need any assistance, you have only to call. My guards all speak English. In my own country, I find that has certain advantages. I can give orders which will not be understood by eavesdroppers. Yeah, I guess that would be a help uh, in your country. I think that is everything. Harun will give you any other information you require. Retire from the prince's presence backwards. What? Oh, oh, sure. Mm. Ah. Mm, the first lay is finished already. The box will not last out. Abdul, the audience is over. Yeah, see you. Mr. Knights, let me introduce you to Abdul. He will be upstairs most of the time guarding the harem. Ah, oh, good evening. Well, I'll be with you. Come along now, Mr. Knight, and I will show you your room. Oh, thanks. I think you found the prince a little startling. Yeah, uh, a little. It is understandable from the Western point of view, but in our country, you must remember, he is the absolute ruler. And you get caught by one of those knives if you feed him the wrong sort of chocolates. It is not advisable to joke about the prince, Mr. Knight. Mm -hmm. Here is your room. I trust you will be comfortable. I have left you a bottle of your American rye. Oh, say, that's, that, that's really thoughtful of you. Uh, how about we open it now? We do not drink alcohol, Mr. Knight, but if you care to do oh. so, open it by all means. Tomorrow morning, the prince leaves to conduct his negotiations, and I go with him. As the prince told you, the four women are upstairs. There is also Fatima who looks after them. Uh -huh. She prepares all the meals and will serve yours. Then there is Abdul, whom you have met, yeah. Hassan, an Arab, uh -huh. and Blanc, the guard on the gate. Yeah. Well, sounds nice and cozy. Cheers. <coughs> what, what in thunder is that? That is the prince going to make his nightly inspection of the harem. The gong is a warning that he is coming. Yeah, I can see how that would be needed. Is that another joke, Mr. Knight? Oh, no, Sheik. Any way you look at it, it's no joke. After breakfast next morning, I took a stroll down the drive. I saw a car disappearing through the gates, the Prince and Haroon on their way. That left me and the harem uh, and the guards. The one on the gate who had let me through last night was right on the job. I thought I might as well strike up an acquaintance, and this time I used the right greeting. Al, I'll be with you. And you, boss. Heck of a morning, ain't what? Hey, <laughs> you don't sound like you come from the prince's country. Well, only been there about three years, boss. Between you and me, I was a seaman on a tanker. But I ran into a little bother in Tunis and skipped the ship. Then I wound up on this job. Uh-huh. You like it? It's sure better than jail, boss. Uh-oh. Here comes trouble. Hmm? What well, you mean that little guy coming towards us? Uh, who's that? That's Hassan. He's pure poison, boss. Yes, sir. Pure poison. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you are Mr. Knight. I am Hassan. Oh, yeah. Haroon uh, mentioned you, Hassan. Being a guard is dull work, don't you think, Mr. Knight? So little excitement. It is always more exciting to attack than defend. And more dangerous. Life is nothing without danger. <laughs> I do not know why my master, the prince, should have engaged your services. I am a superb shot, a brilliant knife thrower, and my cunning is known throughout the East. Well, such brilliance must be exhausting. Maybe he wanted to give you a rest. Possibly. Although I could have told him I am not tired. <laughs> it has been delightful to meet you, Mr. Knight. We shall see more of each other. For the present, good morning. Say, Blanc, uh, what does that character do for a living, huh? Oh, he does many jobs for the prince. Any time the prince wants something fixed, it's Hassan who does it. Uh, she may be obvious about his share of the oil... Then Hassan goes to see him. Oh. After Hassan sees him, the sheik makes no more noise, ever. Yeah, I get the point. And obviously so does the sheik, since Hassan's so slick with a knife. Uh, put you something else, boss. He eats hashish sometimes. That's a time to stay away from him. Far away. After that, I decided the best place for me was my room. I killed the rest of the day there and the rest of the bottle. Fortunately, I'd taken the precaution of bringing a quarter of my own. By midnight, I'd made fair inroads into that, too. And then suddenly, I heard a sound. Yeah? Well, what do you know? Straight out of the Arabian Nights, yashmak silk trousers and all. Well, I'll be with you. Shut the door, you dope. Uh, you're an American. Well, I didn't come here to see the Star Spangled Banner. Now shut that door, quick. <laughs> Top 
Arthur Brown, Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. This was really one for the books, the story books. Nicky Knight, the private eye, bodyguarding the harem of an eastern prince in an isolated house made even more isolated by a high stone wall. But instead of Knight coming to the harem, the harem had come to Knight. In the person of this black-haired babe with a veil over her face and the silk jacket and silk trousers trying hard to hide her how-do-you-do figure and not succeeding. I said shut the door. That fool Abdul might wake up any minute. Abdul? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. He's on guard upstairs, isn't he? I thought he was going to wake up just as I went past him. Boy, was I scared. I don't get it. You came from the harem, but you're American. All the way from Texas. Well, then what are you doing in the harem? Oh, it's just one of those things. I was dancing in the east, and my agent took a powder with all the dough. Some of it was the management, so they tossed me out on my ear. Well, it's not exactly pleasant being broke in those countries. But Al's a man had seen me dance and made me an offer, so here I am. And you don't mind it? Oh, he sticks 300 bucks into an account for me every month. Living doesn't cost me anything. Only it's so gold darn boring. Boring? Sure. You don't see anyone all day except for Teemer. And at night, when the great man makes his inspection, you know what he does? Uh, you tell me. He just sits there eating those concerned chocolates. What? That's right. Then he goes to bed, and we go to bed. I tell you, I have never been so bored. That's why I took a chance tonight. The sneaking out? Yep. Fatima told us about you. You sounded interesting, so I thought I'd take a look. Oh, look your fill, lady. Oh, not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> What's your name? Knight. Nick Knight. Nicky. Ah, oh, I like that. You can call me Tex. Say, that wouldn't be a real old-fashioned American bottle, would it? It would indeed. Oh, pour me one. Sure. I haven't had a swallow of one of those since George Washington was a pup. There you are. Watch out it doesn't choke you. I'm from Texas, remember? Well, he's looking at you, Nicky. Cheers. Mm. Oh. Uh, there are four of you girls up there, aren't there? Yep. We fight like cat and dog, too. Takes Fatima all the time to sort us out. Uh, who are the other three? Why? What's wrong with me? Well, from what I can see, and uh, that's plenty, and not a thing, Tex. Then what do you want to go asking about the others for? Oh, just curiosity. Oh. Well, there's Natasha. She's a white Russian or something. Then there's Lee Chi. She's Chinese. They're okay. But the other one, the French dame, she's a queer one. Always unhappy, always crying. Did you say she was French? Uh-huh. Her name's Marie. Marie what? Well, how the tarnation do I know? You know, for a guy who's just curious, you sound awfully interesting. Oh, no, no. I I'm not, Tex. You better not be. I haven't got much time. That Abdul might wake up any minute. So just you forget about the others, huh? And concentrate on me. Honey, you've come to the right boy. I can concentrate better than a short-sighted accountant looking for a missing dollar. <laughs> so, what? Hassan! So you would betray my master. Now, take it easy, Hassan. You know the penalty. Death. Listen, pal, don't let that hashish you've been feeding yourself give you any nutty ideas. Uh -huh, I have told you, Knight, of my skill with the knife. You may witness it now. Down on the floor, Tex! Ah! I'm not bad with a good old American bottle myself! Ah! And then there's a good old American rabbit punch, too! Ah! Whew. How's that for a guy who's a little out of practice? Nicky, you're going to have to do better. I think someone's coming, and my guess is Abdul. I can take care of him, too. Little Hassan won't want his gun any longer. That's it. You stay put, Tex. I'll get behind the door. What is this? Hey, son? Dead? Hey, you! Woman! Where is the American? Right here! Oh, Nicky, you're colossal. Oh, so is he. If he'd hit that floor any harder, he'd have gone right through it. Well, what do we do now? To coin a phrase, let's get out of here. But, Nicky, how? There's a guard on the gates, and if he sees but me... But he won't, baby, if you're lying flat on the floor in the back. And with a gun poking at him, I don't think he'll argue with me. <laughs> I was right. 
The ex-seaman took one look at the revolver. His eyes did a double-action rock and roll, and he unlocked the gates. I shoved my foot down on the accelerator, and we got out of the place quicker than a fish slides down a performing seal's gullet. I didn't slow down until about 15 minutes later. Whew. Well, that's better. The way you were pushing this bus along, I thought we'd end up in the ditch any minute. Honey, I used to drive a jeep in the army. After that, this is kid stuff. Where are you heading? Home, my apartment. Oh. And what about me? Where am I heading? Home, my apartment. Nicky, you're a right guy. And first thing in the morning, I'll have to get you some clothes. Some decent clothes. If a cop pulled us up now with you in that outfit... You'll have to tell him we've been to a fancy dress ball. And if he believes that, he'll believe anything. Hey! Of all the dumb... What's the matter? I've just realized what a dope I am. We could have brought that girl Marie with us. What's that French dame got that fascinates you? You haven't even seen her. It's not what she's got. It's what her brother's got. His name's Louis Despray. And he offered me 5,000 greenbacks for letting him know whether his sister's in that place or not. If we produced the sister, he, he might have made it 15. Oh, that explains the curiosity. Money. Can you think of a better explanation? I guess not. Oh, speaking of money, that dough that Fatso was depositing in a bank for you, is it an American bank? Sure. In your name? That's right. Well, then he can't touch it. It's safe. But I don't know that I am. His Highness Prince Alpha Man will never forget that I have uh, insulted his honor by leaving. He'll hunt me down, Nicky. That's the way he is. I'll let you into a secret. If what Louis Despray says is true, his sister was kidnapped. And if I can prove it, the prince might be on the other end of the hunting. Well, watch out for him, Nicky. He can be real mean. Look, what's the setup anyway? Where does this uh, Haroon who hired me fit into the picture? Well, he's the contact man in the States. He's here all the time to work out any troubles with the oil company. Well, if he's here the whole time, why did Fatso come? Well, we girls of the harem weren't taken into the prince's confidence. Oh. I do know, though, that he had an urgent cable from his younger brother, and that was why he decided to make the trip. His younger brother? Who's his younger brother? Haroon, of course, stupid. Look, I may be stupid, but nobody told me that Haroon was his younger brother. Well, now I've told you. Yeah. Where does it get me? Huh? Well, there's something screwy going on, Tex, but I just can't figure it. With those three gods already, why was I hired at all? Search me. <laughs> With you in that outfit, it wouldn't take long. You know, <laughs> girl looks so stupid in this get-up once you get out of that atmosphere. Girl feels cold, too. Well, in that case, honey, move closer. <laughs> got into my apartment without being seen, <laughs> which was just as well. First thing next morning, I called Louis Despray at the Arcadia and arranged to meet him in the lounge. Then I went shopping for Tex. With a list of stuff she gave me, I was only just in time for my talk with Despray. Hey, Mr. Knight, why, when you rang, I, I, I could hardly believe it. Well... Don't we get to order a drink first? No, please, Mr. Knight, you know how important this is to me. Yeah, yeah, I guess I do. She's there, Despray. She is? Is she all right? As far as I know, I didn't see her, but I have it on good authority that she's okay, but unhappy. Oh, Marie. My poor little Marie. Is there anything else you found out? One thing, that my conscience doesn't worry me anymore, not after meeting the prince. In fact, it would be a distinct pleasure to feed him some hot lead instead of chocolates. Me, I, I feel the same way. But uh, what are you doing away from the house? Order me a drink and I'll tell you. While the waiter went off with our orders, I told Louis to spray the whole story. When I finished, Louis looked up at me and his expression was serious. Hmm. So this Hassan is a really dangerous one, then, huh? Uh-huh. And after him, that mountain named Abdul. The one on the gate, Blanc, doesn't matter. He's easy meat. That is good. Oh, uh, by the way, here is your check for $5,000. Huh? <laughs> I've had it already, just in case. Well, thanks. And that keeps my promise to you for finding out whether Marie is there or not. Now, now I would ask you something more. How would you like to earn a further $5,000? I'd like. What do I have to do? 
break into that house with me and rescue Marie? Say, you know, the more I think about that, the more it appeals to me. Excellent. <laughs> I told you, monsieur, when we first met, that I knew a man when I saw one. <laughs> when do you propose doing it? We should not wait too long, I think. They, uh, they may become panicky and do something drastic to my little sister. Well, when do you think? What do you say to tomorrow night? Uh-huh, suits me. I shall call for you just before midnight. By the time we get to the house, uh, everyone should be asleep. Yeah, yeah, that sounds okay. Then, monsieur, I give you a toast. To tomorrow night and success. I drank his toast and then left. In the foyer of the hotel, I bumped into an old acquaintance, Hank Green, the hotel detective. Hi, Nicky. I saw you in the lounge. Yeah, I get so reckless. I'll even chance the liquor you serve here. Uh, you get reckless, all right, with the company you keep. Huh? What's that? The guy you were drinking with. Louis Despray? Oh, is that what he calls himself now? Well, how do you mean now? I know him as Louis Katz. A nasty taste in the mouth from way back. He dodged a murder rap in France in 1948 and came to the States. <laughs> he's lucky. His parents were holidaying here when he was born. So he's got U.S. nationality and can't be kept out of the country. He's pulled everything from selling the Brooklyn Bridge to a sucker to murder. He's tough and he's clever. Also about a safe company as a death adder. Oh, brother. You're sure you're not mixing him up with someone else? Oh, not me, not little Louie. <laughs> I don't sleep nights while he's staying in the hotel. You're not paid to sleep nights. Well, thanks, pal. I'll do something for you one day. Just take my advice, Nicky. If he's made you any proposition, don't take it. On the contrary, Hank, that's just what I'm going to do. I'm going along with him all the way. Brown Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation Carter Brown. open. Me, Nicky Knight, the smart private eye. Call me Sir Lancelot, all set to storm the wicked prince's castle and rescue the beautiful captive maiden. Only instead of riding my brave steed with my trusty sword, I rode a Buick special beside a two-time fraud, Louis de Spray, alias Louis Katz. But this was the only way I could see of finding out what the catch was. We parked the car off the road about a quarter of a mile from the house and cat-footed it up to the wall at the back of the building. You th think this is the best place tonight? Yeah. The way I figure it, there's an even chance that Blanc, the guard on the gate, sleeps in the little gatehouse. Yes, that is reasonable. So if we get over the wall here, we've got a chance of getting away with it. Uh -huh. I'll go first. You give me a push-up, and then I'll give you a pull. Uh, are you ready? Ready? Yes. Okay. Go! Oh. Oh. I'm set. You jump, and I'll grab you. Here I come. Right. Grab, grab my arm. That's it. Up. Up. Good work, my friend. Now down to the garden, eh? Yeah. Let's go. Now, quiet, quiet now. Where are we going? Eh? Back door. Uh, what if it is locked? Eh? Oh, I got a little gadget with me that's pretty useful for this sort of emergency. You, uh, you have your gun ready? Of course. Huh. The way that Hassan flicks a knife about, I'm not taking risks. I, too. Hold it. Huh? We are here. Uh-huh. You will uh, unpick the lock now, eh? No. Lesson one in the private eye manual. Always test the door before trying to pick it. You never know. It might be open. Well, how do you know? It is. A piece of luck. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, this is the kitchen. That door opens on the hall. Come on. It's a light. The 
it is a light under that door ahead. Yeah. Who lives in there? The prince when he's home. Perhaps he has returned. Let us go and see him. Don't be crazy. It's a girl we're after. But I am also after the prince. Louis! What? Who dares to disturb me? Who are you? Your executioner! So much for his highness, Alzheimer. What did you do that for? It's just payment. Now we go upstairs to find Marie. Correction, please, not we. Me! I prefer to go the rest of the way alone, pal. You just lie there and rest. I went up the stairs two at a time, dodging from side to side as I came to make a difficult target. Then a large curved sword appeared on the landing. Behind it was Abdul. The American! Hello, Abdul. Goodbye. As he came toppling down the stairs, I pressed back against the wall and then ran for the door to the harem. I dragged it open and found myself face to face with a dark-eyed beauty with small curls and sweet curves. Who? What do you want? Do you, Marie Despray? Yes. Now I've come to take you home. Take me? What kind of a trick is this? No trick. The prince is dead, Abdul is dead. And if we don't get out of here fast, we'll qualify for the quartet. Now come on! How do you feel now? I, I, I do not quite know. I'm still dizzy from the haste. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Marie. About the rough treatment getting over the wall, but a skinned knee is better than a punctured hide. Oh, I do not mind. I am more than grateful. I kept waiting for Hassan to come yelling after us. You know, that's a funny thing. What? There was no sign of Hassan. He's the toughest of the lot. Where was he? And where was Haroon? If the prince was back, he should have been, too. Oh, surely, Nikki, the, the one thing that matters is that we have got away. Yeah, that's true enough. I just can't help wondering. Uh, where are you taking me? To my apartment first. Tex is there. Tex? Oh, that's wonderful. I would like to see her again. She was kind. After that, I'm not sure. The police, probably. You were kidnapped, weren't you? Oui. On the Riviera last summer. I met Prince Erzama there. I thought he was horrible from the first. I had proof of it afterwards. Uh-huh. Have you got a brother named Louis? No. I'm an only child. Oh. Does the name uh, Louis Katz mean anything to you? Oh, the only Louis I ever knew was Louis Malbert. The wretch who tricked me so that I was kidnapped. Is he tall, dark, gray eyes, and slightly crooked mouth? Oh, but yes. Yes, that he is. We're talking about the same Louis. Oh, I... I don't understand. Well, it's a long story, honey. And this is no time to tell it. It's a car. It stops? Yeah, for one very good reason, not a gas. You know, that's strange. This is Louis's car, and there's not enough gas for a two-way trip. What will you do now? Well, I'll leave you here and go look for a phone. I'll call Tex, and she can bring my car out here and pick us up. She will leave me... You will leave me alone? You can have my gun for company. I won't be long. Oh, please don't be. I'm frightened. There's no need. You just sit tight. I'll be back as fast as I can. I trudged along up the road for half a mile before I found a house and an irate farmer in a nightshirt whose bad temper disappeared when I waved a couple of five spots under his nose. He eventually led me to the phone and I dialed my apartment. Tex? Oh, Nikki. Well, <laughs> Relax, honey. Everything's okay. Oh, thank heavens. I've been sitting here going quietly crazy. Now, I've got Marie with me, but we run out of gas. Will you bring the car out and pick us up? Oh, sure. Just give me the directions. Tex, what's the matter? Nikki, Nikki, the door's opening. There's somebody coming inside the apartment. Tex, are you all right? No, I... I... Tex! Uh... Tex! Hello! 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 Who's that? This is Haroon. We have your American girl. She is quite safe at the moment. She may have a headache when she wakes up, but it will pass. If you hurt her... Keep calm, Mr. Knight. No one will be hurt so long as you are sensible. What do you mean by that? It is quite simple. You have a girl. We have a girl. You want the one we have. We want the one you have. I don't get it. I think you do. We want 
worry to spray back. If you want to see your friend Tex alive, you will return to us the French girl. If not, Hassan is very anxious to practice some of his peculiar talents. Hello? Mr. Knight, are you still there? Yeah. I'm still here. The exchange will be made at nine tonight. You have my word that the American girl will not be harmed in any way before then. We will meet you at the crossroads on the main highway ten miles north of the house. Is that clear? It's clear. Till nine, then, Mr. Knight. I put the receiver down and just stood looking at it. I felt as though I'd been kicked in the stomach by a specially vicious mule. The thought of Tex and that dagger-happy Hassan was the stuff that nightmares were made of. Then I went back to the old farmer and found he had some spare petrol. I bought it from him, and half an hour later, the car was ready to move again. Then I told Marie what had happened. She sat staring ahead of her for a few minutes, then turned to me. Of course, Nikki. You must take me back. No. There must be another way. But they are very thorough. There will be no other way. I tell you, there must be. We, we can't just... <laughs> <laughs> have you gone mad? No, no, I, I just had an idea. Where do you think they'll take Tex? Back to the house, I suppose. If you were Haroon, where would be the last place you'd expect to find us, uh, you and me? Quiet. Oh, you mean go back to the house now? Why not? There's only Louis and Blanc, the guy from the gate. I think I can take care of them. Then we sit tight and wait for Haroon and Hassan to bring Tex along. They won't suspect a thing. They'll walk through the door straight into my gun. It is uh, very audacious. And that's the way wars are won, baby. Oh, very well. It is a better way than to surrender tamely. Oh, that's my girl. Hold on to your yashmak. Here we go. beside me, Marie. I'm trying, but my knee, oh, it hurts. Yeah, sure. If I ever have to get into this place again, I'm not going over that wall. I'll, I'll bring a couple of sticks of dynamite and blow it down. Oh, it's, it's very quiet. What yeah. is sound from the house? No. Be careful now. We're almost at the door. Still open. Is that not strange? Yeah. Come on, as quiet as you can. Welcome back, ah! Mr. Knight. <laughs> Don't move, Knight. When the girl gets a bullet, switch the light on Blanc. Well, <laughs> looks like we got a reception committee. Exactly, Mr. Knight. Drop your gun, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we counted on your being a clever man, Mr. Knight. If you had not been, we might have been in trouble. But we had to have a clever man, one who would react the right way, and we got you. React the right way? So the whole thing was a plant, huh? Yes, Mr. Knight, the whole thing. A perfectly planned trap. A chess game in excelsis, with you as the pawn. What's the next move? <laughs> the next move is to wait, Mr. Knight. For the prince to arrive. The prince? Oh, but of course, Haroon is the prince now. Precisely. And he will hand you over to the police for the murder of his brother. Brown Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation Carter Brown. It 
was beginning to make sense. Crazy nightmarish sense, but sense. Right from the start, I hadn't been Nicky Knight the dashing private eye. I'd been Nicky Knight the dumb puppet with every move planned for me. Even this last one, returning to the house with Marie Despray, figuring it to be a surprise twist. Only the twist was on me, with a gun pointed at me by Louis Katz and the pleasant prospect of being handed over to the cops for the murder of Prince Al Zaman. Ronk, lead the girl away. You know where to put her. I'm sorry, Marie. I guess they're calling a tune. You're very wise, Mr. Knight, to try nothing foolish. I know when I've been outsmarted, Louis. Not only outsmarted, Mr. Knight, outplanned, outmaneuvered, outthought. Yeah, I was picked as the fall guy from the beginning, wasn't I? From the moment Haroon got his brother over here to the States on the pretext of urgent oil business. Haroon, who's your boss, of course, was getting tired of playing second fiddle to Al Zaman and planned to get rid of him. Get rid of him here in the States instead of on his own home ground. Correct. So Haroon engages me to protect a harem that's already protected. And then you come around with a story about your sister. Even when I beat it out of the house with Tex, you and Haroon weren't worried. You knew I'd have found out from Tex that Marie was in the house and that I'd come straight to you. Which you did, Mr. Knight. Yeah, and played right into your hands for the murder of Al Zaman. Back I come with you and Fatso gets it, with me all set to take the rap. The only slip-up was with you, Louie. You couldn't know that I'd been tipped off about you by the house stick at the hotel. But I hadn't figured it all then. I was just suspicious of you. That's why I tapped you on the skull and beat it with Marie. But you have come back, Mr. Knight. Yeah, you even worked that out right. While I was getting Marie out of the way, Haroon and Hassan were carefully collecting texts. Hassan is Haroon's man, too, like you. And then after the phone call proposing the quid pro quo, or, or more accurately, the girl for girl, you figured I'd come straight back here, hoping to surprise you. You waited for me, and here I am. <laughs> like a good little pawn, going from square to square, exactly as anticipated. Yeah, the perfect pawn. <laughs> Which is about to be taken. You heard that car? That will be His Highness Haroon, the new prince with the police. Goodbye, Mr. Knight. It's been fun playing with you. Yeah, they had it worked out to a T. T for tombstone with my name on it. Oh, there's something very depressing about sitting in a cell swearing at yourself for a sucker. And that was how I spent the time all that night and next morning. That and thinking about Tex. Worrying if she was all right. And then round about midday, I was taken out of the cell and driven to a downtown office where a gray-haired guy sat behind a desk with a slim, efficient-looking character next to him. Take a chair, Mr. Knight. And what is this? Who are you? My name doesn't matter. This gentleman is Mr. Wilde. Hello. Uh, first of all, please accept my apologies for having kept you in that cell so long, but when your statement came to us, we had to investigate, and that takes time. I don't get it. You will when I tell you that we checked your story about Marie to spray and found it to be true. Oh, you did, huh? That's nice. Don't play tough, Knight. This isn't the time or the place for it. It's all right, Wilde. Mr. Knight can't be blamed for feeling a little sore. Oh, a little? But I suggest you don't say any more, Mr. Knight, till I put you in the picture. An international picture. Okay, okay. It's sorry. mostly concerned with Prince Al Zaman and his country's oil. As you probably know, that oil is extremely valuable to us, and incidentally to France. For a long time, the United States and Britain have advocated that Al Zaman should be deposed, but France has remained firm. As long as the oil came out of the country, they weren't worried with what went on inside. There's a democratic party within the country. It's been fostered for some time, and it's ready to take power. We could assist them to do that, bloodlessly, and now is the time with Al Zaman dead. But, of course, the French must agree. Now, wait a minute, the French... You're getting it now, aren't you? It's important that Mr. Spray must be found alive. Yeah. The indignation of the French people when they learn what happened to her will swing their government to our way of thinking. Yeah, I can see that. Now, our big problem is to find Mr. Spray. Have you any idea where she would be? Yeah, sure, somewhere in the house. It's an old place. There'd, uh, there'd be a cellar. They'd probably put text there as well. Oh, yes. I'd forgotten about the other girl. I hadn't. Hmm. As soon as Haroon even thinks we're suspicious, he will undoubtedly murder the Despray girl or both of them. That's the tricky part. Mr. Wilde here is from the FBI, but I can't use him or his men any more than I dare send a squad of police with tear gas and Tommy guns into the place. It would be signing the French girl's death warrant. Looks like a one-man job. And I'm the one man. Why, Mr. Knight? Because I know the house. He's right, sir. Look, here's an idea. Take me back to headquarters, book me for murder, and let the press get all the pictures they want. When Haroon sees that in the papers, he'll feel safe again. Then pull out all the cops at the house, and tomorrow night let me out of a side door in the jail. It's not bad, sir. It could work. Yes, well, I suppose it could. It's a risk, but on the other hand, I can't think of any better scheme. Very well, Mr. Knight. That's how we'll do it. Who 
okay, you guys. Keep it quiet. All right, now we got over the wall. Nicky, this is where you're on your own. Yeah, me and my 32. I've got another gun for you. Here. Hey, what's this, a six-inch howitzer? It's a rocket gun. You've got an emergency, you point it out the window and you pull the trigger. We'll see the rocket, all right. Uh -huh. All right, thanks. The best place to carry it is in your sock. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> Just hope it doesn't go off and leave me minus three toes. Uh, we'll fan out and watch for your signal. If it doesn't come within 20 minutes, we'll come in anyway. Good luck, kid. Well, thanks again. So long. For the third time now, I crept up to the back door. For the third time now, it was unlocked. These characters obviously didn't believe in guarding their rear. I was halfway across the kitchen when I heard voices. I looked around for a place to hide. There was a broom cupboard built into the wall. I got in with the brooms and pulled the door too, leaving just a crack to see through. A second later, the light was switched on and Haroon and my old pal Louie came in. So in a week, Louis, we shall leave the United States. I return home to take up my rightful position. While Mr. Knight remains to die for the murder of your brother. <laughs> a sacrifice in honor of the new prince. Eh? What about the two young ladies? Well, I'm about to take their food to the miners. The team has prepared the tray. Good food, I see. Excellent. I don't like thin women. Return to me in the library, Louis, when you have finished. We have other plans to make. I watched Louis pick up the tray and disappear through a door I'd never seen before. It looked like part of the paneling when it was closed. I gave him a minute or so and then headed after him. The door opened on a flight of steps leading down. I'd been right about the cellar. Here's your meal. Eat up. His Highness Prince Haroon prefers women who are well filled. <laughs> I'd like to fill him with arsenic. Or even lead, honey. Night! Which means the long sleep for you. I told Marie you'd find us. We're not out of here yet, Tex, baby. Get back to Marie and keep down on the floor, both of you. This will bring the rest of them here like hornets. All right, Nicky. Down on the floor, Marie, quick! It will not help you, Mr. Knight. Fire low, Hassan, to floor level. Hassan, the machine gun you see, Mr. Knight. Against that, you have no chance. No? Oh, that takes care of Hassan and his Tommy gun. Now you're on your own, your highness. Come on down and demonstrate how brave a prince can be. <laughs> Not good enough, Haroon. What's the matter? Too scared to come down? Huh. <laughs> no, Mr. Knight. Not scared now since your gun is empty. I always waste my time. Mr. Knight is now. Is it? As he came down the steps, I remember the rocket gun in my sock. I grabbed for it and pressed the trigger. A ruin was practically on top of me when it hit him. When I came to think of it, he didn't stay a prince for long. Later that day, I was back in the office of the gray-haired guy. Congratulations, Knight. You did a magnificent job. I'll just pin the medal above the heart, General, and I'll go home. <laughs> With both Al's a man and Haroon out of the way, that line of succession is gone forever. And we feel confident that a much more democratic regime will take its place. The people should erect a statue in your honor, but they <laughs> probably won't. <laughs> just tell me one thing. Who exactly are you? Oh, let's just say that I'm connected with the State Department. My job is connected with what happens in other countries. You know, the uh, things you don't read about in the newspapers. Well, of course. Of course I'm dumb. Espionage, huh? Yes, that's the ticket. Uh, you know, if you were interested, uh, I could use a man like you. Well, uh, it's very kind of you, but no thanks. I, I'll stick to a nice, quiet racket like the uh, private eye business. <laughs> well, it hasn't been so quiet these last few days, has it? No, but it's uh, going to be much quieter for the next few days. You see, uh, there's someone back at my apartment who'll uh, see to that. <laughs> I 
you know, Nicky? Yeah. There were times when I just couldn't believe I'd ever sit in an American apartment again and hear some real American music again. With a real American man again, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although, you know, those, um, those Eastern guys have one idea that's not bad. Mm -hmm. What's that? A harem. I think it's a wonderful idea. Oh? Sure, you, you get tired of a brunette, so you pick a blonde. You get tired of a blonde, and you uh, pick a redhead. Uh, no. No, you, you um, want to rewrite it. You get tired of a certain brunette, and you pick up prussic acid in your morning coffee. I never drink morning coffee. You will that morning. <laughs> Honey, I was only kidding. I love you, Tex. I love you, Nicky. Enough to marry me? Nikki, you've got yourself a one-woman harem for life. That takes care of Nikki Knight. His nightmare's over, or it's just starting, depending how you look at it. Well, I'll be back to bring you another of my books. The next one's called Destiny, Danger, the story of an English undercover man who didn't stay undercover enough. So this is Carter Brown saying so long for now. Be seeing you. In Nightmare for Night, you heard June Salter as Tex, while as Nicky Knight, you heard our star... John Bushell. The Carter Brown Mystery Theatre, based on the best-selling novels by Carter Brown, is dramatised and directed by Morris Travers for Grace Gibson Radio Productions. Lepanto by G. K. Chesterton for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 10 War and Conflict This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Wallace Lepanto by G. K. Chesterton for the LibriVox Coffee Break Collection 10 War and Conflict White founts falling in the courts of the sun, And the soldan of Byzantium is smiling as they run. There is laughter like the fountains, In that face of all men feared. It stirs the forest darkness, The darkness of his beard. It curls the blood-red crescent, The crescent of his lips. For the inmost sea of all the earth is shaken with his ships. They have dared the white republics up the capes of Italy. They have dashed the Adriatic round the lion of the sea. And the Pope has cast his arms abroad for agony and loss, And called the kings of Christendom for swords about the cross. The cold queen of England is looking in the glass. The shadow of the Valois is yawning of the mass. From evening isles fantastical rings faint the Spanish gun, And the lord upon the golden horn is laughing in the sun, Dim drums throbbing in the hills half heard, Where only on a nameless throne a crownless prince has stirred, Where, risen from a doubtful seat and half-attainted stall, The last knight of Europe takes weapons from the wall, the last and lingering troubadour to whom the bird has sung, that once went singing southward when all the world was young. In that enormous silence, tiny and unafraid, comes up along a winding road the noise of the crusade. Strong gongs groaning as the guns boom far, Don John of Austria is going to the wall. Stiff flags straining in the night blasts cold, In the gloom black purple, in the glint old gold. Torchlight crimson on the copper kettle drums, Then the tuckets, then the trumpets, then the cannons, and he comes. Don John laughing in the brave beard curled, 
spurning of his stirrups like the thrones of all the world, holding his head up for a flag of all the free. Love light of Spain, hurrah, death light of Africa, Don John of Austria is riding to the sea. Mahound is in his paradise above the evening star. Don John of Austria is going to the war. He moves a mighty turban on the timeless Huri's knees, his turban that is woven of the sunsets and the seas. He shakes the peacock gardens as he rises from his ease, and he strides among the treetops, and is taller than the trees, and his voice through all the garden is a thunder, sent to bring black as rail and Ariel and Ammon on the wing, giants in the genii, multiplex of wing and eye, whose strong obedience broke the sky when Solomon was king. They rush in red and purple from the red clouds of the morn, from the temples where the yellow gods shut up their eyes in scorn. They rise in green robes roaring from the green hells of the sea, where fallen skies and evil hues and eyeless creatures be. On them the sea vows cluster and the grey sea forests curl, splashed with a splendid sickness, the sickness of the pearl. They swell in sapphire smoke out of the blue cracks of the ground. They gather and they wonder and give worship to Mahand. And he saith, Break up the mountains where the hermit folk can hide, And sift the red and silver sands, Lest bone of saint abide. And chase the giaurus flying night and day, Not giving rest, for that which was our trouble Comes again out of the west. We have set the seal of Solomon, on all things under sun, of knowledge, and of sorrow, and endurance of things done. But a noise is in the mountains, in the mountains, and I know the voice that shook our palaces four hundred years ago. It is he that saith not kismet, it is he that knows not fate, it is Richard, it is Raymond, it is Godfrey at the gate. It is he whose loss is laughter when he counts the wager worth. Put down your feet upon him, that our peace be on the earth. For he heard drums groaning and he heard guns jar. Don John of Austria is going to the war. Sudden and still, hurrah, bolt from Iberia. Don John of Austria is gone by Alcala. St. Michael's on his mountain in the sea roads of the north. Don John of Austria is girt and going forth, where the grey seas glitter and the sharp tides shift, and the sea folk labour and the red sails lift. He shakes his lance of iron and he claps his wings of stone. The noise is gone through Normandy, the noise is gone alone. The north is full of tangled things and texts and aching eyes, and dead is all the innocence of anger and surprise. And Christian killeth Christian in a narrow, dusty room, And Christian dreadeth Christ that hath a newer face of doom, And Christian hateth Mary that God kissed in Galilee. But Don John of Austria is riding to the sea, Don John calling through the blast and the eclipse, Crying with the trumpet, with the trumpet of his lips, Trumpet that saith, Ha! Domino Gloria! Don John of Austria is shouting to the ships. King Philip's in his closet, with the fleece about his neck. Don John of Austria is armed upon the deck. The walls are hung with velvet that is black and soft as sin, and little dwarfs creep out of it, and little dwarfs creep in. He holds a crystal phial that has colours like the moon. He touches, and it tingles, and he trembles very soon. And his face is as a fungus of a leprous white and grey, like plants in the high houses that are shuttered from the day, and death is in the file, and the end of noble work. But Don John of Austria has fired upon the Turk, Don John's hunting and his hounds have bayed, booms away past Italy the rumour of his raid. Gun upon gun, ha ha, gun upon gun, hurrah, Don John of Austria has loosed the cannonade. The Pope was in his chapel before day or battle broke, Don John of Austria is hidden in the smoke. The hidden room in man's house where God sits all the year, The secret window whence the world looks small and very dear. He sees as in a mirror on the monstrous twilight sea, 
the crescent of his cruel ships whose name is mystery they fling great shadows forwards making cross and castle dark they veil the plumed lions on the galleys of st mark and above the ships are palaces of brown black-bearded chiefs and below the ships are prisons where with multitudinous griefs christian captives sick and sunless all a labouring race repines like a race in sunken cities like a nation in the mines they are lost like slaves that sweat and in the skies of morning hung the stairways of the tallest gods when tyranny was young they are countless voiceless hopeless as those fallen or fleeing on before the high king's horses in the granite of babylon and many a one grows witless in his quiet room in hell where a yellow face looks inward through the lattice of his cell and he finds his god forgotten and he seeks no more a sign but don john of austria has burst the battle line don john pounding from the slaughter painted poop purpling all the ocean like a bloody pirate's sloop scarlet running over on the silvers and the golds breaking of the hatches up and bursting of the holds thronging of the thousands up that labour under sea white for bliss and blind for sun and stunned for liberty vivat hispania domino gloria don john of austria has set his people free cervantes on his galley sets the sword back in the sheaf don john of austria rides homeward with a reef and he sees across a weary land a straddling road in spain up which a lean and foolish knight for ever rides in vain and he smiles but not a sultan's smile and settles back the blade but don john of austria rides home from the crusade end of lepanto by g k chesterton for the librivox coffee break collection 10 war and conflict Tonight, Columbia brings you as guest star, Hollywood's genial character actor, Stuart Irwin. The story is by the author of The Thin Man and the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell Hammett, one of America's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Stuart Irwin plays for us a pleasant, easy-going assistant chief of police in a small town who, to everyone's surprise, was instrumental in solving a murder. We trust that with this tale we shall keep you in... Suspense. For suspense tonight, CBS presents Stuart Irwin in Two Sharp Knives by Dashiell Hammett. Shortly after 2 a.m., a poker game had just broken up at Ben Camdeley's, the doctor coroner of Deerwood City. Scott Anderson, Deerwood's chief of police, and Wally Shane, his assistant, were standing. Where are we heading for, Scott? Let's walk across the street, Wally. Railroad station. Gee, aren't you afraid of the excitement, Chief? Don't you think that watching the 211 come in is apt to be too much for your blood pressure? Well, if it is, Wally, you can always carry on. You've been a pretty good imitation of an assistant to me for some time now. Yeah? Yeah. If anything happens to me, you'd be the chief. Don't worry. It won't be any harder for you to fool the public as chief. Hi, Elmer. Uh, howdy, Scott. Uh, hi, hello, Wally. Kind of late for you boys to be around, ain't it? No, I don't know. We sort of figured we'd put the town to bed tonight. 
How's the 211? On time? Right on the nose. She ought to be blowing for the bend in just about three seconds now. Yep. What'd I tell you? It's her now. Expecting anyone on her, Scott? No, I'm around not expecting anyone. Well, and I just thought we'd come over and watch you come in, that's all. You know, Elmer, you never can tell who might get off, though. Dick Turpin, Henry Morgan, Jesse James, Dick, Jack the Ripper, or six officers of Murder Incorporated, or even your Aunt Gussie. I guess you're right, Wally. Well, here she be. Pardon me, James, but I gotta be rolling the wagon out to the baggage car. Well, I can't complain. I can't complain, Cap. Well, maybe you can, Elmer, but I sure can if you hold us up with that freight there. You got much more? Nope. This is the last piece now. There you are, Cap. All done. Okay. See you tomorrow, Elmer. Hey, Scott. Do you see what I see? I mean, do I see the man who just got off that train? The answer is yes. Well, he's a ringer for the guy we got a picture of. That is the guy. Well, then, what do we do now? We take him, Wally. My car's at the corner of the alley. Well, but Scott... We'll tail him up the street. Okay, Scott. There he goes now, over toward the taxi stand. Come on. Let's follow him. Hello, Farman. Huh? Oh, I... I don't believe You're Mr. I... Farman, aren't you? Yes, I am. Philadelphia? Yes. I'm Scott Anderson, Chief of Police. What? Chief of... What's happened to her? Happened to who? Oh, oh no, you don't. No. Let me go. Oh, no. You think you can pull that sort of stuff okay. with me? You're oh, very let me much get a crack at that let mug. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute, Hold gentlemen. Hold it, Well, Furman? Well, I... I am sorry. For a moment there, I thought you weren't really a policeman. Thanks. Nice to know I look almost human. Yes, it... It was silly of me. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, let's get going now before anything else happens. Okay, Furman, get in the car. I'll drive, Scott. Any go. I'll, uh, are you taking me to police headquarters? That's right. What for? Philadelphia. I, uh, I don't think I understand. You understand that you're wanted in Philadelphia for murder, don't you? Murder? Why, that's ridiculous. That's... Who told you that? Well, it's a cinch he didn't make it up. But wait, uh, there must be... Take it easy state. now. Just wait till we get down to headquarters. And I'll show you what I mean. Now then, here's the circular on Lester Furman. It was sent out by the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. Take a look at it. Oh, yes. $1,500 reward for the arrest and conviction of Lester Furman, alias Lloyd Fields, alias J.D. Carpenter, for the... for the murder of Paul Frank Dunlap in Philadelphia on December 8th, 1942. Well... It's a lie. You're Furman, aren't you? Oh, yes, but... That's your picture on the circular, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, but I... Well, I... Scott, I see you and Wally got Furman, huh? Oh, hello, George. Uh, you lucky stiffs. Now you two split a grand and a half reward. Uh, i never seen nothing like it. You know, if it ain't vacations in New York at the city's expense, it's reward, though. Judge, someday, if you don't remember you're the jailer around here, not the D.A., Hmm? You're going to be wearing your teeth on the outside of your lips, and I'll be the guys who arrange them that way. Savvy? Uh, just because you caught a guy who's hot in Philadelphia. It's a lie. It's a frame-up. You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. I never killed anybody. I won't be framed. Take it I easy, won't be framed. Furman. Take it easy. You're wasting your breath on us. Save it for the Philadelphia police. We're just holding you for them. But it's not the police. It's the Trans-America Please Detective... turn you over to the Philadelphia police. Mr. Anderson, I... I... Well... Then, then there's nothing I can do now? There's nothing any of us can do till morning. We'll have to search you now, then we won't bother you anymore till they come for you. But I... Well, then you look through his bag. I'll see what he's got in his pockets. Okay, Scott. Well, all he's got on him are some business cards, a few letters, a hundred and... $160, a book of checks in the Philadelphia bank, and a few odds and ends. 
What's with the bag, Wally? Not much. A couple of changes of clothes, some toilet articles, and... Oh, here's a thirty-eight, Loaded. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Okay, put those things in what I got in the vault. All right, George. You can take Prime now and lock them up. This is the most ridiculous Come thing Come on, I... darling. Come on. We ain't had nobody in our little hoosco for three days running. Hey, yeah. Uh, you'll have it all to yourself. Just like a suite of the Ritz. But I... Go on, in you go. I tell you, 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 you're making a mistake. I demand to be allowed to get in touch with my lawyer. I... Hey, how about you boys cutting me in on a little of that blood money, huh? No, sure, George, sure. I'll forget all about that two and a half you've been owing me for three mm-hmm. months. Make Fremen as comfortable as you can, George. Take good care of him. He's valuable, huh? Yeah, now, if it was some bum that didn't mean a nickel to you... George, any day now, I'm going to forget that your uncle is county chairman and throw you back in the gutter just to see how high he'll bounce. Remember that. Oh, Scott, I, I didn't mean nothing. That's I... all, George. Never mind the rest. I'm going home now. If anything's urgent, I can reach there. But get this. I don't want to be disturbed. Unless it is urgent. Hello. Hello. Scott. This is Wally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Wally, what, what, what time is it? It's five after six in the morning, and you'd better come right down, Scott. That fellow Furman's hung himself. What? Furman hung himself? Yep, by his belt, from a window bar. Dead in a mackerel. I'll be right in, Wally. Phone Doc Camsley and tell him I'll pick him up on my way down. No doctor's going to do Furman any good, Scott. Well, it won't hurt to have him looked at. You'd better phone the chronic court at Douglasville, too, and file a routine report. Already did that. And what's more, hold on to your seat. The DA's on his way over, in person. The DA? I'll be there before you hang up, Wally. Come on in, Chief. Ted Carroll, the DA, is here, and he's plenty hot under the collar. What's he burning about? Oh, he's just mad, running up quite a phone bill on us, too. Been calling Philadelphia every couple of minutes since he got here. What kept you so long? Ah, I couldn't get my car started. All right, let's go in and see the old buzzard. Oh, Ted? Listen, Scott, what is all this? Oh, what? There's some funny business going on here. What's funny about it? Man hangs himself. Just another case of suicide. Sure, it was suicide. But I just telephoned Transamerica. Dug a guy out of bed there. And he said they'd never sent out circulars on Furman. Didn't know about any murder he was wanted for. All they could tell me about him was he used to be a client of theirs. You don't know what to say, Ted. I don't either. Oh, a fine chief of police you are. What on earth kept you so long? Car store. Came as quick as I could. Ain't you so crabby, Ted? Nothing. I guess it's just the district attorney. Ah, oh, now, come, come, gentlemen. Nobody'd know you two are staunch admirers of each other. <laughs> okay, Wally. Tell me. What do you make of it? Well, there's plenty wrong, Scott. First, that Trans-America thing. They never send out circulars about Furman. And now, get this. I talked to the Philly police just before you came in. There wasn't even any Paul Frank Dunlap murdered. There wasn't? No. What did you get out of Furman before you let him hang himself? That he was innocent. Didn't you grill him? Didn't you find out what he was doing in town? Wally, didn't you? What for? He admitted he was Furman. The description fitted him. The photograph was him. The Trans-America Detective Agency is supposed to be on the level, ain't it? Philadelphia wanted Furman. We didn't. But Scott... I sure, Ted. If I'd have known he was going to hang himself. Yeah, but then if your aunt wore pants, you'd be your uncle. You said Furman had been a client of Transamerica. Did they tell you what the job they did for him was? His wife left him a couple of years ago, and he had them hunting for her for five or six months. But they never found her. They're sending a man up here tonight to look things over. Yeah, huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going out and grab a quick bite. But I might as well tell you, Scott... There's going to be trouble over this. I know that, Ted. There usually is when somebody dies in a jail cell. Well, so what's become of that 1,500 fish now, huh, Scott? What happened there last night, George? Nothing. 
swam and hung himself. Did you find him? Uh huh. Wally took a look in here to see how things was before he went off duty, and he found him. You're asleep, I suppose. Well, uh, I was catching a nap, I guess, but everybody does that sometimes, Scott. Even Wally sometimes when he comes in off his beat between rounds. Yeah, but I always wake up when the phone rings or anything. Oh, sure. Well, suppose I had been awake. Can't hear a guy hanging himself, can you? Did Doc Cantley say how long Furman had been dead? Yeah, he done it about 5 o'clock, he said he guessed. Oh, you want to look at the remains, Scott? They're over at Fritz's undertaking parlor. Not now. Hey, and speaking of Furman, what are you going to tell the guys from Transamerica when they show up here tonight? <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, uh, they, they told me I'd find you here. You're Chief Anderson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Carl Reesing, assistant manager of the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. This is Mr. Wheelock, who was Lester Furman's personal attorney. Glad to know you, Mr. Reesing. How do you do, Mr. Wheelock? Hmm. How do you do? I know you gentlemen are already in possession of most of the details concerning Mr. Furman from the time he arrived in Deerwood until the time of his death. But perhaps you don't know that the police of most towns in our corner of the state have also received copies of this same reward circular. Take a look at it. Oh. Oh. I must say this circular is an excellent forgery. You're sure it's a forgery, Mr. Reesing? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. But it's an excellent forgery. Tell me, Mr. Wheelock, was Mr. Furman a native Philadelphian? Oh, my, yes. He was a well-known, respectable, and prosperous citizen of Philadelphia. Married, I believe? In 1934, he married a 22-year-old girl named Ethel Bryan, daughter of a Philadelphia family. And the Furman's had a child? Isn't that right, Mr. Wheeler? Yes, born in 1936, but the child lived only a few months. Mr. Furman's wife disappeared after the child's death. Well, what year was it that she disappeared? Mr. Reesing should remember that. His agency worked on the matter. Oh, I remember it well. Uh, Mrs. Furman disappeared in 1937. We never heard anything of her again, although Furman spent a lot of money trying to locate her. What did she look like, Mr. Reesing? Oh, in just a moment. Uh, I have a picture of her right here in my briefcase. Uh, uh, here it is. Quite pretty, isn't she? If you care for that type. I see what you mean, Mr. Wheeler. Well, she's attractive as that. Judging by this photo, I'd say that she was a small-featured, pretty blonde, with a weak mouth and large, somewhat staring eyes. Oh, that's an accurate enough description, all right. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a copy made of that photograph, Mr. Reesing. Oh, you can keep that one if you like. It's one that we had made up at Transamerica. Uh, her description's on the back. Thanks. Did uh, Furman have a divorce, sir? No, sir. He was a lot in love with her, and he seemed to think that the child's dying made her a little screwy so that she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Mr. Wheelock? That is my belief, Mr. Reesing. Uh, you said Furman had money, Mr. Wheelock. Uh, about how much did he have? And who gets it? I should say his estate will amount to perhaps a half a million dollars left in its entirety to his wife. Mm -hmm. It's quite a handy sum for anyone to have, I'd say. Mr. Wheeler, everything shows that somebody framed Furman into the Daywood jail. That frame-up drove him to suicide. But there has to be something else. A lot else. Well, then, what are you going to do? I'm going across the street to the undertaking parlor and have a look at Furman. I'll see you later. Hello, Doc. Hi, Scott. I figured you'd come over here to the undertakers pretty soon. What's in your mind, Doc? Uh, let's uh, get out of this crowd. I, I want to tell you something. I just got rid of two guys in my office. Let's go back there. Suits me. Two of those uh, bruises uh, showed, Scott. What bruises? Furman. Well, up under the hair, there were there were two bruises. Why didn't you tell me? I'm telling you now, Scott. We weren't here when I made my examination. This is the first time I've seen you since then. Why didn't you spill the stuff about Furman's bruises when you were testifying at the inquest, Ben? Uh, I'm a friend of yours. Do I want to put you in a spot where people can say you drove this champ to suicide by third degreeing him too rough? Ah, you're nuts. How bad was Furman's head? Well, Scott, uh, that didn't kill him, if that's what you mean. 
Yeah, there's nothing the matter with his skull. Just a couple of bruises nobody had noticed, and unless they parted the hair. I thought you ought to know, though. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yes, who is it? This is Fritz, the undertaker. Listen, Scott, there's a couple of ladies over here that want to take a look at Furman. Is it all right? Who are they? I don't know them. Strangers. What do they want to see him for? I don't know. Wait a minute. Can I please see him? Why do you want to see him? Well, I... I'm... his wife. Furman's wife? Yes. Oh, 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 certainly. I'll be right over. So long, Ben. I've got to go back to the undertakers. So long, Scott. Hey, Scott. What do you want, Wally? I want to talk to you a minute. Over here where we won't be seen. Okay, what is it? A couple of dames came into Fritz's undertaking place just as I was leaving. One of them's Hotshaw Randall, a babe with a record as long as your arm. She's one of that mob you had me working on in New York last summer. Does she know you? Sure, but not by my right name. She thinks I'm a Detroit rum runner. I mean, did she recognize you just now? I don't think she saw me. Anyway, she didn't give me a tumble. You don't know the other one? No, she's a blonde, kind of pretty. Okay, Wally. Stick around a while, but stay out of sight. Maybe I'll be bringing these dolls back with me. Whatever you say, Chief. Oh, there you are, Scott. I wondered when you were coming. Uh, this is Mrs. Furman, and this is Mrs. Crowder. How do you do? Hiya, Chief. They just saw the body. Mrs. Crowder? I thought your name was Randall. What do you care, Chief? I'm not hurting your town any. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Chief. You city slickers, I'm the town whittler. Thank you for letting me see him. It's all right, Mrs. Furman. But I'll have to ask you and your friends some questions. So if you'll just come across the street to headquarters, we'll get on with the routine. <laughs> ask any questions, I want to tell you something. Mrs. Furman, your husband didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. Murdered? Ah, oh, Chief, we got alibis. We were in New York, and we can prove it. And you're likely to get a chance, Tim. What brought you down here, anyway? Murdered? Well, who's got a better right to come down here? She was still his wife, wasn't she? She's got a right to look out for her own interests, hasn't she? Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminds me of something. Uh, excuse me a second. Uh, I've got to make a phone call in the next room. Officer Hamill speaking. This is Scott. Yes? Is Wally around? No, he's not here. He said you told him to keep out of sight. I'll find him for you, though. Right. I tell Wally I want him to go to New York tonight. Send Mason home to get some sleep. He'll have to take over Wally's night trick. Oh. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, do you think I had, had anything to do with Lester's, with his death? I don't know, Mrs. Furman. I know he was killed. I also know he left you something like half a million. Wow, dollars? Dollars. All right, Chief. Let's stop clowning. The kid here didn't have a thing to do with whatever you think happened. No? No. We read about Lester Furman committing suicide in yesterday morning's paper. And about there being something funny about it. And I persuaded her she ought to come down to deal with Anderson. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt Lester. I left him because I wanted to leave him. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt him for, for money or anything else. Had I wanted money from him, I would only have had to ask him for it. That's the truth, Chief. For years I've been telling Ethel she was a chump not to tap him. But she never would. I wouldn't have hurt him. Why'd you leave him then? Oh, I don't know how to say it. The way we lived wasn't the way I wanted to live. I wanted... Oh, I don't know what. Anyway, after the baby died, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, yeah, Hammer? Hmm? You gave Wally the message? Yes, yes, I want him to go to New York tonight. Okay, where is he? Home? He is home, huh? Okay, thanks. This is, uh, Foreman. Uh, this circular that got your husband in the jail. Did you ever see that picture before? No. Well, that's... It can't be. It, it's a snapshot I have. It's an enlargement of it. Who else has one? Well, nobody that I know of. 
I don't think anyone else could have one. You still got yours? Yes. I don't remember whether I've seen it recently. It's with some old papers and things. But I must have it. Well, Mrs. Furman, it's stuff like that that's got to be checked up. Neither of us can dodge it. Now, there's two ways we can play it. Yes. Mrs. Furman, I can hold you here on suspicion until I've had time to investigate things. Or I can send one of my men with you to check up in New York. Yes. I'm willing to do that if you'll speed things up by helping them all you can. If you'll promise you won't try any tricks. I promise. I'm as anxious as you All right. Not... All right. How'd you come down? We drove down. We got a great big car. That's my car, see? That big green job across the street. Yeah. yeah. And my man can ride back with you, but no funny business. Oh, I don't worry, Chief. Come on. We're going to see Wally Shane. The man is going to drive to New York with you. Wally? Who is it? Scott, Wally. Come in. Ladies first. Harry. Harry. Ethel. No, you don't. No, you don't. No use reaching with that gun, Wally. Already got you covered. I guess you win, Scott. Yeah, I guess I do. Come along back to headquarters with me like a good little boy. Wally, you're under arrest for murder. two dames going into Fritz's. Then when I was ducking out of sight, I ran into you, and I was afraid you'd take me over there with you, so I had to tell you one of them knew me, figuring you'd want to keep me undercover for a little while anyhow, long enough for me to get out of town. Why didn't you get out, Wally? Well, I dropped in home to pick up a couple of things before I scram, and that phone call of Hamill's catches me, and, and I fall for it. You see, Scott, I figured you're not on to me yet, and are going to send me back to New York to see what dope I can get out of the dames. Well, you fooled me, brother. And I thought you'd fall for that. Then you didn't just stumble into all this accidentally, did you? No, I didn't, Wally. I figured Furman had to be murdered by a copper. To know reward circulars well enough to make a good job of forging one. Incidentally, who printed that Furman circular for you, Wally? Now, I'm not dragging anyone in with me. It was only a poor mug that needed dough. Okay, Wally. You see, I knew only a copper would be sure enough of the routine to know how things would be handled. Only one of my coppers would be able to walk in a Furman's cell, bang him across the head, and string him up on the... Those bruises showed, you know, Wally. They did? I guess I should have wrapped two towels around that blackjack. Oh, gee, Scott. I seem to have slipped up on a lot of things. So that narrows it down to my coppers, and... Well, you told me you knew the Randall woman. There it was. Only I figured you were working with him. What got you like this, Wally? Same thing that gets most saps into jams, a yen for easy dough. And I was in New York, see, Scott, working that Dutton job for you, palling around with big shot racketeers, passing for one of them, and... Yes? Well, I got to figuring that my work takes more brains than theirs, and they're taking in big money, and I'm working for coffee and cakes. That kind of stuff gets you, Scott. Anyway, it got me. Mm-hmm. Then I ran into this Ethel Furman, and she goes for me like a house of fire. I liked her, too, see, so that's dandy. But one night, she tells me about how much dough her husband's got and how he feels about her, and I get to thinking... Thinking what? I think she's nuts enough about me to marry me. So I get to thinking, suppose he died and left her his role. Mm-hmm. I see. So I run down to Philly a couple of afternoons and look Furman up, and everything looks fine. I took my time working out the details, meanwhile writing to her through a fellow in Detroit. Go on. Finish one. Well, I decided to do it. I sent those circulars out to a lot of places, not wanting to point too much to this one. And then when I was ready, I phoned Furman, telling him to come to Deerwood Hotel that night. And sometime before the next night, he'd hear from his wife, Ethel. I knew he'd fall for any trap that was baited with her. Only I guess I'm not as sharp as I thought I was, Scott. Maybe you are, Wally. Maybe you are. That doesn't always help. Old man Camsley, 
Ben's father used to have a saying, to a sharp knife comes a tough steak. Well, it's how you did it, Wally. I always liked you. I know you did, Scott. I was counting on that. Dashiell Hammett's Two Sharp Knives, starring Stuart Irwin. Tonight's story of... Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next week, suspense will not be heard because of a special holiday broadcast. Columbia's review of the events of the year. Twelve crowded months, which has been scheduled. On the following Tuesday, January 5th, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Why not? I have all the makings of the perfect chauvinistic male. But on this occasion... If Madam would care to remain seated, her chauffeur will open the door for her. Thank you, James. Uh, the name is Michael, Madam. Would you give me your hand, Madam, so that I can help you out? My hand, Michael? Such old world courtesy. Ah! Put me down, Mike! Put me down! I'm carrying you over the threshold. Oh, but not over your shoulder. My, my mother will see us. Aunt Claire will see Mike, put me down. I don't care who the hell sees us. Oh. Uh, Aunt Claire, uh, we, we, we've returned. Indeed you have, and you look happy enough. If I were you, Michael, I'd keep her over my shoulder and take her up to her mother's room. Oh, it's very good of you to have us both come to live here. All part of the marriage settlement, Aunt Claire. Anyway, it's a big lonely house. We couldn't leave Doris's invalid mother on her own. And somebody's got to protect you from that KGB colonel, Uncle Balake. Oh, I think the less said about him, the better. And Doris, while on that subject, I don't think we ought to let your mother know what happened in Germany that your fine husband gets himself involved with British intelligence. I was merely looking for an old friend. Who just happened to be one of their missing agents. All right, so they use my cover as a British businessman. Used is the operative word. They used us all. Oh, by the way, Robson, head of the German section, offered me a job in intelligence. I hope you refused. Of course. But you were tempted. Well, when I just married a comely wife, I'd hate to be chasing around foreign parts. I wonder if they've got your name on file now. Haywood, Michael, textile exporter, brackets. Trustworthy and unafraid, in brackets. I wouldn't put anything past that lot. And before I answer the phone, let me just wish for the both of you that the Lord will send his blessings on your union and that you may live happily in this house and see your children's children. Oh, a lovely blessing, I always think. Thank you, Aunt Claire. Uh, but the telephone... Let's not answer it. Well, it may be Claire's Russian boyfriend ringing all the way from Moscow. Heavens above! A Russian bear of a man passes the time of day with me, and you've the nerve to insinuate that I'm interested in him. What would a respectable Irish widow see in a pagan fellow like him? <laughs> Though I must admit he has some human virtues. With a few more like friend Balakev, the KGB will almost have a respectable image. I think he fancied you, Aunt Claire. I'd be having none of that impertinence from you, young lady. And I don't want the colonel mentioned to your mother. Oh, I'd best answer that thing. Four three nine two six three five. 
Yes, this is Mr. Haywood's residence. Oh, here we go. Well, I, I, I just see if he's at home. Oh, who's calling? Renshaw with an E. Oh, do you know anybody called Renshaw? Yes. Not offhand. Yes. Hold on. I have a feeling it's them again. I'll not keep you a moment. Them? The intelligence people. Tell Aunt Claire to say we haven't arrived back yet. You'll only ring again. I'll take it, Claire. Oh, one moment. Uh, Mr. Haywood's here now. Hello, Haywood. My name is Renshaw. Tom Renshaw. We have a mutual friend, James Robson. He's in our continental section. The German agency? Yes, the German branch of it. Well, I don't think I wish to do any more business with our mutual friends, so you can save yourself further phone calls. Good day. Uh, Mr. Haywood, you don't know yet what our offer is. It's a second honeymoon for you and your wife. Oh, what's the catch? None, whatever. Just want to say thank you for your assistance in Germany. A holiday on the department. It's them right enough, Doris. They just want to say thank you by sending us on a second honeymoon. They're trying to involve you again. That's what I think. Let me have a word with him. I'll put him off. Hello. This is Mrs. Haywood speaking. Ah, it really Mrs. is most kind of you, Mr. Renshaw, with an E. But we've only this minute just returned from our honeymoon, so under the circumstances, I You really... sound like a happy bride, Mrs. Haywood, and after all your husband went through... Well, it is very, very kind of you to offer, but we couldn't possibly accept without my Aunt Claire coming with us and without a full-time companion for my invalid mother. But thank you all the same. I'm sure we can give you the extra facilities. You can? The third ticket will be awaiting you at Manchester Airport. In fact, you can have seats on tomorrow's flight. An agency will send a qualified nursing companion for you to interview within the hour, Mrs. Hale. But, but, um, I, I'll have to speak with my husband. He's offering us flights tomorrow for you, me, and Aunt Claire. And there'll be someone to look after Mother. An offer you can't refuse? But, Mike... Oh, and uh, whilst you're making all the decisions, you might ask him where they booked for our second honeymoon. <sighs> what flight are we booked on, Mr. Renshaw? The Rome flight. Rome? The Eternal City, Mrs. Haywood. So perfect for a honeymoon. At 10.30 a.m., flight B.E. 759. Oh, I was half hoping we'd miss it. I wonder why you took so long packing. Ah, where's Renshaw? Good morning to you. Ah. I have the tickets, and if you'll just let me have your baggage, I'll try to expedite matters. How well organised you are, Renshaw. Now, if you ladies will go ahead, we'll bring the hand luggage. Oh, thank you, Michael. I I'll keep me hold, door, Doris. I'm me car to get in such like that. Huh? Well, Renshaw, now you can tell me what this honeymoon really entails. The department is simply providing a second honeymoon for yourself and your good wife. Let's say certain parties were very pleased with what you accomplished in Germany. We found our agent. <laughs> and your cover as a textile merchant was impeccable. Because that's what I am. A textile merchant. Even if I am tricked into helping the department whilst on a perfectly legitimate business trip. Of course. Be that as it may, I'm not so naive to believe that a man like Robson is doing this out of the kindness of his heart. I don't think we need bring personalities into this. Though now you mention it, there is just a small favour you might do. How did I guess? It is for the department. I never for a moment thought it would be for the National Health Service, but run down though it may be. There's no danger involved, just a relaxing few weeks in Rome doing as you please. Not the way you were involved in Germany. You mean I'm not a clay pigeon this time? All we want you to do is keep an eye on someone in the same line of business as yourself. A cotton manufacturer called Gerald Picton. Picton Mills, Framwell? Yes. Oh, what's he doing? Selling red banners to China? <laughs> it's just that we'd like to know where he goes and who he meets. We don't want you to go around tracking him, but just keep an eye on him occasionally. There'll be a check at the end of it. What could be easier? Sounds as simple as dying. All you've got to do is make Picton's acquaintance. Haywood! Hey, Gerald Picton! What are you doing on your way to Rome? After some sunshine. You appear to be occupying our seats, old boy. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Gerald. So we are. We're further along. Oh, no. Stay. My secretary, Jean, prefers to be by the window. By the way, uh, I heard you just got married. Yes. Second honeymoon. My wife, Doris. Hello. And Mrs. Claire O'Connell. How do you do? Uh, hello there. <laughs> and uh, this is my secretary, Jean Tyler, and a Swedish friend of mine, Sven Bast. How do you do? I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Haywood. Uh, Mrs. Hayward? Uh, look, uh, we must have a get-together in Rome. Good idea. See you in Rome. I 
I'm glad we decided to share a taxi. You know, Hayward, I feel I live more dangerously riding around Rome in these things than I do driving my racing car full out. You've had rather a good season. I picked up a few trophies on one or two circuits. Now, uh, how well do you know Rome? Not very well. You can be our guide. May I say you've made an excellent choice. I come here regularly. We're now outside the walls of the city of ancient Rome. Those bells we just heard are from the Church of St. Paul's. Now, I'd love to see inside that church, Mr. Picton, so I would. Unfortunately, Mrs. O'Connell, the little painting shop I was telling Hayward about is in the opposite direction. I was hoping our guide to Rome would show us St. Peter's and not a shop in a back street. Will you look at those Latin drivers, Doris? Taking that bend without slowing down. Oh, as for that one... And I'll not believe me eyes. Oh, yes, Aunt Claire, what is it? I, I, I thought I saw... Yes? Oh, it must be my imagination playing tricks with me. You look a little pale, Mrs O'Connor. Uh, just a little exhausted with the heat, Mr Bass. Well, then at the next cafe you must sit down and have a cool drink with me, whilst the others visit the modern art shop. And uh, please, call Miss Van. I will show you St Peter's, for I know Rome well. I live here. Ah, buongiorno, Mr. Picton. <laughs> Very well, are you? Fine, Enzo, fine. I've been telling my friends of the excellent pictures you sell. Oh, it's very kind, signore. Uh, what can I show you on this visit? Uh, have you any more pictures by the artist who always paints a cat in the corner? Uh, Ghetto. That is the name for cat. And that is the name the artist goes by. You don't happen to know his real name? Ah, no, signore. A friend bring his painting, and I pay what Gatto asks. <laughs> he is becoming, um, how do you say in English, uh, everybody want him? Uh, much sought uh, fashionable. Ah, see, si, oh. see. Si. Uh, no, I have one here, a view of Rome and the Tiber. Uh, how does that strike you? Oh, that's absolutely marvellous. Don't you think so, Hayward? It's quite colourful. A liberal amount of paint used. Well, you can feel the warmth of the sun. And look at those dark, mysterious shadows. There's depth, dimension. Mm, it has something about it, Mike. You can buy it for me if it isn't too expensive. A memento of our second honeymoon. Sorry to disappoint you, Mrs. Hayward, but I'm buying this one. Oh, forgive us, Gerald. We hadn't realised that you were uh, interested. <laughs> I, I, uh, I buy all, Gatto. I've instructed Enzo here to get me all he can. But this, this one was in the window. It would still not be for sale unless I did not want it. <laughs> Isn't that correct, Enzo? Uh, See, si, uh, that is so, Mr. Picton. I will have it delivered to your hotel. Uh, the Colony Flaminia, as you should. It is. I'll be in again to argue the price and see what else you've got, Enzo. Well, I'm not an art expert, but I thought Gutter's view of Rome and the Tiber... Looks like hasty, out of perspective, botched-up painting. Here's your bathrobe. Or have I put it too strongly? Well, on the right of the painting was, I suppose, the Quirinal, but the King's Palace looked in a twist. Skew whip, awry and slanting. So you noticed it? I'm noticing you too in your bathrobe. Fresh, flushed, inviting. Mm. Mm. <laughs> We're going to miss dinner. Who cares? They're expecting us, Picton, his secretary and Aunt Claire. They wonder why we haven't gone down. Mm, mm. Let them wonder. No, no, Mike Hayward. We really should be going down to dinner. Mm. Will you stop kissing me whilst I'm trying to talk to you? And mm. stop! <laughs> Blast! And who could it be? Oh, it may stop ringing. Oh, I suppose we better answer. Room 178? Is that you, Hayward? Yes. Sven Bart here. Have you eaten? Um, well, no. Um, we were wondering whether to have something sent up to our room. Oh, I have a better idea. Come to my apartment. I have a wonderful meal waiting for you. Via della Consolidazione, number 23. It's only a few minutes by taxi from your hotel at well, this time of night. It's very kind of you, but um, we are rather tired. Not used to the Roman sunshine, you know. Oh, that I cannot believe, Haywood. Only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, no? Mm. You are a robust race. I am sure a little sunshine has not made you too tired to appreciate a superb Italian meal. I'm sorry, but... Um... But nothing, Haywood. You must come. We have something to discuss. Have we? I want to hear about Germany. I understand you were working for British intelligence. If not working, then 
helping. Am I correct? Oh, and who told you that? <laughs> if you would like to know, why not come and have dinner? There are other interesting things I wish to speak with you about. I'll come alone. And leave your newly wedded wife in the hotel? Oh, how ungallant, Haywood. No, the invitation is to both of you. 23 Via della Contilidazione, Haywood. It appears we have a dining out engagement. You're trying to be casual, which makes me suspect that you're worried. Isn't it about time you told me what French you had to say at the airport this morning? You seem to go into a conspiratorial huddle. Was it so obvious? Well, not to most people, but to your wife and former secretary, it was obvious you were cooking something up between you. Well, our second honeymoon offer has a small print clause. I'd have been amazed if it hadn't. Well? I have to keep an eye on Picton. Whatever for? Renshaw didn't say. And if I'd insisted on an explanation, it would only have been a pack of lies. Well, so who rang us up to invite us out to dinner? Sven Bust. Oh, he was quite charming to Aunt Claire this afternoon. I think at one stage he was trying to get her on her own. Was he now? <laughs> Don't make it sound so sinister. Well, this isn't purely a social invitation. You see, Sven Bast knows what we were doing in Germany. So, this is the Via della Consolidazione. Let's pretend we're two young lovers. 23 is the next one. Oh, well. Ah, oh, that looks like the bell. I rather fancy you should sing as you press. Mm, we must probably get a bucket of water thrown over us. I think someone's coming now. No, well, must have been imagining things. I thought I heard something then. Instead of footsteps or whatever they were carrying on, they've stopped abruptly. That was my impression too. Mike? Yes, what is it? The key's there. It's been left in the lock. Must have forgotten to take it out. Or he might have left it there for us. It could also have been left in by someone who is... Too much in a hurry. Somebody we might have disturbed. Well, let's see if it's the right key. I would prefer the gentleman to go first on this occasion. Well, we agreed till death us do part. Ah, a marble hall. Dark and cool at midday. But too dark, eerie, and cold for late evening. Seems to be a light coming from the room on the far right. Mr. Bast? Mr. Bast? Anyone home? I think we ought to leave it for another time. He must have been suddenly been called away. Well, he would have rung us. He might have done that and found we'd already left the hotel. Then he would have waited for us. The speed our taxi driver travelled, he would have been lucky to be out of the house before we arrived. I think I'd better take a look. Incredible. Take a look at this. What is it? A table laid for a banquet. Meats, roasts, cold chickens and sauces. A mountain of fruit. Wine. Like an ancient Roman banquet. And our Swedish gentleman, Sven Bast, does himself well. Let's toast to absent friends and then dig in. Doris. Do you think he's trying to scare us in some way? I don't know what to make of it. Is there a cellar under the house? I'm going to take a look. Well, don't leave me in this room. There's a, a distinct smell of cigar smoke. Someone's been here and recently. I wish I could find the lights for the hall. Oh, there's something here. Well, that seems to be the switch, but nothing happens. I think the lights are on the marble pillars, Mike. Those flaming torch things. No, Doris, stay where you are. <gasps> There's a body with a wire around its neck hanging from the light bracket. Oh, I feel I'm going to faint. Mike, come back, please. It's Sven Burst. Yeah, I'm going to get him down. He might still be alive. He's quite dead. One shoe's untied and has come off. Oh, Mike. Uh, Let's get away from here, please, Mike. Wait. There's something inside the shoe. Canvas. A torn strip of canvas. Let's get away while we can. We must call the police. Someone seems to have already called them. Ah, 
Mr. and Mrs. Haywood, I followed you out on a later plane. Renshaw, I ought to strangle you. But I brought red roses and champagne. The roses are lovely, though. I thought as we were in Rome, perhaps the Italian version of champagne. Excellent year. Doris, a glass for you. Haywood, thanks. And I've just the toast for the occasion. May we not rot long in an Italian jail. Why, what's the matter? Or perhaps we should drink to the memory of Sven Bast. Sven Bast of the Swede in Victim's Body? Yes. May he rest in peace. And that's how we found him. Strangled by a wire. Hmm. You say he rang you and said he knew about Germany? Yes. But how could he? I don't know. Mm. The police will soon trace you through the taxi driver. Why did you run out of the rear cellar door? Why? Because I didn't want to spend my first night of my Rome honeymoon explaining to the Italian police how I came to find the body. I also thought I might catch a glimpse of the person who had left the place that same way shortly before us. And did you? No. Mm. You say you let down the body? Yes. There might have been a glimmer of life left, for all I knew. I had to see. Quite. But in the process, you would have left your fingerprints on the wire and perhaps the marble pillar. And then again, it would already have been on the door handle and key. And you, Doris, did you touch anything? Spoon, one or two silver dish covers. Yes, yeah, so they'll trace you to this hotel via the taxi driver and then match both sets of fingerprints. Hmm. Well, we could fly you out of Rome, but that would convince the police you killed him and they could apply for an extradition warrant. Some second honeymoon. Which, in turn, would lead to awkward questions in the house. It looks, Haywood, as if you'll have to stay. In this bridal suite or in jail? Depends how much of your story the Italian priest choose to believe. But um, we'll do all we can for you, old man. What about his old woman? Ah, when it comes to affairs of the heart, these Italians are very understanding. I'm sure they'll put you in the cell together. Love in a hut with water and a crust. Anyway... What are you worried about? Contrary to general opinion, I believe marriages thrive on hardship. It's when the couple becomes affluent, the troubles start. Who are you ringing? I'm doing what every upright British citizen would do after discovering a crime. Informing the police. They contacted the consulate and the consul asked me to assist in the matter. They are on honeymoon and were invited by Mr. Bast. They found him dead and panicked, not knowing what to do. But they knew enough to ring the consulate for assistance. These are the two? Yes. No, oh, forgive me, Mr. and Mrs. Haywood. This is Captain Averno of the Rome Police. You had a very disturbing experience, I understand. Very disturbing, to say the least. And how did you come to know Mr. Bast? They travelled on the same plane. Sven Bast was in the company of a friend of Haywood's. Please let Mr. Haywood answer the questions. Is that correct, Mr. Haywood? Yes. And who was this mutual friend, Mr. Haywood? Uh, Mr. Picton. We're in the same line of business, textiles. And that is how you come to know him? Yes. Did he come with you to Roma? Yes, he's staying at this hotel. And that is convenient for us all, isn't it? But let us talk about tonight. Mr. Bast rang you and invited you to dinner. You went along and found him dead. How did you get in? The key was in the door. You let yourself in? We waited and... And you unlocked the door and walked inside? Yes. You're not a timid man, then, Mr. Haywood? I suppose not. You have the nerve to walk into a strange house, but when you find the horse dead, you suddenly turn into a frightened rabbit and run. Surely it would have been easier to stay. I realize now we should have done that. Instead, we, um, we rang the British consul. Three and a half hours later, senor. We walked back. Yet you took a taxi to get there. Why didn't you call a taxi to take you back to the hotel or to a consul official? Was it that you were trying to be inconspicuous? Perhaps that was in our minds. We're also not used to the Italian phone. But you managed to call the consul? What number did you ring that time of night? We have a night number in the book, Captain. Please, Mr. Renshaw. You are quite capable of answering such simple questions. Perhaps it was my being with him, Captain Averno. My husband was afraid for me. He's very protective. <laughs> of course, Signora. I understand now. 
In such circumstances, a husband would want to spare his wife distress and discomfort. Yes, you're very kind and understanding, Captain. And I will commend your handling of this unfortunate affair in my report, Captain. Pray, Procedure. But I would like Mr. and Mrs. Haywood to remain in Roma until the investigations are complete. And there may be other questions to be answered. Of course. Good night, Signora. Signor. Well, that wasn't too painful, was it? You handled it quite well, Haywood. Now the piece of gone, we'll take a look at that canvas strip of painting you found. Hmm. Under the cat, there is a word. Tiber. Yes, it's a view of the Tiber. No, the word is not Tiber. You sure? Yes, quite sure. After the R. You know, there are more letters, and they're clear and distinct. I-U-S. Tiberius. Mm, Tiberius Caesar. What do you know of him? Mm, he retired to Capri, indulged in sexual extravagances, together with every sort of cruelty. He used to strangle his victims. Their children as well, if I remember my history correctly. Did you say strangle? Yes, Doris. I wonder. Now, could there be a connection between strangling Sven Bast and the name Tiberius? I was wondering the same thing. I was also remembering a rhyme written about him. It went, You cruel monster, I'll be damned I will, if even your own mother loves you still. But Tiberius has been dead many a long year. A.D. 37. You must have a very good memory for dates, Renshaw. I have, as a matter of fact. Well, do I get the impression you've been reading up on Tiberius? By chance, I have been doing a little research on that period. By chance? I also read classics at Oxford, Haywood. And you've been carrying the date of Tiberius' death around with you since your happy student days. Well, well. My memory was refreshed by my recent research. How convenient. How timely. Isn't it? Well, I must not interrupt the honeymoon. I'll be around, and anything you find out, I shall pass back to London. On my way out, I'll have another bottle of wine sent up. Good night. You could cheerfully strangle Renshaw. He was too quick to spot the name Tiberius. Could it be some kind of code? Oh, I hardly think it was a signature of the Emperor Tiberius. The paint would have had time to dry in 1900-odd years. Was the paint wet? Well, no, but it looked like it hadn't been dry for very long. Doris, I'm glad I married a wife who can detect such details. And has the ability to climb over a wall train vine after rushing out of the back doors of Roman cellars as the police enter the house by the front door. Which goes to show that being a wife can be more interesting than going out to work as a secretary. Scared? Well, since you've asked, I think that once again we are deliberately being drawn into things, and the people involving us know far more about what's going on than they're prepared to say. Mm. I would agree with that assessment. Then why don't we get out? Would you hurt Captain Averno? We have to remain. It could take months. Then we'll have a prolonged honeymoon at the expense of the British taxpayer. No wonder Parliament is not allowed to study their account estimates. What about Aunt Claire? Well, no reason for her to worry. Aunt Claire? Good grief! What about Aunt Claire? Oh, she's been wondering what happened to us. She was expecting us down to dinner. We went out without leaving a word. Well, she presumed we had an early night. But suppose she rang the suite and found no answer. She'd be worried. Oh, I'll give her a ring. At this time? It's nine minutes to two in the morning. If Aunt Claire has been worrying, I'm quite sure she'll prefer to know we're back safe and sound. Then at least she can sleep peacefully. But you might waken her out of a deep sleep. A deep, uneasy sleep. It will only waken her up for a couple of minutes and then she can return to her slumbers. One, seven, nine. Make sure you dial the right number. I have done. Oh, that's probably your aunt at the door now. Come in. Uh, Mr. Renshaw ordered wine for you. Oh, such a thoughtful person. Uh, just leave it there. Do you wish me to serve the wine? No, thanks. We'll manage. Very good, sir. It's funny. There's no reply. So, she's in the sleep of the just. She must hear the phone. Even if she's taken a sleeping pill? Aunt Claire does not take sleeping pills or any other pills for your information. Good for her. Oh, don't be so frivolous, Mike. We should have told her where we were going. Good job we didn't, as it turned out. Look, I'll ring reception and see if she's changed rooms. Or if that's the right number. Well, thank you for a sensible suggestion for once. Mr. 
reception. Ah, uh, Haywood, uh, 178 here. Uh, could you tell me if Mrs. Clara Connell is still in room 179? I see. Uh, one moment, please. The key is here, so she has not come back yet. Not come back? Do you know where she went? No, signori. There was a call for her about an hour after you left. She must have gone out immediately afterwards. Did the caller leave a name? No, signore, no name. He asked for Mrs. Claire O'Connell, and we had a page. That is why I remember so clearly. The gentleman spoke English, but I'm sure he was not an Englishman. More coffee? No, thanks. Oh. I know what it's going to be like waiting up for our teenage daughters. Your Aunt Claire saw something that gave her quite a shock this afternoon. Yesterday afternoon, now. Oh, shouldn't we call the police or Renshaw? I think I'll check her room first. Empty. The night you all laid out on the bed. I'll just check the bathroom. No. You left the balcony window open. Stand back! Look out! Mike! 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 Oh, that hurts. I'm only bathing your head with cotton wool and warm water. <sighs> I remember rushing through the French window. Well, his first blow missed and shattered the glass. The sudden noise of it made me hesitate. Well, that's when he hit you. He caught you once in the stomach and then on the head, knocking you back into the room. Oh. Did he only hit me twice? Well, the hotel had fallen in on me. Well, they look like karate blows. You've a terrible bruise on the left side of your head. Oh. What happened to our visitor? He had a rope fastened to the balustrade of the balcony and he let himself down the side of the wall. But he dropped this. Hmm? Let me see. Oh. Book matches. Chat Noir. That's the name of the nightclub. And a black cat. Like the one on the painting. A replica, you might say. But look on the back. A coin portrait of a Roman emperor. And if my convent Latin is correct, the inscription records heir of the deified Augustus Tiberius. And below is the reverse side, presumably. Tiberius triumphant riding in his chariot. But what has the long-dead Tiberius to do with the Rome of today and British intelligence? There's someone at the door. Hey, switch off the light. So, good night, my Irish lady. You see, comrade Boris Balakiev is a gentleman and escorts Claire O'Connell to the very door of her own. And that's as far as you will escort me, comrade Balakiev. Atheism and moral decline go together, and I have none of either. <laughs> Good night to you. Aunt Claire! The luck of! Oh, We've been worried to death, Aunt Claire. Where have you been? I thought I'd seen a ghost this afternoon. I never expected to find the KGB in Rome. But it must have been Colonel Balak if I saw, because after dinner the phone rang and it was the heathen himself. A trade union delegation was having a reception. I thought an Irish representative was called for, and after seeing your aunt... How did you know where she was staying? Uh, I had her followed. <laughs> By a member of your trade delegation, no doubt. Good lady, some of your virtues are rubbing off on me. It was one of my men. There, I speak the truth and feel good. <laughs> what are you doing in Rome, Colonel? I am a member of a trade union delegation. Fostering goodwill? You might call it that... You're not studying ancient history at the same time. Ah, the Caesars. One particular Caesar. His system of government allowed for no rivals. He was a fine example of a totalitarian ruler. Which goes to show how history repeats itself. Continually. Ah, uh, you English, you think that your two-party system is the answer to the world's problems. But ancient Rome had two parties also. So you think it was better under the rule of the Caesars? Benevolent dictatorship is the most efficient form of government. But how often are dictators benevolent? After Augustus came Tiberius. Would it be fair to assume that you do not approve of the doings of Tiberius then, Colonel Balakov? You would be correct to make such an assumption. 
You could also say that I disapprove of all things done under the name of Tiberius at all times. <laughs> but I have kept Mrs. O'Connell out late. And so, my good Irish lady, when you pray those beads tonight, say one for me. And how would you be knowing that I always say my rosary before getting into bed? In these days of electronic devices, nothing seems sacred. <laughs> Don't forget. Just one. Offered for me, Claire O'Connell. You'll need more than one, Colonel Balakir. <laughs> With that, I would not disagree. <laughs> well, I'd keep you in mind. Well, who knows? I could be eternally grateful. In my line of business, it's so difficult getting insurance for this world. Never mind for the hereafter. <laughs> oh, it's quite a hectic day. The understatement of our honeymoon. Hey. Move over, make room for your bruised and battered husband. Oh, darling, you really do look badly bruised. Ah, but you are fair and you are comely. Isn't the quotation black and comely, darling? I really have no colour prejudices in the matter, Doris. Oh. Oh, why the hell do we have to have a room with a phone? We'll tear the damn thing from its socket. Well, the dominant male. Well, go on then, throw it out through the window. Oh, have somebody knocking at the door. Oh. Hello. Burst my eardrums, old boy. Renshaw? I'll burst more than your eardrums. Do you know what time it is? If it's very important, I wouldn't have rung. Look, tell me at breakfast. Can't do that, old man. Why not? You could both be in danger. If I were you, I'd get out of bed without switching on the light and go over to the door. When you hear four knocks, di da di da it'll be me. But I would advise you still to make sure. Oh, who is it? Oh, do hang up or your fair and comely wife will be fast asleep. It's Renshaw. Hello? He says we're in danger. Oh, right he would. Again. Hello, are you there? Doris, wake up. I wouldn't bother too much about waking Doris. I'd make for the door. You see, I slipped a little something into that glass of wine I gave her earlier on. Now, wait by the door. Who is it? Renshaw. With an E. Enter Renshaw with an E. And you better have a good explanation for drugging my wife's drink. We have to get out of here. Others know you're working for us, so we want to keep you nice and safe for a few days. I thought if Doris were asleep, it would be easier, not as emotionally disturbing. Renshaw, I promise you I'm going to break your neck one of these days and toss you in the Tiber. Steady on, old boy, only doing my job. Uh, can you put a coat on your wife or something? I'll give you a hand getting her to the car. Here we go. Good evening, Haywood. And what brings James Robson, head of the German branch office, to Rome? I say, what's the matter with Doris? Renshaw drugged her. Hmm. Yes, Renshaw does enjoy the cloak and dagger stuff. But the drug is only of short duration. A stiff brandy should wake up the sleeping beauty. Um, you may wait in the car, Renshaw, but I... It may seem trivial and mundane to you, Robson, but men don't like having their wives drugged. Quite so. I will have words with Renshaw. You seem well acquainted with the drug used. Are you sure he wasn't doing it on your instructions? My dear fellow, do you think I would give such an order? Yes. Yes, well, I'll pour your wife a brandy. And uh, for you, Haywood, I have an excellent local wine. Not drugged, I trust. Now, why should I drug you when we're all going to a party? A party? Yes. Now, just uh, wet your wife's lips with this brandy, Haywood, and it should do the trick. <coughs> oh, darling. You see, Haywood, no ill effects whatsoever. Wake up, Doris. We're going to a party. <laughs> Chandois. Table for four, please. Uh, no, three. Um, Mr. Robson will not join us. Why is that? Uh, he's not one for going out in the early hours. <laughs> you mean he doesn't like to present the opposition with an easy target? Uh, perhaps. Uh, four at three, signore. Uh, thank you. Oh, uh, waiter, could I uh, have a packet of your special matches? I believe you have some with a portrait of Tiberius Caesar. Oh, I am afraid or not, sir. They have all been sold. We did not have very many of them. Well, isn't that rather costly, having a specially designed book match for the club and then only selling a few of them? 
Uh, I was thinking of the printing costs, for example. I will uh, pass on your comments to the manager, sir. Yeah, why not? Um, who, who's giving the party over there? Oh, that is another Englishman, sir. Uh, Mr. Picton. Picton? Has someone taken my name in vain? <laughs> Hayward! What are you doing here? I never expected to see you painted the town red on your second honeymoon. Or else I'd have invited you. Come on, come and join us. Doris, you look like a dozen. Now. Oh, I'm rather sleepy. Uh, you know my secretary, Jean. Uh, that's her next to the hefty fellow. Uh, yes, we met on the plane. But what's the matter? Well, the man she's with, I feel I've seen him before. Oh, he's an American, Harry Carlson. Does he live in Rome? Yes, buys and sells antiques. Oh, and is he interested in paintings too? <laughs> Carson, he's interested in everything. Uh, but come and join us. Waiter, where is scotch on the rocks? Big ones this time. Harry, haven't you had enough? The short answer is no. Harry, you'll have to be more sociable. We have three more guests. Mr. and Mrs. Hayward, friends of mine from England, and... Uh, Renshaw, with an E at the end. Tom Renshaw. <laughs> well, uh, come and have a drink, Tom. And mind if I do. Hell, where's the scotch? Patience, Harry, you've only just ordered. Yes, Harry, you're making a spectacle of yourself. So what? Who cares? I care, Harry. Jean, for goodness sake, what is there to get all head up about? The huh? amount you're drinking. This is the last one, understand? Dames. And don't call me a dame. Okay, Jean, okay. And Mr. Picton. I think you've had enough for one day, too. Oh, if my secretary says so. Secretaries have a way of saying such things and making you obey. Yeah, well, I need a drink to waken me up. Oh, I can hardly keep my eyes open. Uh, what brought you here if Doris is so sleepy? Renshaw. I thought when in Rome they ought to experience some of the Rome nightlife. Uh, quite right. Uh, here's the waiter. Uh, excuse me. Is there a Mr. Haywood in this party? I'm Haywood. Uh, there is a telephone call for you, Mr. Haywood. This way, please. Who can that be? Uh, perhaps it's Doris's Aunt Claire. She doesn't know we're here. Oh, uh, then again, she might She might have got the message. Uh, but we left at reception. Yes. Yes. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, we have put the call on this extension phone in this room. Uh, thank you. Hey, we're speaking. Hello? Hello? Waiter, the phone's dead. Where? The waiter has gone about his duties. Balakhev? The phone call was, uh, what is the word in English? Uh, a ruse. A ruse? It comes from the old French ruse to get out of the way, no? In English, it means a trick. Or a cunning scheme. Very appropriate to your English intelligence service. They are full of tricks and cunning schemes. For example, they have explained to you what they are trying to achieve here in Rome. Not fully. <laughs> Such wonderful English understatement. Not fully. Not at all, eh? That is, if I am any judge. You know nothing about what is going on. They are letting you provoke situations. They spread to catch the mackerel. But you could be eliminated, swallowed, like mackerel devouring whitebait, Haywood. I see you are a fisherman too, Balak. Ah, you English, you make light of everything and you take too many risks. You should first find out what your assignment involves and how dangerous it is. Is that what you wanted to get me alone for? To warn me? Yes, Haywood. I would not want you to come to grief for your aunt's sake. Mm, such consideration from a KGB colonel. Oh, have you not heard... We are trying to improve our image. <laughs> you see, I have already been influenced by your lightheartedness. Well, whatever your motives, thanks for the warning. Don't mention it, old boy. One of my weaknesses is liking people, fellow human beings. Mm, I can see Aunt Claire's influence, too. But in your line of business, liking people can be a great weakness. You, too, at the moment, are in this line of business, Haywood. Good night to you. Good night. Juan Haywood. Yes, Colonel? I think it has been put around by your superiors that you are in possession of a certain strip of painting. What? You see, they have not kept you informed. The left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. That is the whisper we picked up. I don't believe it. You will see. By the way, Haywood, have you been to Leningrad lately? Leningrad? 
What are you talking about? If anyone should ask you that question, you must say, I think St. Petersburg is much more romantic as a name. Now, I will wait here a little longer. You had better rejoin your party. Edward, here's your drink. Who was ringing you at this unearthly hour? No, no, just an old friend. Um, cheers. Uh, cheers. Uh, by the way, Mike, uh, you must meet one of the guests, Count Roberto Galateo. Galateo? Good evening, Mr. Hayward. Oh. It is a name that has become a proverbial in Italy. You see, one of my ancestors, some 400 years ago, wrote one of the world's lasting books on social behavior, Della Casa Galateo. For anyone whose manners are not what they should be, we say, Non conosce il Galateo. He does not know his Galateo. Uh, who? Ah, and this is your charming wife. I, Count Galateo, kiss your hand. A polite reprimand on manners can also be introduced with Monsignor de la Casa Dice. Ah. Monsignor de la Casa says... Quite so. You are an educated English lady, I see. My convent education took in de la Casa, but the title of the book Galateo was derived from the name of Galeazzo Florimonte, Bishop of Aquino. I remember Sister Elizabeth telling us about him. Such a rare flower of femininity, beauty, and intellect. Your flattery will not stop me disclosing the fact that the Della Casa was the author, and as the name Galateo was derived from the bishop, Della Casa met in Rome in the 16th century. I cannot be descended from the author. Or one of your ancestors did not write one of the lasting books on social behavior, Signore. <laughs> you see through my joke. But I am a count of sorts. I make my money by commerce. Uh, tell me, Mr. Haywood, what is your line of business? A textile. A textile? I also deal in them. There is some magnificent Italian material on the market now. I must show it to you. My firm is Fatorini Exports. Uh, here, on my business card, is my address. Oh, um, but I am going there now. Why not call on your way back to your hotel? I always keep a few bottles of excellent scotch in my office. Well, another time, perhaps. It is a little late, and uh, we have no car. Uh, uh, you, you do have a car, old man. Yes, what? indeed. I forgot to tell you. I've arranged for you to have one during your stay. Oh. I'll uh, have it brought round right away. Goes like a bomb, old boy. Roman sunshine, it's as good as new. No body rot, engine finely tuned. Who does it belong to? Me, old boy. Why did you have it brought down specially? <laughs> Just listen to that. You can hardly tell the engine's running. I'm impressed. The engine's in good condition. Why has all this been set up for me? Good question, old boy. You see, we wanted you to come here tonight because we thought someone might make you an offer. Why should they do that? Because of the strip of painting you found, perhaps. What was on the strip of painting? We're still having it tested. We don't know. Look, Renshaw, mm -hmm. I want to know what's going on. And I'm not getting involved in anything more until there's a thorough briefing. I'll pass your views on to Robson. It looks to me as if I'm being used as bait. A sprat to catch a mackerel. Who told you that? Someone in the club, as a matter of fact. Well, that's impossible. That... Then it's not true that I'm being used as bait. It's utter rubbish, Haywood. It's simply that Galateo deals in textiles. You might learn something about his premises. Oh. And why should I want to learn anything about his premises? He deals in so many things and tells so many stories. He obviously wants you to meet him. If you like, I'll come with you. I'll make myself comfortable in the boot. But uh, make sure you don't lock it. Uh, no one must see us together. Isn't that a danger you'll suffocate? No. Pity. The boot has had passengers before. Carried uh, all sorts of things. I bet it has. All right. I'll give Galateo about 20 minutes start, then. But the first thing I'm going to do is seeing Doris safely back to the hotel. Uh, not the hotel, old boy. We have a place for you. Mm. Both of you, a secluded villa. Does that mean you're not going to Fatterini Exports? It means I might or I might not have time to try out the car you're lending us. I'm glad you decided to come. Oh, by the way, I would lock your car. Many thieves about these days. And an English sports car is sure to attract their attentions. Very well. 
These doors, you pull this latch, and when you close it, the door's locked. That leaves only uh, the boot. Oh, there's nothing in the boot. Spare wheel? Tires? Uh, of course, it might be locked already. So it is. Remember to keep doors and boot locked always. I didn't think I had locked it, as a matter of fact. Well, you did. This way. As you can see, Mr. Haywood, none of your modern glass or concrete office for me, where the windows rattle every time a car or train goes past. These old buildings are cool and soundproof. We are here. Please, take a seat. Hmm. More sumptuous than I expected. Oh, quite deliberate. They come up the stairs, and then they are pleasantly surprised when they enter. Your paintings are superior to the faded posters on the stairs. There's your air conditioning. I like a little creature comfort. You uh, said you had some textiles to show me. Not really textiles, he would. Oh? More textile designs. We have an up-and-coming designer by the name of Gatto. Cat? Yes. Some of his paintings he signs with a cat. Not all of them? No, not all of them. His textile designing he does under another name. And what name is that, I wonder? I have a terrible memory for names. Have you, Mr. Galateo? Count Galateo, Mr. Hayward. Oh, I thought that was another of your jokes, uh, like the one about your ancestors. It is no joke. Neither is my visit here. I'm sure you didn't invite me to show me textiles. But I am interested in acquiring paintings by Gatto, especially if they're signed Tiberius. They can be very costly and dangerous paintings. You need capital and organization. And you have to know not only the right people, but the correct things to say. Such as? He would... Have you been in Leningrad lately? I think St. Petersburg is much more romantic as a name. If you will excuse me for one moment, Mr. Hayward, I have something that should interest you. This is a picture, although not very big, and therefore easier to handle. Here we are. I had it ready, just in case. I will stand it on my desk. And you can look at it from where you are. You don't trust me? I don't trust anyone, Haywood. Well, do you like it? What's it supposed to be? A good question, Haywood. I know what it shows. The foreground is a cobbled alley looking out on lovely olive groves with the sea below. Where is it? I'm not far from Capri, I think. Capri? You seem surprised. I was thinking of its connections with Caesar Tiberius. That was not the answer, Haywood. What do you mean? That the gun in my hand is of a very heavy caliber. Ideal for making hits. Where did I go wrong? Like there was an answer to my question about Leningrad, so there was at the mention of Capri. Do you intend to kill me? Anyone who has managed to breach our security has usually ended up... Strangled? Or with a knife in his back. Which is why I also carry one. Ah! Ah! Bravo, old boy. <sighs> Renshaw. That was jolly spectacular, Haywood. I arrived to see you leap through the air, kick the gun and knife out of his hands, and finish him off with two beautiful commando blows. <laughs> out like a light. But I suggest we get out of here before their reinforcements arrive. They have a Mercedes! They're trying to block the exit! That's it, Hayward. Drive like the devil's in hell one after you. They'll stop at nothing to get a painting back. Make for the river. And let's have some noise from the horns. I never thought I'd be so glad to see policemen. And Italian bobbies at that. A 
I'm sorry we have to separate you and your friend, Mr. Ewood. For a long time I've been wanting to get my hands on Renshaw. Now I'm looking forward to the interrogation. Cigarette? No, thanks. I don't smoke. Very wise. Being a captain of police as precious which encouraged smoking, no? If you say so. But how can I give up smoking when I have problems like you, Edward? Problems? I have to charge you with a dozen traffic offenses to start with. <laughs> I'll plead guilty. And what about the murder of Sven Bast? He had been murdered before we arrived. Or had you forgotten? By your side or by the other side, Edward? Now, that I don't know. Which almost sounds like the truth. But there is a story going around you were brought in by British intelligence. What better cover than a newly married pair of lovers, a businessman who married his charming secretary? Well, what was I allegedly brought in to do? What were Mr. and Mrs. Ewood brought in to do? Oh, no. She knows nothing about it. So you do. She's not involved in any way. English gallantry is not dead. It's the truth. I would like to believe you. I would hate to think of that charming Mrs. Edward spending a long time in our jails. She's done nothing. You're bluffing. Very well. I'm bluffing. I take your word for it that she has done nothing. You have to take my word. You've no evidence of the contrary. True, my friend. But I have a better charge. Better charge? One I can prove. Rubbish. Conspiracy to steal works of art is considered a very serious crime in my country. Conspiracy? The painting of the alleyway and the olive groves found in your car. Oh, you're not telling me that was a work of art. Every painting I've seen by Gatter seems out of perspective. Done in great taste, uh, Cover up. Cover up? Yes, one painting covering another and that of great value. The view through the alleyway covered up an old master stone from Milano three weeks ago. It is valued in excess of one million U.S. dollars. The going rate for that kind of theft is 20 to 30 years jail. Usually it is very difficult to prove unless you actually catch the thieves in possession of the works. In your case... You did just that. How convenient. That is what I was thinking, Mr. Edward. Suppose I tell you that I didn't steal it. That is what they all say. Only you would have to have a better answer still. Why? Because your fingerprints are on the frame. You obviously took a firm hold of it and left wonderfully clear impressions. Fingers, thumbs, palms are... Fingerprint experts are quite delighted. Mm. I bet they are. <laughs> so, I wait your explanation. You're quite sure you would not... Like a cigarette. I would be delighted to have a coffee with you, Claire O'Connell. I don't remember asking you. Oh, where is your Christian charity, Claire? Especially after going to morning mass. So, you're having me followed again, I see. Your race has survived Cromwell and famines, expulsions and persecutions. I would hate to see such a fine specimen like yourself. Pass away before your appointed time. <laughs> your Russian-Irish accent is out of this world, Colonel. <laughs> and so beautifully put, before me appointed time. <laughs> oh, bless you. Mm. But I have a guardian angel to look after me who will do a better job than both lots of you. Both lots of us? Hmm. Which lot is which lot? Sometimes it is very blurred. I'm not surprised the way you all carry on. Have a cup of coffee, now. There's a clean cup on the next table here. I just help myself and save the waiter's legs. <laughs> there, now. You like yours black and strong, as I recall. Thank you, Claire. But tell me, my favourite militant Christian, how do you know angels exist? Revelation. From end to end, Scripture is filled with them. And don't we know from our Lord's own words that every child has an angel to guard him? Ah, but you won't have read the New Testament, and neither the Old for that matter. I know the first Christians were very mindful of spirits they called guardian angels. And weren't the early Christians on very familiar terms with their guardian angels? When St. Peter escaped from prison, 
The Acts describe how the angel led him past the guards, how the iron gate leading to the city opened of its own accord. Mm, chapter 12, dear lady. You know, hmm. you've read it. Then. Well, as a former interrogator, I had to be widely read. Didn't Peter, realizing that the Lord had sent an angel to deliver him out of Herod's hands, go to the house of Mark's mother? He did. A girl called Rhoda came to answer when he knocked at the porch door, and she, recognizing Peter's voice, was too overjoyed to open the gate for him. She ran in and told them that Peter was standing at the gate. Thou art mad, they told her. But she insisted it was so, and they said... It must be his guardian angel. Meanwhile, Peter went on knocking. And why are you looking at me with your mouth wide open, Claire O'Connell? Ah, the devil can quote scripture. Ah, and I thought you were impressed. Perhaps I was. And perhaps I was a little uncharitable. After all, Saul the persecutor became Paul the apostle. Quite so. And many a Christian lady was married to a pagan husband. Why your sudden interest in things spiritual? <laughs> oh, if I didn't know you as a devious KGB colonel, I could almost mistake it for a proposal. <laughs> You're not suggesting that a militant Catholic and a militant communist get together, are you? Oh, that sort of ecumenism is ridiculous. Dialogue. That is the new word, dear lady. Indeed. And you'll be wanting more than dialogue with me, Colonel, judging by the twinkle in your eye. Uh, quite so. Oh, but, but it's impossible. It's out of the question. The pagans let their wives live according to their consciences. You yourself have quoted Lenin to me. He said it ought to be left to the individual to choose. Well, why don't you let him? Opiate of the people. Oh, that's a deformed Christianity. There are two great divisions in the universe. The world of spirits and the world of matter. It is one of the reasons for man's existence that he locks these two worlds together by belonging to both. To the one by his soul, to the other by his body. Not like two unrelated spheres, but as a figure of eight, with man on both sides of the joint. Mm -hmm. He should first be a man, then a saint, developing human virtues that make him a better person and a better citizen. Let us bring the conversation down to the more primitive earthly. Using the idiom of your corrupt capitalistic pop culture, I fancy you, Claire O'Connell, fine figure of a woman. Oh, you're a fine figure of a man yourself. But it's completely out of the question. Why? Russia and Ireland now have diplomatic relations. But you're not talking about diplomatic relations. I always believe a woman should follow her man and look after him. Ah, a man who has found a vigorous wife has found a rare treasure brought from distant shores. Bound to her in loving confidence, such a man will have no need of spoil. Content, not sorrow, she will bring to him as long as life lasts. The devil quote in scripture again. <laughs> Though I must admit you said it beautifully, and it fair turns me legs to jelly. I have a fine flat in Moscow. No. But why, no? Well, how could I get to morning mass in Moscow? I'm not one to compromise me faith. But, Claire... But nothing. As an interrogating persecutor, you studied scripture, and you obviously know quite a bit about theology. All right, I stopped persecuting. I stopped years ago. And as I said, I'm not one for compromises. There's more in heaven and earth... I am not asking for compromises. Oh, yes, you are. Do you know how I feel about the Mass? Claire, how can the wife of a KGB colonel go to Mass every day? I would only ask for a little uh, discretion. If you believe in the Eucharist, it would be illogical not to receive as often as possible. Well, I, I know people walk 20 miles to get to the Mass. I give up such intolerance. Ah, violence coming out now, is it? You are the violent race. I'd call it a fighting revolutionary spirit. <sighs> Now I know why the state of Ireland is what it has been for more than 800 years, a source of grave anxiety to England. 
fanaticism. And what you're saying sounds like pagan revisionism, so you can kindly take back your offer of cohabitation. Right now, Claire O'Connell, if you were the last woman on earth, I would take a vow of celibacy. Well, I'm glad something will make you relinquish your plans for world domination. Good day! Ah, bush Samoyer! Ah, goodbye! You've spilled the coffee! Ah. And goodbye stands for God be with you, Colonel! Mr. Ewood, has interrogation time come round again? This case becomes hardly more interesting, Ewood. Why, what else are you thinking of charging me with? You see, you always imagine the worst. I'm not without reason, but... But what? You're going to be released. Released? I'm glad that you two are surprised. You must have some very influential friends, Mr. Raywood. My instructions from the minister himself are that you can be allowed to go free. Well, not exactly free, but as long as you remain in Roma and Ripotelli, you need not be held in prison. It must be because you're so romantic, Captain Averno. Simpatico. Or susceptible to persuasion of all kinds. You're not happy with the decision? I would be happier to see you jailed for a very long time, Haywood. And I will do my best to bring it about. Well, thanks for telling me. This way. How are Italian prisons these days? Lacking certain creature comforts. We thought we'd better get you out. You see, your Aunt Claire's had a bust-up with Balakif. It could complicate matters. You brought her in deliberately, didn't you? You knew Balakif was here in Rome. We've taken her to the villa. She's with Doris. We have also explained to Doris about your... Uh, difficulties. Pity I missed the explanation, Robson. That would have been quite something. Apparently she was sitting up waiting for you to return. But once again I wriggled obediently as good bait should and did your bidding instead. That, for the record, was the very last time. Yes, I quite right to feel annoyed and somewhat let down, Haywood. Somewhat let down? You put me in a position where someone tries to kill me with gun and knife? I'm invited out to dinner to find my host dangling by his neck on a wire. I'm knocked unconscious in the hotel and I'm shot at in the street. I also face a 20 to 30 year jail sentence for stealing works of art. I did say you're quite right to feel annoyed. The understatement of the decade. And I forgot to mention this was a honeymoon holiday provided by you out of gratitude. Mm. Well, things have been rather hectic, Haywood. Again, Robson, I can only stand open-mouthed in amazement at your remarkable gift for understatement. You've used us, Robson, and you haven't even taken the trouble to put us in the picture. Very true, what you say, and I think you're entitled to an explanation. How much of it will be true and how much pure fabrication? All the truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, but first you need a drink, Haywood. Now, I have another bottle of good local wine. Well, Barbera d'Alba, a state bottle. It's a, a grape grown widely on the hillsides from Asti to Cuneo. And I'm told the Barbera grape produces Piedmont's most popular red wine. This one is as fresh and crisp as a young Beaujolais, meant to be drunk young and cool. I had a little ice. I uh, thought I'd open it only when you arrived, in case you might be tempted to think I'd tampered with it. How could anyone suspect you of such things, Robson? Anyway, what's have stopped you opening it and then recorking? I'd never do that to wine, Haywood. Well, in other words, you have greater regard for wine than for people. I do believe you're trying to provoke me, Haywood. Mm. Uh, stiff cork. Uh, there. <clears throat> now, to allay your suspicions, I'll uh, drink mine first. Cheers. Suspicion is a terrible thing. Which brings me to the subject of the present assignment. The code name is Fine Caesar. Well, who is Caesar? That, my dear fellow, is the key to the whole problem. You see, works of art and antiques have been stolen on a vast scale over recent months from all parts of Europe. Britain, France, Italy, Russia. Much of the stuff, worth many millions, has been finding its way to America, north and south, often via Britain. We know some of the people on the fringes, CIA double agents, mafia members. 
At first, when quite a miniature treasure house was moved out of Russia, we thought it must have been with the KGB's approval and help. In fact, we suspected it to be masterminded by the KGB in order to embarrass the CIA. But we learned recently the Russians suspected it to be masterminded by the CIA and Mafia to embarrass the KGB and make them look ineffective. Then we also found out the Russians suspected us of lifting their art treasures for the same reason. In short, everyone is suspecting everyone else. And in these days of double agents, it's easy enough to build up a case against all and sundry. So the KGB suspect they're being undermined, and so do the CIA. And Her Majesty's Secret Service. It has already led to quite a lot of bloodshed, the picking off of one another's agents. It could be that the situation has been deliberately created by someone to set the Russians, Americans and British at one another's throats. If that is their aim, they are achieving a certain amount of success. So why was Sven Bast killed? Ah, now there is a case in point. Bast has worked for both the Russians and the CIA. He was involved in the vanishing art treasures. Both sides could have suspected double cross, or the gang may have thought he was about to leak information. Mm. He pays your money and he takes your choice. That's about it. But Her Majesty's government feels the situation is tense, very tense. Another killing could provoke mass retaliation, and who knows how it could escalate. The top priority for the European division is to find who is behind it. Now, we know the leader's code name, Tiberius. He has the same ruthless traits as that ancient emperor. He cleans up after every operation with remarkable speed, leaving no witnesses. The killing is done by knife and strangulation. So Bast could be one of Tiberius' victims. Or a deliberate imitation. And to keep the intelligence agencies at one another's throats, he also takes out an agent or two. Well, why was I involved? Because Picton's in on it. He's moved stuff to England for them. You know Picton, and are in the same business, textiles. You seemed an ideal choice. Why wasn't I told this at the beginning? Because you would never have accepted. Another glass of wine? Well, just one more. And I want to get back to Doris. And so you should. Now, you have got nearer to penetrating the organisation than anyone. I would hope you would see it through to the end. Cheers. And the end is? Finding Caesar Tiberius. And then? I will rapidly dispatch him back to his ancestors. Hmm. Cheers. Hail Caesar. You all speak the same language. A wood, what will you have to drink? Uh, what are you drinking? Polish vodka. I'll join you. Though one should never mix the grape with the grain. And uh, how is your good wife? And your Aunt Claire? Oh, they're both fine. Good, good. A woman of passionate convictions, your aunt. <laughs> she calls it faith. But she is the type of woman that, if she ever married, would be loyal and faithful to a man to the end. Oh, till death. <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> Marriage mm, should be like a good wine, maturing over the years, developing and deepening. And even if the bottle is shaken by mistake, it can still settle back and continue the process. If an opportunity presents itself, you might let your aunt know my views on this subject. Oh. You would let her know them yourself? Uh, certain uh, difficulties have presented themselves. Mm. Robson has put me in the picture. Good. Did he also tell you that our Tiberius Caesar is about to plan a night of knives to eliminate any weaknesses in his organization? That could mean the CIA having a shootout around the international Okekaraz. I dread to think of the consequences. And so does Your Majesty's government of Great Britain. Rule Britannia. Robson and I have quite unofficially reached a certain understanding. Well, I'm all for fostering goodwill among nations, even if only on a temporary basis. What do you want me to do? We have something Tiberius wants very much. It is a Russian icon that recently vanished, but which has now found its way back into our hands. It is quite priceless, and such are the ways of the acquisitive that several collectors in the United States would give millions to have it in their secret collections. Does Tiberius know it has been intercepted by its rightful owners? He knows part of his network has been obliterated and that what he was waiting for may have got into other hands. Here is a parcel for you. I would start by ringing Fatorini Export. 
Haywood. I thought you were in jail. In a phone box, in fact. It's just that they couldn't bring themselves to disbelieve the word of an English gentleman. I heard the two rival embassies were bringing a little pressure to bear so that they could take the word of an English gentleman. Truth breeds trust, Galatea. Uh, then what true things did you ring me up to tell me, Mr. Haywood? That I have a package from Russia that should interest you. The price is two million dollars, or the equivalent in German marks. How do we know that you have the goods? I have color slides, of the article on its own, and one with the article resting in my hands. At the moment, however, the icon is in safekeeping. I will ring you. Haywood. This is Harry Carson. Look, I haven't very much time. The American at the Chat Noir? Yeah, yeah. Listen to me, Haywood. I'm listening. Don't keep that appointment that's being made for you. Do you understand? And don't keep the icon either. Have you got that? Yes, but, but why not? Look, look, I'm in a bar near Campo Fiori. Do you know where that is? I gotta go. Spiders are... Harry. Harry. Oh, damn. Hello. The price is right. The meeting will be tonight. On the Piazza Cavour, there will be a yellow car parked. In its rear window, there will be a large cat. When the lights are on, the cat's eyes have two red bulbs which illuminate. The car will drive off, and you will follow it. I want to do business with only Tiberius. Oh, that is understood. Tiberius will be waiting for your parcel. And, uh, Haywood, along the route we will check if there are any other cars following. If that happens, you will just drive around, wasting petrol. How do I know I'll come out alive? For two million dollars, risks are inevitable on both sides. Until tonight, Hayward. Time for another ride in the boot, Renshaw. Can take it steadier this time. Oh, and that reminds me. Tell me, how was it the boot was locked when Galateo tried it? I made sure it wasn't locked when I closed the lid. Ah, well, I, I have a little gadget inside to keep inquisitive people out. Uh, well, let's um, check our weapons before we move off. And, Renshaw, don't leave it so late this time. Full magazines and working smoothly. All aboard, then. Go. Oh, I've installed a hearing device uh, so you can talk to me. Hey, what? In fact, we can both talk to each other. How oh, very cosy. I'm turning into the piazza now. I can see the yellow car with the red cat's eyes. Keep well clear of it. It's beginning to move off. Then follow it as instructed. It's traveling at some speed. All the better. We're still traveling by the Tiber. We're coming to what looks like warehouses. On the right, a large refuse dump. There's a car. No, a lorry. Oh, it's heading straight for us. <laughs> Glad to see you're still alive. The icon. <laughs> you won't get it. I think we have. You see, we've watched your every move, Haywood. We saw you put it into the car. We saw you take on your extra passenger. Now remove the parcel from the glove compartment. Galateo! Drag Haywood out, then lock the boat. Let him lose consciousness. He wants to meet Tiberius. Don't you, Hayward? You aren't Tiberius. No, but Tiberius has come for the painting. Tiberius has another wish. To kill you personally for all the trouble you have caused. With this knife. Give me the knife, Pitton. Huh. 
You should never let your secretary speak to you like that, Picton. Even if she has delusions of power and is convinced she's Tiberius Caesar. Bind him! I suspected at the party at the Chat Noir you were more than a secretary, Miss Jean Tyler. Secretaries are more respectful in public to their bosses. In front of people, they never tell him what to do. Even if they attempt it in private. That is quite correct, Haywood. Uh, I know now what Harry Carson meant just before he was shot down. We did not kill Carson. He was about to say something about spiders. The female of the species is deadlier than the male. And usually ends up by eating him. Hold him still. I'm only going to plunge this knife deep into your heart, Hayward. Like this. Your villa is just around the corner. Do you think you can get there on your own? I think so. Mm. It would be better if we didn't need to trespass on property owned by British intelligence. <laughs> Are they sticklers for protocol? <laughs> I am glad to see you have not lost your sense of humor, Haywood. Thank you for saving my life. And Redshaw's. I think he will survive. And I was not saving you, Haywood, but an art treasure belonging to the people of the Soviet Socialist Republic. Or rather, a very good imitation of the original icon. How did you manage to shoot Tiberius and her cohorts in the darkness? Heywood, only to you would I tell this. Another irony of our times. It was with your new British Army night sight that happened to come into our possession like daylight in what looks like pitch darkness. Mm, remarkable. Well, why weren't we covered by British intelligence? Uh, I do believe, my dear Heywood, there was difficulty in getting approval for one of your night sights to be used here. <laughs> Such is the working of bureaucracy. <laughs> so, who was Jean Tyler? Believe it or not, an English girl who went to America as a dancer. She became a madam for the syndicate, which in turn provided girls for the CIA to work amongst the foreign diplomats. And spies. And spies, in order to get them into um, embarrassing situations. She obviously did very well. And with the help of the syndicate and agents from various sides, formed the biggest art theft organization ever. And, to cover their tracks, they played one intelligence agency against the other. Mm. And Bast and Harry Carson? Mm, Bast had worked for me. With his help, we tracked down some of their people in our territories. They obviously suspected Bast and eliminated him. Carson... He was a Bureau of Narcotics agent who had infiltrated the Mafia drug ring, which in turn had CIA connections, which in turn led him to meet Jean Tyler and to infiltrate her organization. Along the way, the Mafia must have discovered his real identity. Mm, I see. But um, the shooting of Picton, Jean Tyler and Galatea... Mm, I think you will find there is a paragraph in the newspapers about an English businessman, his secretary, and an Italian business acquaintance being killed in a car crash. And in a hot country, it is always better to have the bodies cremated as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, you are disgusted, Haywood. You must realize that if we had hesitated one second longer, Caesar's knife would have entered your heart. Good night, Haywood. May the remainder of your honeymoon be more relaxing and pleasant. Thank you, Colonel. Our last day in Rome. Did you know that Aunt Claire had a candlelight supper with Colonel Balaclare last night? Not another word. The two in question are approaching. Aunt Claire, come. Ah, no, ah, ah, mister, if you don't mind, Doris. As a member of a trade delegation, preferable no rank. The Colonel businessman is a rare specimen. But not totally incompatible. Not as incompatible as me living in Moscow and being allowed to receive the sacraments of Mother Church. <sighs> I was trying to tell your aunt that in Poland, party managers go to mass now. I also quoted to her, John Pilger of the Daily Mirror, that in North Vietnam, 
Catholics are among the best communists, but still she will not believe me. Uh, you tell me Monday was Friday if you thought you could get your way. The American Broadcasting Company presents I Love Adventure. Incident number 10, The Kwong Moon Dagger, a new Carlton E. Morse production featuring Jack, Doc, and Reggie. It's late afternoon of a lazy day in the offices of the A-1 Detective Agency just off Hollywood Boulevard. Doc Long is casting a rather disgruntled glance in the direction of Jack Packard, we are slumped back in his chair with his feet atop the badly scarred desk. Jack, you realize ain't nothing been stirring for three whole days now? Yeah, something will come along. Well, man needs a little excitement once in a while. Why not rent an alligator from one of the movie studios? You could wrestle with it. Maybe you got yourself an idea, son. It might... Uh-oh. Did you see what just walked in? Yeah. Uh, five of them. And all of them fair size, too. Fair size, the man says. Eight to five, they average seven feet in height apiece. Oh, well, please remain seated right where you are, gentlemen. Yes. What's the pitch, friend? We wish to search your office, Mr. Parker. You are obliged by remaining quite still. Yes. No, pal, we haven't time. A previous engagement. Yeah, with an alligator. I regret, gentlemen. You will go nowhere. If you think you hombres can come in All here right, and start... take it easy, Doc. Well... The gun that just popped out of his sleeve says he can. Whoa. And all five of these Hong Kong sports seem to have. So, gentlemen, with your permission, we will search the office. The door to the right hides a wash basin. The one to the left leads into a closet. You'll find two broken golf clubs and five years' accumulation of dust. So, uh, it is well, gentlemen. My men report there are no enemies concealed on the premises. Well, you've no idea what a load that takes off our minds. Now, what gives, friend? You will prepare yourselves to be honored by the presence of the mighty one. Make obeisance, please, to the flower of the seven heavens, the ruler of the temple of Kwang Moon, Princess Myling. Well, smack me pink and call me baby. Uh-oh. Please pardon the air with which my servant, Chin Lu, guards person of his princess. For a hundred generations, his family has watched over well-being of royal ones of a cow bang. Well, that's a job I wouldn't mind undertaking myself. Take it easy, darling. I do not mind, Mr. Packard. A flattery of your friend, Mr. Long, quite pleasing. Oh, uh, you are wondering why I have come here, yes? Well, that don't matter. Uh, if you'd care to sit down over here next to me, Prince... Suppose we let the princess have her say, Doctor. You are right, Mr. Packard. My business here is of utmost urgency. I wish to engage your service to recover for me Kwang Moon Dagger. Kwang Moon Dagger? Oh, uh, you have heard of it? Not never. How about you, Jack? This Kao Bang is a small independent kingdom lying in the jungles between Cochin, China, and Yunnan. Huang Moon is the god worship there. Huh? I'd say somebody made off with a dagger belonging in his temple. Uh, you are exactly right, Mr. Packard. Uh, two months ago, a certain person visit our village. When he depart, dagger depart with him. Well, why would he want an oriental pig sticker? Oh, blade of dagger of Kwang Moon is solid gold, Mr. Long. The hilt is encrusted with a most perfect of emeralds, rupees, and diamonds. Well, ain't no wonder you folks are doing a slow burn. More important is the fact that my people fear that Kwang Moon angry with them. Our crops have been blighted. Disease and famine threaten entire nation. Mm, this will all be corrected the minute the dagger's back in the temple, of course. So my people believe. Uh, that is why I follow men responsible to the United States. Uh, but this country is a very unfamiliar to me and my bodyguard, Chin Lu. Uh, we need assistance of men uh, we can trust. 
Oh, no, it's customs and habits. Well, you come to the right spot, Prince. Is that right, Jack? Well. And you will be rewarded, of course. Upon the hilt of dagger is Kwang Moon Ruby. A most perfect gem of its kind in all world. Uh, you return dagger to me, and the ruby is yours. What's the name of the character who took the dagger? He was known to us as a poor Cavanari. And you've traced him to the United States? Oh, yes. Even more definite than that. To Chicago. Oh, in Windy City, huh? Any address, sir? Uh, we found the envelope among his effects. It was addressed to him on the street known as Wentworth. Here is address. Mm, well, that should help. Anything else? Only one little thing. Dagger was seen yesterday by one of our countrymen in Chicago. Well, now you really bring us up to date. Where was it at? Falling from Small Bridge into Lincoln Park Lagoon. Falling into the lagoon? How come? Was it thrown in? Oh, no, Mr. Packard. He was uh, buried between shoulders of Paul Governor. <laughs> Some looker at Princess, huh, Jack? And that perfume she wore, oh, it does things to a feller. Yeah, maybe that's why we're in something a little deeper than we figured, Doc. What's that supposed to mean? A report from Chicago said that somebody slipped Paul Carbonari a Diger Mickey and dumped his body into the Lincoln Park Lagoon. Sure, but the police closed in before her buddies could recover it. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Only while you were getting our plane tickets, I called Chicago Homicide. No corpse by the name of Cavagnari has turned up, and nobody reported a stabbing in Lincoln Park. Well, Jack, if there's such a strong suspicion of double cross about this case, why we're taking it on? Oh, I don't know. Maybe curiosity. Maybe to keep you from having to wrestle alligators. Or maybe that perfume got me, too. <laughs> You know something, Jack? Dern colorful street, this Wentworth Avenue. Yeah. Tourist eye view of Chicago's Chinatown. What you reckon that Cavalier Omri was doing in this part of town? Well, we'll know pretty quick. Here's the address now. Yeah, gents? Here. Keep the chain. Thanks, pal. Uh Uh-oh. Jack, this can't be the right place. It's the address the princess gave it. But take a gander at that neon sign. Blue Celestial Mortuary. It's a high-class burying parlor. That Cavalieri filler came to live there. Only one way to find out. Let's go in. Hmm. Little depressing, ain't it? What do you expect, dancing girls? No, but they'd have. Good evening, gentlemen. Is there some service we of the Blue Celestial Mortuary may perform for you? Well, we hope so. We're looking for a Mr. Paul Cavagnari. Mr. Cavagnari. Of course, gentlemen. This way, gentlemen. Mm, And he does hang out here. Now, if we can get him to crack about that dagger... Don't worry about that when we meet him. Here you are, gentlemen. Mr. Cavagnari. Thanks. Hey. If I do say so myself, the Blue Celestial Mortuary has done a magnificent job. One would swear he was still alive. Wouldn't they, though? Oh, poor Paul. Last place I wanted to see him was in a coffin. Yes, a sad case. Very sad. Cut down in the bloom of manhood. Well, accidents can happen to anybody. Accident? Why, well, of course, accident. You don't think Paul just deliberately jumped off of that bridge in the lagoon, do you? Bridge? Lagoon? Someone must have misinformed you, sir. Mr. Cavagnari died of natural causes. A heart attack. You sure of that? Certainly. We have a copy of the death certificate. You remember who signed it? Why, a, a Dr. Jansen or Jenkins... Something like that. Well, would you mind getting it for us? It would relieve our minds so much to see it. You know how kin folks is. Why, I'd be happy to, sir. It will only take a moment. I'll be right back. How about that? The whole darn thing don't make no sense, son. You don't reckon somebody's pulling our leg, do you? I'll buy that, but who and why? You've got me. Did Cavalieri get dunked into the lagoon or not? 
And what about that Quang Moon dagger in the back business? Well, that's one thing we can settle right now. But Jack, the death certificate, you heard him. Nobody can forge a stab wound, Doc. Oh, you mean have a look for a sale? What else? Well, it's darn distasteful, but it's got to be done, I'm your boy. Then let's go to it. Our mortician friend will be back any minute. <laughs> Jack, that was a forty-five. Come on, run. Yeah. Wait, well, which way? There, there's the office, the end of the corridor. Uh, somebody's starting to play kind of rough around here. Yeah, yeah, he's dead, all right. But who done it? Don't look like there's nobody around. The open window explains that. Come on, let's get back to the chapel. I want to talk to that organist. Think he might be in on to know about all this? I don't know, but he's the only one left still alive around here. There's a chapel. We'll hit the organ off first. And... Uh-oh. Yeah, we're kind of late. Our little bird seems to have flowed his musical coo. It's not the only one. Take a look at the coffin. At the co... Jack, a corpse is gone. Yeah. Our pal Cavagnari won't stay put, apparently. <laughs> There it is, Doc. The Hung Shu Mu, the Red Tree Flower Shop. But I don't see what we're doing going to a flower shop, huh? Somebody sent a carload of flowers to Cobham Yard in this place. If we can learn who it was, we may have a lead on what to do next. Come on, let's go in. Good evening, gentlemen. Is there something I could do for you? Yeah, it could be. Uh, you delivered a load of flowers to the Blue Celestial Mortuary recently, didn't you? Yes, that's right. Did you wish to order some similar ones? Well, it depends on how cooperative you can be. We pride ourselves on our service, sir. I'm sure we can supply you with whatever you wish. Mm-hmm. Well, then try this for size. Who sent those other flowers? I'm sorry, sir. I am not at liberty to say. Now, look, Hangtown Fry, you ain't no doctor nor lawyer. Ain't no professional secrets in your business. If a client of yours wished to remain anonymous... Would you disclose the identity, Miss Along? Uh oh. Hey, Jack, my fame must be spread. Doggone, Fu Manchu, how'd you know my name? <laughs> I was told to expect your arrival. Who is your interested informer? And if you say Paul Cobb, I ain't gonna believe it. No, it was the person whose identity you seek. Hey, what'll it take to make you come across as something besides double talk? Nothing, Mr. Packard. And a message was left for you at the same time. Okay, let's have it. The northwest corner of Wentworth and Fowler. Come again, sport. The northwest corner of Wentworth and Fowler. What's that supposed to mean? I'm afraid I do not know. However, the corner is only a few yards from the shop. Why not investigate and see? Mm, Jack, this kid may be making sense of that. Mm, maybe. Come on, Doc. Thanks for your trouble. Uh, do not mention it, Mr. Potter. We like to build up goodwill for future business. Oh, man. And uh, do not forget, gentlemen, we specialize in funerals. <laughs> good night. Hmm. That hombre gives a good deal more than he takes. I mean, he knows a good deal more than he says. Well, that seems to be a fact about everybody in this case, with the exception of us. Well, there's the sign... Wentworth and Fowler, and this is the northwest corner. Now what? Well, don't seem to be nothing interesting here. Just a vacant lot with some signboards around it. That message meant something. It... Hey, Doc, that car. Jack, that fellow leaning out the window. He's got... Down, Doc, get out. Hey, Doc. Doc, you all right? What you mean am I all right? I landed on my doggone crazy bone and spoiled my aim. Must have missed them gunmen a mile. Yeah, I didn't do so well myself. Well, we know what that message meant now. Yeah, some message. Hey, did you get a look at that polecat that was shooting that Tommy gun? Yeah. Something mighty familiar about him, wasn't it? It should be. He was Prince's Myling's bodyguard, Chin Lu. Back to the flower shop, quick. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Flower man don't seem to be around. Maybe in that back room. Let's head it. Well, come on. I'm right eager to exchange a few words with that son of Satan, punctuated with a right cross or two. Well, leave him enough lift to talk about that message, Doc. Yeah. Well, don't seem to be in here, neither. 
Now, where are you supposed to... Hey, hold it now. The door to the refrigerator room is open. Somebody's in there. Refrigerator room? Oh, oh, for the flowers. Hey, hold it, fella. I can see a shadow in the looking glass. He hasn't hurt us yet. Must be almost soundproof in there. Well, why deprive him of our company? That's just what I was thinking. Come on. Yank that door open and surprise him, son. He got it coming after the little party we just had. Sure. Okay, here we go. All right, pal. How about... Look out, Doc. Catch him. Oh, too late. Oh, but... So it wasn't the flowers leaning against that door. It was our missing pal, Paul Cavalier. Yeah. Now, what was he doing in here, you reckon? Take a look at his clothes. Huh. Why, the half tore off of him. Which means that whoever hijacked him from the mortuary put him in here to give him a good frisking. And incidentally, he wasn't killed by the Quang Moon dagger. Yes, so I see him punctures in his chest. Looks like he was made by thirty-eight caliber. Oh. What'd you pick up there, son? Uh, ticket or something. Punched by a time stamp. Here, take a look. Mm. Boat, concession, Lincoln Park, Lagoon, time out, 517, time in, 529. What in thunder do you suppose that means? Looks like he took a rowboat ride on the lagoon sometime before he died. Couldn't have liked it very much. He was only out 12 minutes. Hey, Doc, I got a hunch. Let's get out of here. No, and... not bother to turn around, Mr. Parker. Well, well, so Cobb had company in the refrigerator room. You have been crouched down among them flowers all the time? Keep facing the wall and do not offer any resistance as my men disarm and bind you. Those are gun barrels you feel pressing against your spines. Well, I take your word for it, but is there any particular reason for the pistol massage? And who are you? I am Dr. Jen King. How about that? I knew there was someone else we should have checked on. You will have your chance now. You and I are going to have a talk. A long overdue talk. About Paul Cavagnari and the Quang Moon Dagger. <laughs> I trust you are quite comfortable here in my quarters, Mr. Packard. I'll do. Where's Doc? Uh, He is being held in the next room. Uh, But do not be concerned. No harm will come to either of you as long as cooperation is the keynote of this little meeting. Okay, cooperation it is. You begin. What's your business with us? I am Dr. Jen Kin, Mr. Packard, head of a large hospital in Hanoi, uh, French Indochina. Haven't you got your professions mixed up a little? That was a gun I saw in your hand, not a scalpel. There are times, Mr. Packard, when it is necessary for a man of medicine to take up arms in defense of his profession. Uh, That pitch was a little wide, Doctor. Come again. Very well. Two months ago, my hospital was robbed of over a million dollars worth of radium. I suspected a man I had known casually in Hanoi by the name of Paul Cavagnari. Seems to me I've heard this somewhere before. You trailed him to the States, learned he was in Chicago. Yes, Mr. Packard. But I could not locate him here. I was about to give up the search two days ago when I received a phone call from him. Uh-huh. Eight to five, he was giving you a chance to buy your radium back. Precisely. At a price considerably lower than I would have to pay to replace it on the open market. However, he also mentioned the possibility of my having to buy the... Quang Moon Dagger. I agreed to discuss the proposition with him and went to meet him. The place he had chosen was a uh, most unusual one. Uh, I can take the ball from here, Doctor. The place was the Lincoln Park Lagoon. Yes. Gavignari was dead when you got there. That is correct. And there was no radium. There was no radium. And so you had him picked up by the Blue Celestial Mortuary, signed a fake death certificate and left him lying in state to see who might show up. I still had hopes of recovering that radium, Mr. Packard. And it occurred to me that if the people who had killed him for it found no mention of his murder in the paper, they might wonder why. Might be driven by guilt and fear to learn what had happened to him. Mm, Pretty long shot, Doctor. Uh, It paid off, Mr. Packard. You and Mr. Long visited the mortuary. Who is your stool pigeon there, the organist? Oh, that is quite correct. Unfortunately, he ran out to try to intercept the mortician's murderer and did not see or remove the body. However, he did trail you to the florist shop where he learned your identity and got in touch with me by telephone. So, and now, Mr. Packard, 
It is your turn to cooperate. Okay, I'll get your radium for you. As I thought. You do have it. No, nope, but neither do the lads who bumped off Cavagnari. How do you know that? Because he did not. That's why they came back to snatch his body. They hadn't been able to find the stuff and were looking for something to tip them off as to where it was. And do you know where it is, Mr. Parker? No, but I can find it and get the Kwong Moon dagger for myself if you release us right away. If not, it'll be too late. It's your last chance, Doctor. You are presuming rather heavily upon my gullibility, are you not? I'm presuming you're a doctor, that you realize what that radium means to your patients. Yes. Yes, there are thousands of my countrymen now doomed to die who will live if I bring it back to Hanoi with me. Very well, Mr. Packard. You shall be released at once. <laughs> But, Jack, you believe this Jin Ken feller story? Makes sense, Doc. Well, I sure am happy to know that, son. I wouldn't ever guess. You won't have to guess much longer. You mean there's some action coming up? Well, there should be a little excitement. Well, where and when? In about ten minutes, near the boathouse, on the Lincoln Park Lagoon. Take the rowboat on the end, Doc. You mean we going rowing at this time of night? Why not? Cabniari went somewhere. It took him 12 minutes to get there and back. But where could a feller go in this overgrowed wading pool and that... Oh, that little wooded island at the upper end. Is that spot you mean? I don't know, Doc. But we're going to row over there and find out. Look, Jack... If this is the action you promised me, let's take a crack at guessing again. Don't give up the ship. We're almost there. Yeah. And I got a hunch you'll have enough action in the next few minutes to... Oh. Oh. See what I mean? Hey, over the side, Doc. Wait. Uh. 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 <coughs> Jack, the water's awful darn cold from a Saturday night tub. Yeah. Well, he's trying to make it hot enough for us. Well, the boat's a pretty good shield. Shall we kind of ease it islandward, maybe, huh? Yeah, that's a general idea. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> We're nearly there. When we touch bottom, make a dash for it. Yeah. Hit the deck at the first cover we come to. You bet you. Shades of Omaha Beach on the deck. Okay, Doc, let's go. You, you still okay, son? Uh, no complaints. What about you? These here bramble thickets ain't my idea of a feather bed. Otherwise, I'm just fine. Good. Wonder what's happened to our bloodthirsty gun. Probably got a spot. It's moving in for the kill. Let's make that our happy thought for the day. Ought to be some way to upset his plan. You got any ideas? Yeah. The last time he fired was from behind that elm tree. I'm going to shove off for it. But he ain't there now. If he's moving in on us, he... Oh, I get it. You'll draw as far so I can shoot at the muzzle flash. Right. Keep your eyes open. Just leave it to your Uncle Dudley. Good luck, son. There I go. Jack. Hello, Jack, can you hear me? Jack. Jack, are you all right, fella? Okay, Doc, come on. Everything's under control. Well, say so, then. How'd I make that with a firecracker key? You'll have a pretty sore shoulder for a very long time. Hey, well, it's our old friend Chen Lu, so he was the one sniping at us. Yeah, and if you take a gander on the ground behind this tree, you'll see why. Well, look at that. They're on the ground beside that hole. Yeah, the Kwong Moon Dagger, right where Paul Cavagnari had hidden it. You mean our job is done? As soon as we get Shin Lo to a hospital and fly back to L.A. Take a deep breath, Doc. The next one you take may be filled with Princess Mai Ling's perfume. <laughs> Mr. Packard, my own servant, Chin Lu, tried to obtain Kwang Moon dagger behind my back. 
That's the way it looks, all right. Yeah, don't take it so hard, Francis. After all, we did bring the dagger back to Los Angeles with her. You have done really much to make my people happy again. I... I do not know how to tell you how grateful I am. You have dagger? Yeah, here in this drawer. You know, Princess, this dagger is not only ornamental, it's a pretty good weapon. Sharp point, keen steel blade. Yeah, I was a little surprised. I thought you said the blade was solid gold. I did, Mr. Packard, but I had not seen dagger in recent years. My memory played tricks on me. Oh, uh-huh. Played tricks about the gems on the hilt, too. Oh, I had not forgotten your fee, Mr. Packard. The giant ruby will be yours. Uh, don't bother. There's not much of a market for paste these days. Paste? She acts surprised, yeah. But well, I am surprised. I had no idea. I suppose you didn't know that the hilt was hollow and that Paul Cavagnari smuggled the stolen radium into this country inside it. Stolen radium? What are you talking about, Mr. Packard? Uh, come off it, Princess. You, Cavagnari, and Chin Lu were in on that robbery together. Only Cavagnari tried to slip you the double cross and sell the stuff on the hot market in Chicago. What? What is this fantastic story? When you heard the Red Hots, he tried to sell it to double crossed him and bumped him off, you came to us, hoping we'd find out where he'd hidden the stuff. But your number one boy, Chin Lu, got to Chicago ahead of us and hijacked Cavagnari's body to search it for clues that might have been missed. When he found that boat ride ticket and figured out what it meant, well, me and Jack was superfluous property. That's why you baited that trap at the florist and tried to bump us off. After that, you came back to L.A. while Chin Lu tore out to the lagoon to pick up the loot. That's why you... Okay, you dirty double cross machine! Look out, Jack! You won't let the pin this on... Let's have that sticker, baby! I'll kill you! Pack it up! Kill you! Drop it, baby! Drop it! That's better... Doc, open the door. With pleasure. And now, Princess, you can make your eggs. Well, here's your stinking eyes, but you won't get away with it. You like you won't. Wow. And my sentiments, exactly. What a hell cat to lovely dance will turn out to be. Yeah. The stolen goods detail outside and take care of her. Oh, well, Quang Moon Dagger. Just as false a piece of guilt as Princess Myling's soul. But what kills my soul is that the beautiful ruby on the hilt is false, too. All that brain work and gun shooting and no payoff. Oh, I don't know. The hospital in Indochina will get its radium back as fast as Dr. Jen Kin can get it there. And when you think of some thousands of people who'll get another crack at life now... Yeah, I... maybe you got something there, son. Oh, well, mark down another two-fisted experience in the tarred old files of the A-1. By the way, let me have that telephone, will you, son? Huh? Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Who are you calling now? RKM Studio. About an alligator. Hey, wait a minute. You're not taking that gag seriously. Why, of course I am. After the Princess Mai Ling, I ought to be able to throw one of them amphibious critters two out of three falls with a Kwong Moon dagger tied behind my back. just heard I Love Adventure, a new Carl P. Morse production featuring Michael Raffetto as Jack Packard and Barton Yarborough as Doc Long. Next week, incident number 11 entitled Assignment with a Displaced Person, an affair of a girl and a black market operator. Other players in tonight's show included Lillian Baya, Luke Krugman, Russell Thorson, and Harry Lang. The Kwong Moon Dagger was written by Sidney Marshall. Organ music by Rex Corey, your announcer, Jim Butters. reminder. For a laugh-provoking detective drama, stay tuned next for Johnny Fletcher, starring popular radio personality 
Bill Goodwin. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. At one period of his life, my friend Father Brown found it difficult to hang his hat on a hat peg without repressing a slight shudder. The cause of this curious idiosyncrasy was indeed a mere detail in much more complicated events. But it was, I believe, the only detail that remained to him in his busy life to remind him of the whole strange business. Its remote origin was to be found in the facts which led Dr Boyne the medical officer attached to the county police force, to send for Father Brown on a particular frosty morning in December. Come in. Ah, Father Brown. Hello, Dr. Boyne. Come in, my dear man. Sit you down. Ah, thank you. Nice of you to drop in. Well, I, you wanted to see me, I understand. I'm not so sure that I do, you know. I'm not sure about anything yet. I'm hanged if I can make out whether it's a case for a doctor or a policeman or a priest. Well, as I suppose you are both a policeman and a doctor, I seem to be in rather a minority. An instructed minority, let us say. I mean, I know you've had to do a little in our line as well as your own. Uh, it's true, I have stepped rather outside my priestly duties on occasion. And very successfully, if I may be allowed to say so. But it's precious hard to know whether this particular business is in your line or ours. Or merely in the line of the commissioners in lunacy. You intrigue me, Doctor. Pray continue. Come over to this window for a moment. Oh, certainly. You see that large white house on the hill? Oh, one could hardly avoid doing so. An imposing-looking place, even at this distance. But somewhat gone to seed in recent years, I'm told. Well, the point is... We've just had a message from the man who lives in it. He's asking us for protection. Protection? Against what he describes as a murderous persecution. A uh, fear of persecution is a not uncommon delusion with certain individuals. I've even encountered it amongst my own flock. But murderous, you say? Mm, his words, not mine. However, if you'll bear with me, I'd better tell you the story from the beginning... We've gone into the facts as far as we could. Of course. Well, it seems that a man named Aylmer, who was a wealthy landowner in these parts, married rather late in life and uh, had three sons. But in his bachelor days, when he thought he would have no heir, he adopted a boy whom he thought very brilliant and promising, who went by the name of John Strink. Some distant relative, no doubt. No, no, his origins seemed to be vague. Some say he was a foundling, and others insist that he was a gypsy. I think this last notion's mixed up with the fact that Aylmer, in his old age, dabbled in all sorts of dingy occultism. And the three sons insisted that Strake encouraged him in it. And a great many other things beside that, I'll be bound. Quite so. They say Strake was an amazing scoundrel, an astounding liar. <laughs> but that might be a natural prejudice in the light of what happened. When the old man died, it was found that he'd left practically everything to the adopted son. Mm -hmm. The three real sons disputed the will, and they said that uh, the father had been frightened into making such a deposition, mm -hmm. and not to put too fine a point on it, driven into a state of gibbering idiocy. Ah, oh, dear me, these family quarrels are always most distressing. Anyhow, they seem to have proved something about the dead man's mental condition. For the court set aside the will and the sons inherited. A meet and proper decision, no doubt. Uh, not to the liking of the adopted son, I imagine. No, indeed. From all accounts, he reacted violently. As he straight broke out in the most dreadful fashion and swore he would kill all three of them, one after the other, and that nothing could hide them from his vengeance. It is the third or last of the brothers, Arnold Aylmer, who's asking for police protection. Third and last? Yes. The other two are dead. Oh. That is where the doubt comes in. There's no proof that they were murdered, but they might possibly have been. The eldest who took up his position as squire was supposed to have committed suicide in his garden. 
The second, who went into trade as a manufacturer, was knocked on the head by machinery in his factory. Well, we might very well have taken a false step and fallen, but if Streak did kill them, he's certainly very cunning in his manner of getting to work and getting away again. Well, on the other hand, I suppose it could be that the whole thing is a mania of conspiracy founded on coincidence. That is where you come into it, Father Brown. I want someone of sense, who isn't an official, to go up and have a talk with this Mr. Arnold Aylmer and form an impression of him. You know what a man with a delusion is like and how a man looks when he's telling the truth. I want you to be the advance guard before we take the matter up. Well, it seems rather odd that you haven't had to take it up before. Is there any particular reason why he should send for you now? He does give a reason. He declares that all his servants have suddenly gone on strike and left him, so that he's obliged to call on the police to look after his house. Would you suppose there's any truth in his claim? I mean, the whole thing sounds like the whim of some half-witted crank. The inquiries have made confirm that there has been a general exodus of servants from that house on the hill. Ah. Apparently, the servants' account of the matter is that their employer had become quite impossible in his fidgets and fears that he wanted them to guard his house like sentries or, or sit up like night nurses in hospital. So, with one voice, they announced that he was a lunatic and left. <sighs> of course, that doesn't prove he is a lunatic, but it does seem rather rum in these days for a man to expect his valet or his parlour maid to act as an armed guard. <laughs> So he wants a policeman to act as his parlour maid because his parlour maid won't act as a policeman. Mm, I thought that rather thick too, but... Uh, I can't take the responsibility of a flat refusal till I've tried a compromise. You are the compromise. Oh, very well. I'll, I'll go and call on him now, if you like. Ah, good man. I felt sure I could count on you. Ooh. I could have done with a thicker overcoat. It's getting cold at every step. And it's about to snow again by the look of those great livid clouds. Oh, Ooh. slippery too. Dear me, the snow has started to fall already. I'd better put up my brolly. Ah, at last. These must be the entrance gates. Good luck I should reach the house before this first flurry becomes a blizzard. Hmm. An ornate enough piece of iron work in all conscience. More suitable, I'd say, as the approach to some Italian villa than to an English country house. I suppose the gates have not been locked. So far, so good. Hmm. A drop of oil might not come amiss. Well, point was right. Place does appear to have been somewhat neglected. Those shrubs and evergreens have been allowed to run riot, and no mistake. It's too northern to be called luxuriant. Oh dear. More like an Arctic jungle. So it was, in some sense, with the house that now came into Father Brown's view. It stood as if waist high in a stunted forest of shrubs and bushes. Its classical facade and row of columns might have looked out on the Mediterranean, but now seem to be withering in the wind of the North Sea. Carved masks of comedy and tragedy looked down upon the grey confusion of the garden paths, now rapidly disappearing under a layer of snow. But the faces seemed to be frostbitten. The very volutes of the capitals might have curled up with the cold. Father Brown mounted the steps to a square porch flanked by pillars, and knocked at the door. About four minutes afterwards, he knocked again. I hope I'm not to be kept standing out here all day. After all, I'm not an Eskimo. 
Uh, no one in front of the house, apparently. Oh, perhaps there's a side door somewhere. I'll try there. Bless my soul, how thickly the snow's lying already. Ah, ah, here we are. Is it locked, I wonder? Bolted or fastened in some way? Perhaps the eccentric Mr. Aylmer has barricaded himself too deep in the house to hear any kind of summons. Or perhaps he assumes that any summons must signal the arrival of the avenging John Stake. Oh, dear. Oh, well. It's unlikely the departing servants will have seen too carefully to the defences. They may easily have overlooked a window, if nothing else. Well, it's worth trying, at any rate. Oh, not such a large place, after all, but perhaps a trifle pretentious. Ah, what have we here behind this creeper? A French window and left a jar. Oh, dear, I dislike entering another man's house in this fashion, but needs must when the devil leads. The room or hall in which our friend found himself was comfortable enough in an old-fashioned way, with a staircase leading up from it on one side and a door leading out from it on the other. Facing him was another door with red-stained glass let into it. On a table to the right stood a sort of aquarium in which fishes and similar things moved about in the greenish water. Opposite it, in an ornamental pot, a large plant of the palm variety. By contrast, a telephone in a curtained alcove came as something of a surprise to Father Brown. Well, I'm blessed to find so modern an instrument in such dusty and Victorian surroundings. <laughs> That's incongruous, to say the least. Who is that? Oh, well, uh, uh, could I see Mr. Aylmer? I am Mr. Aylmer. You must excuse my dressing gown. I have got out of the way of expecting visitors. I'm wondering whether it is quite true that you never expect visitors. You're right. I always expect one visitor, and he may be the last. Well, I sincerely hope not. But at least I'm relieved to infer that I do not look like him. <laughs> you certainly do not. From your habit, I assume you are a man of God. Yes, my name is Father Brown. Some friends of mine have told me about your trouble and asked me to see if I could do anything to help you. The truth is, I have some little experience in affairs like these. There are no affairs like this. You mean that the tragedies in your unfortunate family were not normal deaths? I mean they weren't even normal murders. The man who is hounding us all to death is a devil incarnate and his power is from hell. All evil has one origin. But how do you know they were not normal murders? Why are we talking in the hall? Come in and sit down. Be seated, if you please, and I will endeavour to explain. Oh, thank you. I have come to these conclusions by reason. Because, unfortunately, reason really leads there. I have read a great many books on this subject, but what I tell you does not rest on what I have read, but what I have seen. Do I make myself clear? Oh, perfectly. In my elder brother's case, I was not certain at first. There were no marks or footprints where he was found shot on the lawn here, the, the pistol beside him. But that morning, he had received a threatening letter. Certainly from our enemy, for it was marked with a sign like a winged dagger. A dagger with wings? Just another of his infernal cabalistic tricks. But is it not possible that your brother may have taken his own life? That was the verdict at the time. Although a servant in the house swore she had seen a figure moving along the garden wall. Shortly after she had heard a shot. She said whatever it was, it was too large to be a cat or a prowling dog. Well, she could have been mistaken. That is possible, of course. All I can say is that if the murderer came, he left no traces. But your other brother... Stephen. Oh, when he died, it was different. Before that, I had only surmised. Since then, I have known. On the day of his death, a machine was working in an open scaffolding under the factory tower. I scaled the platform a moment or two after he had fallen under the iron hammer that struck him. I did not see anything else strike him. But I saw what I saw. You must take my word for what I'm going to tell you now. 
A great drift of factory smoke was rolling between me and the tower above. But through a rift I saw, standing at the very top of it, a dark human figure, muffled in what looked like a black cloak. Then the smoke came between us. When it cleared, I, I looked up again at the distant chimney. There was nobody there. I'm a rational man, Father Brown, but how, I ask you, had he reached that dizzy, inapproachable turret? And how did he leave it? My brother's head was smashed beyond recognition, but his body was not much damaged. In his pocket we found one of those warning messages, dated the previous day, and stamped with the same flying dagger. This symbol of the flying dagger, might not its use be merely arbitrary, accidentally? Nothing about that abominable man is accidental. He is all designed, though it is indeed a dark and intricate design, woven out of all sorts of secret languages and signs and nameless evils. I do not pretend to know all that is conveyed by this symbol, but it seems, surely, it must have some relation to all that has befallen my unfortunate family. The coincidence is certainly very great. Is that all? Is there no connection, then, between the idea of a winged weapon and the mystery by which my brother Philip was struck dead on his own lawn, without the slightest trace of any footprint or disturbance of the grass? Is there no connection between the dagger and that figure which hung on the far top of that chimney tower, clad in a cloak for wings? Do you mean that he is in a perpetual state of levitation? It was a common prediction of the Dark Ages that the Antichrist would be able to fly. Anyhow, there was the flying dagger on the warnings. And whether or not it could fly, it could certainly strike. What sort of paper were these messages written on? Oh, you can see what they're like for yourself. For I got one this very morning. I have it in my pocket now. Yes, here it is. Hmm. Torn from an artist's sketchbook, I would say. There's no mistaking the symbol. It clearly represents a dagger adorned with wings. Death comes the day after this, as it came to your brother. Mr. Aylmer, you must not let this sort of stuff stupefy you. These devils always try to make us helpless by making us hopeless. You're right. And the devils shall find that I'm not so hopeless after all, nor so helpless. Perhaps I have more hope and better help than you fancy. I don't follow you, I'm afraid. My unfortunate brothers failed because they used the wrong weapons. Philip carried a revolver, and that was how his death came to be called suicide. The weapon was found beside his body, you said. That is so, with one chamber empty. I believe my brother tried to defend himself, not to take his own life. And the other brother? Stephen had police protection. But he had too great a sense of the ridiculous to allow a policeman to follow him up a ladder to a scaffolding where he stood only for a moment. My brothers were both scoffers. Skeptics, if you like. And for that they paid with their lives. Skeptics? Skeptical of what, may I ask? Of the strange mysticism of my father's last days. I always knew there was more in the old man than they understood. By studying magic, he fell at last under the blight of black magic... The black magic of this scoundrel Strake. And that is where my brothers were wrong. The antidote to black magic is not brute force or worldly wisdom. The antidote to black magic is white magic. Well, that rather depends on what you mean by white magic. I mean silver magic. D do you know what I mean by silver magic? I must confess that I don't. Come then. I will show you. This way, please. The door with the red glass opened into a long, narrow corridor, ending in another door into the garden. Through its glazed panels, Father Brown could see that the lawns and the sweeping fall of the country beyond were covered with the shining pallor of snow. Ah, uh, here is white magic, anyhow. What do you mean? Well, look for yourself. Oh, yes, the snow. It's going to lie without a doubt. But pray, follow me. As they made their way along the passage, Father Brown noticed that on one side was an ordinary hat stand with the ordinary dingy cluster of old hats and overcoats, and beside it a single door leading, no doubt, from the proprietor's bedroom. On the other side of the passage was something more interesting. 
a dark oak sideboard, laid out with some old silver and overhung by a trophy of old weapons, pistols and other firearms. Here, Arnold Elmer halted. Do you see this long, antiquated sort of pistol with the wide mouth? Yes. Do you know why I chose this old blunderbuss? I can't say I do. Because I can load it with this kind of bullet. A silver teaspoon? Yes, a silver apostle spoon. I merely have to break off the small figure at the top, so... <coughs> and I have my silver bullet. Now, let us go back into the other room. Sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you. Tell me, did you ever read about the death of Dundee? Dundee? Oh, you mean the man who persecuted the Scottish Covenanters? None other. Did you know that he could only be shot with a silver bullet because he had sold himself to the devil? Or oh, so it was said. That's one comfort about you, Father Brown. At least you know enough to believe in the devil. Oh, yes, I believe in the devil. What I don't believe in is the Dundee. Have you ever heard of Dalrymple of Stair? No. At any rate, you've heard of what he did. He was the man who made the massacre of Glencoe. But I always thought it was the Campbell. Maybe. Yet it was Dalrymple who instigated the slaughter. He was a very learned man and a lucid lawyer. Quiet man with a very refined intellectual face. Now that's the sort of man who sells himself to the devil. By God, you're right. A refined intellectual face. That is the face of John Strake. If you will wait here a little while, I will show you something. Dear me, a madman without a doubt, and one impelled by a single crazy obsession. I suppose he's gone back to that old sideboard or possibly to his bedroom. But why? What can be in his mind? Father Brown gazed abstractedly at the carpet, where a faint red glimmer shone from the glass in the doorway. Once it seemed to brighten like a ruby, and then it darkened again as if the sun of that stormy day had passed from cloud to cloud. Nothing moved, except the aquatic creatures which floated to and fro in the dim green bowl. Father Brown was thinking hard. A minute or two later, he got up and slipped quietly to the alcove of the telephone. Dr. Boyle, it's me, Father Brown. Ah, yes, what's the trouble, old chap? I wanted to tell you about Aylmer and his affairs. Oh, good, so you managed to see it. Yes, I'm in his house at the moment. Did you get anything out? Yes, I did. It's a queer story, but I rather think there's something in it. I haven't time to go into details now, but if I were you, I'd send some men up here straight away. Four or five, I think, and surround the house. Surround the house? Why? What are you expecting to happen? Well, I can't tell, but if anything does happen, there'll probably be something startling in the way of an escape. My advice to your people is to send your men up here at once. We've no time to lose. Very well, I'll take your word for it. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Well, that's all for the present. Uh, goodbye. No sign of Elmer. Oh, just as well since his absence gave me time to make my call. Ah, well, nothing for it but to wait in patience. Curious how the light filters through that glass door, shedding its blood-red pattern on the carpet. Blood, eh? <laughs> That's an ill omen in the circumstances, I might say. Ah, now it's disappeared again. Strange how it comes and goes. <laughs> Angels defend us. What can they... <laughs> Glory be to the white magic. Glory be to the silver bullet. That hellhound has hunted once too often. And my brothers are avenged at last. Mm, merciful what heaven, heaven, what mischief have you done, Aylmer? No one here. Ah, the bedroom, perhaps. Locked. Locked, that's odd. The keyhole. No, nothing to be seen except a bare room. Outside, then, it must be there, if anywhere. Dear God, what have we here? In the field of snow, which had been so blank a little before, lay a black object. At first glance, it looked like an enormous bat. But approaching nearer, Father Brown saw that it was the body of a man, Fallen on its face, the head covered by a broad black hat. 
The appearance of bats' wings came from the loose sleeves of a vast black cloak, spread out to their utmost length on either side. Peering beneath the hat, Father Brown got a glimpse of the face. It was indeed as Aylmer had described, refined, intellectual, even sceptical and austere. John Strake. The face of John Strake. Well, I'm jiggered. It really does look like some vast vampire that has swooped down like a bird. How else could he have come? Elmer, you startle me. No doubt. But you haven't answered my question. If he had not flown, how could he have come? Well, I suppose he could have walked. Walked? Look at the snow. It's unspotted. Pure as the white magic you yourself called it. There are no footsteps, but a few of yours and mine. There are none approaching the house from anywhere. Well, you're right, there are none. I'll tell you something else. That cloak he flies with, it's too long to walk with. He was not a tall man, and it would trail behind him like a royal train. Stretch it out over his body, if you like, and see. Well, how did it happen? I looked out of the door and was turning back when there came a kind of rushing of wind all around me, as if I were being buffeted by a wheel revolving in midair. I spun round somehow and fired blindly, and then I saw nothing but what you see here before you. Nor would you have seen it now if I'd not had a silver shot in my gun. But for that, it would have been another body than John Strake's lying there. Well, what shall we do? Leave it lying here in the snow? Or would you like it taken into your room? I suppose that is your bedroom in the passage. No, no. We must leave it there until the police have seen it. Oh, yes. Besides, I've had as much of such things as I can stand for the moment. Whatever else happens, I'm going to have a drink. After that, they can hang me if they like. somewhere in the house. Where are those blasted servants hidden it? Why not try that small cupboard in the corner there? Yes, of course. Why didn't I think of that before? Ah, here we are. A full decanter and glasses as well. Yes, brandy all right. Ah, that's better. Care for a drink yourself? Thank you, no. Well, it's up to you. Nothing like a drop of spirit to restore a man's confidence. Damnation! Steady on! You very nearly upset that bowl of fish. Not myself, you know. Not myself at all. Legs let me down, you see. It's only to be expected after what I've gone through. <sighs> sure you won't join me? Oh, not for me, thanks. I see you are still doubtful. Though you have seen the thing with your own eyes. Believe me, Father Brown, there was something more behind the quarrel between the spirit of Strake and the spirit of the House of Aylmer. It's your business to believe in things. Oh, I do believe in some things, of course. And therefore, of course, I don't believe in other things. You do believe it. You believe everything. We all believe everything, even when we deny everything. The soul goes round upon a wheel of stars and all things return. Perhaps Strake and I have striven in many shapes, beast against beast and bird against bird, and perhaps we shall strive forever. We seek and need each other. Even that eternal hatred is an eternal love. No. What is the good of saying no? You have seen part of that eternal drama with your own eyes. You have seen the threat of John Strake to slay Arnold Aylmer by black magic. You have seen Arnold Aylmer slay John Strake by white magic. You see Arnold Aylmer alive and talking to you now. And yet you do not believe it. No, I do not believe it. Why not? Because you are not Arnold Aylmer. I know who you are. Your name is John Strake, and you have murdered the last of the brothers who is lying outside in the snow. What? What are you saying? By heavens, I'll have your life for this! Oh, put that pistol down. You'll not help yourself by adding one more victim to your crime. The place is surrounded and there's no way of escape. This house surrounded? I'll not believe you! The police! That's right, sir. Inspector Collins of the Essex Constabulary. And if you take my advice, you'd better let one of my men take charge of that pistol. See to it, will you, Robinson? Very good, sir. By what right do you... We'll come to that in due course, Mr. Strake, if that in truth be your name. Meanwhile, perhaps Father Brown here would explain matters rather more fully. Certainly, Inspector. That man there is none other than John Strake, and I accuse him of the murder of Arnold Aylmer, as well as of his two brothers, and the attempted murder of myself. Thank you, Father Brown. That's all I needed to know. John Strake, 
I'm taking you into custody on a charge of willful murder. And it is my duty to warn you that anything you say now will be taken down and may be used in evidence. You know, what beats me is the mentality of a man like Strake. Not only does he appear to have confessed his crimes with very little prompting by the police, but from what Inspector Collins tells me, he even seemed inclined to boast to them as victories. Instead of weaving all that wild romance about winged vampires and silver bullets, he might have put an ordinary leaden bullet into me and walked out of the house. Mm, I wonder he didn't. Coffee, Father. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I don't understand it, but then I don't understand anything yet. How on earth did you discover what you did? Oh, you yourself, Doctor, provided me with very valuable information, especially the one piece of information that really counted. And what was that? Your statement that Straight was an inventive and imaginative liar, with great presence of mind in producing his lies. And this afternoon he needed it. His mistake, perhaps his only one, was in choosing a preternatural story. He had a notion that because I'm a clergyman, I would believe anything. Mm, other folk have little notions of that kind, too, you know. <laughs> but you must really begin at the beginning. Well, the beginning of it was a dressing gown. A dressing gown? Yes. It's quite the best disguise I've ever known. How so? Well, when you meet a man in a house with a dressing gown on, you assume quite automatically that he's in his own house. I assumed it myself. But afterwards, queer little things began to happen. Such as? When he took the pistol down in the hall, he clicked it at arm's length, as a man does to make sure a strange weapon isn't loaded. But surely he would know whether the pistols in his hall were loaded or not. Precisely. Oh. Then later on, I didn't like the way he had to look for the brandy. Or the way he barged into the bowl of fishes. Now, a man who has a fragile thing of that sort in his rooms gets a quite mechanical habit of avoiding it. But the first real point was this. He came out of the passage between the two doors. And in that passage, there's only one other door leading to a room. So, I assumed it was the bedroom he'd just come from. I tried the handle, but it was locked. I thought, this is odd. And then I looked through the keyhole. It was an utterly bare room. No bed, no anything. Therefore, he'd not come from inside any room, but from outside the house. And when I saw that, I think I saw the whole picture as I do now, just as it happened. Go on, don't keep me in suspense. Poor Arnold Aylmer doubtless slept and perhaps lived upstairs. But this afternoon, he came out of his room in his dressing gown, descended the stairs and passed through the red glass door. At the end of the passage, black against the winter daylight, he saw a tall, bearded man in a broad-brimmed black hat and a large, flapping black cloak. Uh, he did not see much more in this world. Strake! Yes, John Strake. Your family's sworn and mortal foe. What do you seek here? Your life. That is what I seek, Aylmer. I have come here to kill you. Can't do that, no. Stay where you are. To kill you, I say. No, I've done you no wrong. I, I've done nothing to kill you. No. <sighs> and so at last the score is settled. Arnold Aylmer has paid his debt. The last of the foes who robbed me of my inheritance. What's that? Footsteps. There's someone in the house. What do I do now? I can't be caught here with a body at my feet. I must act and act quickly. Those footsteps, Doctor, were mine. I had just entered by the French window. The murderous reaction was a miracle of promptitude. He took off his big black hat and cloak and put on the dead man's dressing gown. Then he did a thing that affects my fancy as even more grisly than the rest. He hung the corpse like a coat on one of the hat pegs. He draped it in the long cloak and covered the head entirely with his own wide hat. Hung the corpse in a coat peg? Holy Moses, the man must have the strength of the very devil. He has... <laughs> But it was the only way of hiding a body in that little passage with the locked door. You amaze me. I myself walked past that hat stand once without thinking it was anything but a hat stand. 
I think that unconsciousness of mine will always give me a shiver. Mm. Your story has done that to me already. But what next? Surely he must have realised that you might discover the corpse at any moment. And hung where it was, it was a corpse calling for a certain amount of explanation, was it not? Oh, <laughs> quite so. And therefore he adopted the bolder stroke of discovering and explaining it himself. How do you mean? He had already assumed the part of Arnold Aylmer. Why should not his dead enemy assume the part of John Strake? Hmm. I'm reminded of that old tale of some frightful fancy dress ball to which two mortal enemies went dressed up as each other. Only in this case, the fancy dress ball was to be a dance of death. And one of the dancers would be dead. Mm, that is why I can imagine him smiling. Smiling. All things are from God, Doctor. Above all, reason and imagination and the great gifts of the mind. We must not forget their origin, even in their perversion. Now, this man had in him a very noble power to be perverted. The power of telling stories. He was a great novelist. Only he twisted his fictive power to practical evil ends. Yes, go on. Well, it all began with his deceiving old Aylmer with elaborate falsehoods and inventions. And gradually, the urge grew stronger and he became more and more vain of his skill in developing them. That is what the young Aylmers meant by saying that he could always cast a spell over their father. It was the sort of spell that the storyteller cast over the tyrant in the Arabian Nights. He could always produce more Arabian Nights if ever his neck was in danger. And today his neck was in danger. But I'm still not clear where this sidetracking is getting us. Surely the fellow's a cold-blooded and callous murderer, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> that may be so, but I'm sure, as I say, that he enjoyed it as fantasy as well as a conspiracy. He set about the task of telling the true story the wrong way round, of treating the dead man as living and the live man as dead. He'd already got into Aylmer's dressing gown. He now proceeded to get into Aylmer's body and soul. He looked at that corpse as if it were his own, and he decked it out not only in his own dark garments, but in a whole dark fairy tale about the black bird that could only fall by the silver bullet. He completed the exchange by flinging the corpse out on the snow as the corpse of Strake. It spread eagled in that strange fashion that suggested the sweeping descent of a bird of prey. From this, he did his best to work up a, a creepy conception of Strake to explain the absence of footprints. What a rogue. <laughs> and for one piece of artistic impudence, I hugely admire him. He actually turned one of the contradictions in his case into an argument for it. Oh, how was that? He pointed out that the man's cloak being too long for him proved that he never walked the ground like an ordinary mortal. But he looked at me very hard while he said that, and something told me at that moment he was trying a very big bluff. Had you discovered the truth by then? I wonder when you suspected and when you were sure. I think I really suspected when I telephoned you. And yet it was nothing more than the red light from the closed door brightening and darkening on the carpet that had set me thinking. I, I was sitting alone, and as I gazed down at that crimson patch at my feet, it looked like a splash of blood that grew vivid as it cried for vengeance. Good gracious me. Yeah. Why, I asked myself, should it change like that? I knew the sun had not come out. It could only be because the second door behind it had been opened and shut. Someone had gone out into the garden, letting daylight shine along the passage. I began to feel that that person had gone out to do something. It was then I decided to call you, but as to when I was certain, uh, that's a different matter. You see, if he had gone out and seen his enemy then, he would at once have raised the alarm. He did not. It was only some moments later that the fracas occurred. The cry, the pistol shot, and Strake's entrance with the pistol in his hand. Yes, indeed. It boils down to this, then. You say that Arnold Aylmer was killed before you appeared on the scene. Before or immediately after, that is so. 
but that his body was not thrown out onto the snow until some time later. Yes. And that the pistol shot you heard later still had nothing to do with his death. Nothing whatsoever. It was all part and parcel of Strake's crazy notion to hoodwink me. Mm. I knew that right at the end, he was trying to hypnotize me. Just as once he did with old Aylmer, no doubt. But it wasn't only the way he said it. It was what he said. It was the religion and the philosophy of it. Oh, I'm afraid I'm a practical man and I don't bother much about religion and philosophy. <laughs> You'll never be a practical man till you do. There's just one simple little fact that I've learned simply as a practical man. I've scarcely ever met a criminal who, if he philosophized at all, didn't philosophize along those lines of orientalism, reincarnation and the wheel of destiny and so forth. It is the religion of rascals. <laughs> I knew it was a rascal who was speaking. I should have thought that a rascal could uh, pretty well profess any religion he chose. It was his whole game with me to be as idealistic as possible. That sort of man may be dripping with gore, but he will always be able to tell you sincerely that Buddhism is better than Christianity. Nay, he will tell you in all sincerity that Buddhism is more Christian than Christianity. That alone is enough to throw a ghastly ray of light on his notion of Christianity. Upon my soul, I can't make out whether you're denouncing or defending him. <laughs> it isn't defending a man to say he's a genius. Far from it. And it is simply a psychological fact that an artist will always betray himself by some sort of sincerity. I'll take your word for that. Oh, you'll have to, Doctor, for I must be on my way. Well, thank you for your excellent coffee and for putting me in the way of an extremely interesting experience. Thank you, Father Brown. Good night. Good night. When Father Brown set his face homeward, the cold had grown more intense. And it was somehow intoxicating. It was a piercing cold, but it was not a killing cold. It tingled with truth, and it divided truth from error with a blade like ice. My friend hardly understood his own mood as he drank deeper and deeper draughts of that virginal vivacity of the air. Some forgotten muddle and morbidity seemed to be left behind or wiped out as the snow had painted out the footprints of the man of blood. And as he shuffled onwards through the snow, our little priest muttered to himself, And yet he's right about there being a white magic if he only knows where to look for it. That was The Dagger with Wings by G.K. Chesterton, adapted by Archie Campbell, with Leslie French as Father Brown and William Rushton as G.K. Chesterton. Dr. Boyne was played by Hugh Ross, John Strake by Peter Yap, Arnold Aylmer by Sam Dastor, and Inspector Collins by Stephen Thorne. The production was by Christopher Venning. <laughs>